1. Sex and Violence, or Nature and Art. In the beginning was nature, the background from which, and against which our ideas of God were formed, nature remains the supreme moral problem. We cannot hope to understand sex and gender until we clarify our attitude toward nature. Sex is a subset to nature. Sex is the natural in man. Society is an artificial construction, a defense against nature's power. Without society, we would be storm-tossed on the barbarous. See that as nature, society is a system of inherited forms reducing our humiliating passivity to nature. We may alter these forms, slowly or suddenly, but no change in society will change nature. Human beings are not nature's favorites. We are merely one of a multitude of species upon which nature indiscriminately exerts its force. Nature has a master agenda we can only dimly know. Human life began in flight and fear. Religion rose from rituals of propitiation, spells to lull the punishing elements. To this day, communities are few in regions scorched by heat or shackled by ice. Civilized man conceals from himself the extent of his subordination to nature, the grandeur of culture, the consolation of religion absorb his attention and win his faith. But let nature shrug, and all is in ruin. Fire, flood, lightning, tornado, hurricane, volcano, earthquake. Anywhere at any time, disaster falls upon the good and bad. Civilized, life requires a state of illusion. The idea of the ultimate benevolence of nature and God is the most potent of man's survival mechanisms. Without it, culture would revert to fear and despair. Sexuality and eroticism are the intricate intersection of nature and culture. Feminists grossly oversimplify the problem of sex when they reduce it to a matter of social convention, readjust society, eliminate sexual inequality, purify sex roles, and happiness and harmony will reign. Here feminism, like all liberal movements of the past two hundred years, is heir to Rousseau. The social contract, 1762, begins. Man is born free, and everywhere he is in chains. Pitting benign, romantic nature against corrupt society, Rousseau produced the progressivist strain in 19th century culture, for which social reform was the means to achieve paradise on earth. The bubble of these hopes was burst by the catastrophes of two world wars. But, Rousseauism was reborn in the post-war generation of the 60s, from which contemporary feminism developed. Rousseau rejects original sin, Christianity's pessimistic view of man born unclean, with a propensity for evil. Rousseau's idea, derived, from Locke, of man's innate goodness led to social environmentalism. Now the dominant ethic of American human services, penal codes, and behaviorist therapies, it assumes that aggression, violence, and crime come from social deprivation, a poor neighborhood, a bad home. Thus feminism blames rape on pornography and, by a smug, circularity of reasoning, interprets outbreaks of sadism as a backlash to itself. But rape and sadism have been evident throughout history. And, at some moment, in all cultures. This book takes the point of view of Sade, the most unread major writer in Western literature. Sade's work is a comprehensive satiric critique of Rousseau, written in the decade after the first failed Rousseauist experiment, the French Revolution, which ended not in political paradise but in the hell of the reign of terror. Sade follows Hobbes rather than Locke. Aggression comes from nature. It is what Nietzsche is to call the will to power. For Sade, getting back to nature, the romantic imperative that still permeates our culture from sex, counseling to serial commercials, would be to give free rein to violence and lust. I agree. 
Society is not the criminal but the force, which keeps crime in check. When social controls weaken, man's innate cruelty bursts forth. The rapist is created not by bad social influences but by a failure of social conditioning. Feminists, seeking to drive power relations out of sex, have set themselves against nature. Sex as power, identity as power. In Western culture, there are no non exploitative relationships. Everyone has killed in order to live. Nature's universal law of creation from destruction operates in mind, as in matter. As Freud, Nietzsche's heir, asserts, identity is conflict. Each generation drives its plow over the bones of the dead. Modern liberalism suffers unresolved contradictions. It exalts individualism and freedom and, on its radical wing, condemns social orders as oppressive. On the other hand, it expects government to provide materially for all, a feat manageable only by an expansion of authority and a swollen bureaucracy. In other words, liberalism defines government as tyrant father but demands it behave as nurturant mother. Feminism has inherited these contradictions. It sees every hierarchy as repressive, a social fiction, every negative about woman as a male lie designed to keep her in her place. Feminism has exceeded its proper mission of seeking political equality for women, and has ended by rejecting contingency, that is, human limitation by nature or fate, sexual freedom, sexual liberation, a modern delusion. We are hierarchical animals, sweep one hierarchy away, and another will take its place, perhaps less palatable than the first. There are hierarchies in nature and alternate hierarchies in society. In nature, brute force is the law, a survival of the fittest. In society, there are protections for the weak. Society is our frail barrier against nature. When the prestige of state and religion is low, men are free, but they find freedom intolerable and seek new ways to enslave themselves through drugs or depression. My theory is that whenever sexual freedom is sought or achieved, sadomasochism will not be far behind. Romanticism always turns into decadence. Nature is a hard taskmaster. It is the hammer and the anvil, crushing individuality. Perfect freedom would be to die by earth, air, water, and fire. Sex is a far darker power than feminism has admitted. Behaviorist sex therapies believe guiltless, no-fault sex is possible. But sex has always been girt round with taboo, irrespective of culture. Sex is the point of contact between man and nature, where morality and good intentions fall to primitive urges. I called it an intersection. This intersection is the uncanny crossroads of Hecate, where all things return in the night. Eroticism is a realm stalked by ghosts. It is the place beyond the pale, both cursed and enchanted. This book shows how much in culture goes against our best wishes. Integration of man's body and mind is a profound problem that is not about to be solved by recreational sex or an expansion of women's civil rights. Incarnation. The limitation of mind by matter is an outrage to imagination. Equally outrageous is gender, which we have not chosen but which nature has imposed upon us. Our physicality is torment. Our body the tree of nature on which Blake sees us crucified. Sex is demonic. This term, current in romantic studies of the past 25 years, derives from the Greek daimon, meaning a spirit of lower divinity than the Olympian gods, hence my pronunciation. Daimonic, the outcast Oedipus becomes a demon at Colonus. The word came to mean a man's guardian shadow. Christianity turned the demonic into the demonic. The great demons were not evil, or rather they were both good and evil, 
like nature itself, in which they dwelled. Freud's unconscious is a demonic realm. In the day we are social creatures, but at night we descend to the dream world where nature reigns, where there is no law but sex, cruelty, and metamorphosis. Day itself is invaded by demonic night. Moment by moment, night flickers in the imagination, in eroticism, subverting our strivings for virtue and order giving an uncanny aura to objects and persons, revealed to us through the eyes of the artist. The ghost-ridden character of sex is implicit in Freud's brilliant theory of family romance. We each have an incestuous constellation of sexual personae that we carry from childhood to the grave and that determines whom and how we love or hate. Every encounter with friend or foe Every clash with or submission to authority bears the perverse traces of family romance. Love is a crowded theater, for as Harold Bloom remarks, we can never embrace, sexually or otherwise, a single person, but embrace the whole of her or his family romance, one we still know next to nothing of the mystery of cathexis the investment of libido in certain people or things. The element of free will in sex and emotion is slight. As poets know, falling in love is irrational. Like art, sex is fraught with symbols. Family romance means that adult sex is always representation, ritualistic acting out of vanished realities. A perfectly humane eroticism may be impossible. Somewhere in every family romance is hostility and aggression, the homicidal wishes of the unconscious. Children are monsters of unbridled egotism and will, for they spring directly from nature. Hostile intimations of immorality. We carry that demonic will within us forever. Most people conceal it with acquired ethical precepts and meet it only in their dreams, which they hastily forget upon waking. The will to power is innate, but the sexual scripts of family romance are learned. Human beings are the only creatures in whom consciousness is so entangled with animal instinct. In Western culture, there can never be a purely physical or anxiety-free sexual encounter. Every attraction, every pattern of touch, every orgasm is shaped by psychic shadows. The search for freedom through sex is doomed to failure. In sex, compulsion and ancient necessity rule. The sexual personae of family. Romance are obliterated by the tidal force of regression, the backwards movement toward primeval dissolution, which Ferency identifies with ocean. An orgasm as a domination, a surrender, or a breaking through. Nature as no respecter of human identity. This is why so many men turn away or flee after sex, for they have sensed the annihilation of the demonic. Western love is a displacement of cosmic realities. It is a defense mechanism rationalizing forces, ungoverned and ungovernable. Like early religion, it is a device enabling us to control our primal fear. Sex cannot be understood because nature cannot be understood. Science is a method of logical analysis of nature's operations. It has lessened human anxiety about the cosmos by demonstrating the materiality of nature's forces and their frequent predictability. But science is always playing catch-up ball. Nature breaks its own rules. Whenever it wants, science cannot avert a single thunderbolt. Western science is a product of the Apollonian mind. Its hope is that, by naming and classification, by the cold light of intellect, archaic, night can be pushed back and defeated. Name and person are part of the West's quest for form. The West insists on the discrete identity of objects. To name is to know, to know is to control. I will demonstrate that the West's greatness arises from this delusional certitude. Far Eastern culture has never striven against nature in this way. Compliance, 
not confrontation is its rule. Buddhist meditation seeks the unity and harmony of reality. 20th century physics, going full circle back to Heracleitus, postulates that all matter is in motion. In other words, there is no thing, only energy. But this perception has not been imaginatively absorbed, for it cancels the West's intellectual and moral assumptions. The Westerner knows by seeing. Perceptual relations are at the heart of our culture, and they have produced our titanic contributions. To art, walking in nature, we see, identify, name, recognize. This recognition is our apotropion, that is, our warding off of fear. Recognition is ritual cognition, a repetition compulsion. We say that nature is beautiful, but this aesthetic judgment, which not all peoples have shared, is another defense formation, woefully inadequate for encompassing nature's totality. What is pretty in nature is confined to the thin skin of the globe upon which we huddle. Scratch that skin, and nature's demonic ugliness will erupt. Our focus on the pretty is an Apollonian strategy. The leaves and flowers, the birds, the hills are a patchwork pattern by which we map the known. What the West represses in its view of nature as the Chthonian, which means of the earth, but earth's bowels, not its surface. Jane Harrison uses the term for pre Olympian Greek religion, and I adopt it as a substitute for Dionysian, which has become contaminated with vulgar pleasantries. The Dionysian is no picnic. It is the Chthonian realities which Apollo evades, the blind grinding of subterranean force, the long slow suck, the murk and ooze. It is the dehumanizing brutality of biology and geology, the Darwinian waste and bloodshed, the squalor and rot we must block from consciousness to retain our Apollonian integrity as persons. Western science and Aesthetics are attempts to revise this horror into imaginatively palatable form. The demonism of Chthonian nature is the West's dirty secret. Modern humanists made the tragic sense of life the touchstone of mature understanding. They defined man's mortality and the transience of time as literature's supreme subjects. In this I again see evasion and even sentimentality. The tragic sense of life is a partial response to experience. It is a reflex of the West's resistance to and misapprehension of nature, compounded by the errors of liberalism, which in its romantic nature philosophy has followed the Rousseauist Wordsworth rather than the demonic Coleridge. Tragedy is the most Western literary genre. It did not appear in Japan until the late 19th century. The Western will, setting itself up against nature, dramatized its own inevitable fall as a human universal, which it is not. An irony of literary history is the birth of tragedy in the cult of Dionysus. The protagonist's destruction recalls the slaughter of animals and, even earlier, of real human beings in archaic ritual. It is no accident that tragedy as we know it dates from the Apollonian 5th century of Athens' greatness, whose cardinal work is Aeschylus Orestia, a celebration of the defeat of Chthonian power, drama, a Dionysian mode, turned against Dionysus in making the passage from ritual to mimesis, that is, from action to representation. Aristotle's pity and fear is a broken promise, a plea for vision without horror. Few Greek tragedies fully conform to the humanist commentary on them. Their barbaric residue will not come unglued. Even in the 5th century, as we shall see, a satiric response to Apollonianized theater came in Euripides' decadent plays. Problems in accurate assessment of Greek tragedy include not only the loss of three-quarters of the original body of work but the lack of survival of any complete satyr. Play. 
This was the finale to the classic trilogy, an obscene comic. Burlesque. In Greek tragedy, comedy always had the last word. Modern criticism has projected a Victorian and, I feel, Protestant high. Seriousness upon pagan culture that still blankets teaching of the humanities. Paradoxically, ascent to savage Chthonian realities leads not to gloom but to humor. Hence Sade's strange laughter, his wit, amid the most fantastic cruelties. For life is not a tragedy but a comedy. Comedy is born of the clash between Apollo and Dionysus. Nature is always pulling the rug out from under our pompous ideals. Female tragic protagonists are rare. Tragedy is a male paradigm of rise and fall, a graph in which dramatic and sexual climax are in. Shadowy analogy. Climax is another Western invention. Traditional. Eastern stories are picaresque, horizontal chains of incident. There is little suspense or sense of an ending. The sharp vertical peaking of Western narrative, as later of orchestral music, is exemplified by Sophocles' Oedipus Rex, whose moment of maximum intensity Aristotle calls peripatia, reversal. Western dramatic climax was produced by the agon of male will. Through action to identity, action is the root of escape from nature, but all action circles back to origins, the womb tomb of nature. Oedipus, trying to escape his mother, runs straight into her arms. Western narrative is a mystery, story, a process of detection. But since what is detected is unbearable, every revelation leads to another repression. The major women of tragedy, Euripides' Medea and Phaedra, Shakespeare's Cleopatra and Lady Macbeth, Racine's Phaedre, skew the genre by their disruptive relation to male action. Tragic woman is less moral than man. Her will to power is naked. Her actions are under a Chthonian cloud. They are a conduit of the irrational opening the genre to intrusions of the barbaric force that drama shut out at its birth. Tragedy is a Western vehicle for testing and purification of the male will. The difficulty in grafting female protagonists onto it is a result not of male prejudice but of instinctive sexual strategics. Woman introduces untransformed cruelty into Tragedy because she is the problem that the genre is trying to correct. Tragedy plays a male game, a game it invented to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. It is not flawed choice, flawed action, or even death itself which is the ultimate human dilemma. The gravest challenge to our hopes and dreams is the messy biological business, as usual that is going on within us and without us at every hour of Every day, consciousness is a pitiful hostage of its flesh envelope, whose surges, circuits, and secret murmurings it cannot stay or speed. This is the Chthonian drama that has no climax but only an endless round, cycle upon cycle. Microcosm mirrors macrocosm. Free will is stillborn in the red cells of our body, for there is no free will in nature. Our choices come to us prepackaged and special delivery, molded by hands not our own. Tragedies in hospitality to woman springs from nature's. In hospitality to man, the identification of woman with nature was universal in prehistory, in hunting or agrarian societies dependent upon nature. Femaleness was honored as an imminent principle of fertility. As culture progressed, Crafts and commerce supplied a concentration of resources freeing men from the caprices of weather, or the handicap of geography. With nature at one remove, femaleness receded in importance. Buddhist cultures retained the ancient meanings of femaleness long after the West renounced them. Male and female, the Chinese yang and yin, are balanced and interpenetrating powers in man and nature to which society is subordinate. 
This code of passive acceptance has its roots in India, a land of sudden extremes where a monsoon can wipe out 50,000 people overnight. The femaleness of fertility. Religions is always double-edged. The Indian nature goddess Kali is creator and destroyer, granting boons with one set of arms while cutting throats with the other. She is the lady ringed with skulls. The moral ambivalence of the great mother goddesses has been conveniently forgotten by those American feminists who have resurrected them. We cannot grasp nature's bare blade without shedding our own blood. Western culture from the start has swerved from femaleness. The last major Western society to worship female powers was Minoan, Crete, and significantly, that fell and did not rise again. The immediate cause of its collapse, quake, plague, or invasion, is beside the point. The lesson is that cultic femaleness is no guarantee of cultural strength or viability. What did survive, what did vanquish, circumstance and stamp its mindset on Europe was Mycenaean. Warrior culture, descending to us through Homer. The male will to power. Mycenaeans from the south and Dorians from the north would fuse to form Apollonian Athens, from which came the Greco-Roman line of Western history. Both the Apollonian and Judeo-Christian traditions are transcendental. That is, they seek to surmount or transcend nature. Despite Greek culture's contrary Dionysian element, which I will discuss, high classicism was an Apollonian achievement. Judaism, Christianity's parent sect, is the most powerful of protests against nature. The Old Testament asserts that a father God made nature and that differentiation into objects and gender was after the fact of his maleness. Judeo-Christianity, like Greek worship of the Olympian gods, is a sky cult. It is an advanced stage in the history of religion, which everywhere began as earth cult, veneration of fruitful nature. The evolution from earth cult to sky cult shifts woman into the nether realm. Her mysterious procreative powers and the resemblance of her rounded breasts, belly, and hips to Earth's contours put her at the center of early symbolism. She was the model for the great mother figures who crowded the birth of religion worldwide. But the mother cults did not mean social freedom for women. On the contrary, as I will show in a discussion of Hollywood in the sequel to this book, Cult objects are prisoners of their own symbolic inflation. Every totem lives in taboo. Woman was an idol of belly magic. She seemed to swell and give birth by her own law. From the beginning of time, woman has seemed an uncanny being. Man honored but feared her. She was the black maw that had spat him forth and would devour him anew. Men, bonding together invented culture as a defense against female nature. Sky cult was the most sophisticated step in this process, for its switch of the creative locus from earth to sky is a shift from belly magic to head magic, and from this defensive head magic has come the spectacular glory of male civilization, which has lifted woman with it. The very language and logic modern woman uses to assail patriarchal culture were the invention of men. Hence the sexes are caught in a comedy of historical indebtedness. Man, repelled by his debt to a physical mother, created an alternate reality, a heterocosm to give him the illusion of freedom. Woman, at first content to accept man's protections but now inflamed with desire for her own illusory freedom, invades man's systems and suppresses her indebtedness to him as she steals them. By head magic she will deny there ever was a problem of sex and nature. She has inherited the anxiety of influence. The identification of woman with nature is the most troubled and troubling term in this historical argument. Was it ever true? 
can it still be true? Most feminist readers will disagree, but I think this identification not myth but reality. All the genres of philosophy, science, high art, athletics, and politics were invented by men. But by the Promethean law of conflict and capture, woman has a right to seize what she will and to buy with man on his own terms. Yet there is a limit to what she can alter in herself and in man's relation to her. Every human being must wrestle with nature. But nature's burden falls more heavily on one sex. With luck, this will not limit woman's achievement, that is, her action in male created social space. But it must limit eroticism, that is, our imaginative lives in sexual space, which may overlap social space but is not identical with it. Nature's cycles are woman's cycles. Biologic femaleness is a sequence of circular returns, beginning and ending at the same point. Woman's centrality gives her a stability of identity. She does not have to become but only to be. Her centrality is a great obstacle to man, whose quest for identity she blocks. He must transform himself into an independent being, that is, a being free of her. If he does not, he will simply fall back into her. Reunion with the mother as a siren call, haunting our imagination. Once there was bliss, and now there is. Struggle. Dim memories of life before the traumatic separation of. Birth may be the source of Arcadian fantasies of a lost golden age. The Western idea of history as a propulsive movement into the future. A progressive or providential design climaxing in the revelation of a second coming is a male formulation. No woman, I submit, could have coined such an idea, since it is a strategy of evasion of woman's own cyclic nature, in which man dreads being caught. Evolutionary or apocalyptic history is a male wish list with a happy ending, a phallic peak. Woman does not dream of transcendental or historical escape from natural cycle, since she is that cycle. Her sexual maturity means marriage to the moon, waxing and waning in lunar phases. Moon, month, menses. Same word, same world. The ancients knew that woman is bound to nature's calendar, an appointment she cannot refuse. The Greek pattern of free will to hybris to tragedy as a male. Drama. Since woman has never been deluded, until recently, by the mirage of free will, she knows there is no free will, since she is not free. She has no choice but acceptance. Whether she desires motherhood or not, nature yokes her into the brute inflexible rhythm of procreative law. Menstrual cycle is an alarming clock that cannot be stopped until nature wills it. Woman's reproductive apparatus is vastly more complicated than man's and still ill understood. All kinds of things can go wrong or cause distress in going right. Western woman is in an agonistic relation to her own body. For her, biologic normalcy is suffering and health and illness. Dysmenorrhea, it is argued, is a disease of civilization, since women in tribal cultures have few menstrual complaints. But in tribal life, woman has an extended or collective identity. Tribal religion honors nature and subordinates itself to it. It is precisely an advanced Western society, which attempts to improve or surpass nature and which holds up individualism and self. Realization as a model, that the stark facts of woman's condition emerge with painful clarity. The more woman aims for personal identity and autonomy, the more she develops her imagination, the fiercer will be her struggle with nature, that is, with the intractable physical laws of her own body, and the more nature will punish her. Do not dare to be free, for your body does not belong to you. The female body is a Chthonian machine, indifferent to the spirit. 
who inhabits it. Organically, it has one mission, pregnancy, which we may spend a lifetime staving off. Nature cares only for species, never individuals. The humiliating dimensions of this biologic fact are most directly experienced by women, who probably have a greater realism and wisdom than men because of it. Woman's body is a sea acted upon by the month's lunar wave motion. Sluggish and dormant, her fatty tissues are gorged with water, then suddenly cleansed at hormonal high tide. Edema is our mammalian relapse into the vegetable. Pregnancy demonstrates the deterministic character of woman's sexuality. Every pregnant woman has body and self taken over by a Chthonian force beyond her control. In the welcome pregnancy, this is a happy sacrifice. But in the unwanted one, initiated by rape or misadventure, it is a horror. Such unfortunate women look directly into nature's heart of darkness. For a fetus is a benign tumor, a vampire who steals in order to live. The so-called miracle of birth is nature getting her own way. Every month for women is a new defeat of the will. Menstruation was once called the curse, a reference to the expulsion from the garden, when woman was condemned to labor pains because of Eve's sin. Most early cultures hemmed in menstruating women by ritual. Taboos. Orthodox Jewish women still purify themselves from menstrual uncleanness in the mikvah, a ritual bath. Women have borne the symbolic burden of man's imperfections, his grounding in nature. Menstrual blood is the stain, the birthmark of original sin, the filth that transcendental religion must wash from man. Is this identification merely phobic, merely misogynistic? Or is it possible there is something uncanny about menstrual blood, justifying its attachment to taboo? I will argue that it is not menstrual blood per se, which disturbs the imagination, unstanchable as that red flood may be, but rather the albumin in the blood, the uterine shreds, placental jellyfish of the female sea. This is the Chthonian matrix from which we rose. We have an evolutionary revulsion from slime, our site of biologic origins. Every month, it is woman's fate to face the abyss of time and being, the abyss which is herself. The Bible has come under fire for making woman the fall guy in man's cosmic drama, but in casting a male conspirator, the serpent, as God's enemy, Genesis hedges and does not take its misogyny far. Enough. The Bible defensively swerves from God's true opponent. Chthonian nature. The serpent is not outside Eve but in her. She is the garden and the serpent. Anthony Storr says of witches, at a very primitive level, all mothers are phallic. To the devil is a woman. Modern emancipation movements. Discarding stereotypes impeding woman's social advance, refuse to acknowledge procreations. Demonism, nature as serpentine, a bed of tangled vines, creepers and crawlers, probing dumb fingers of fetid organic life which Wordsworth taught us to call pretty. Biologists speak of man's reptilian brain, the oldest part of our upper nervous system, killer survivor of the archaic era. I contend that the premenstrual woman, incited to snappishness or rage as hearing signals from the reptilian brain, in her, man's latent perversity is manifest. All hell breaks loose, the hell of Chthonian nature that modern humanism denies and represses, in every premenstrual woman struggling to govern her temper. Sky cult wars again with earth cult. Mythology's identification of woman with nature is correct. The male contribution to procreation is momentary and transient. Conception is a pinpoint of time, another of our phallic peaks of action, from which the male slides back uselessly. The pregnant woman is demonically, devilishly complete. 
as an ontological entity. She needs nothing and no one. I shall maintain that the pregnant woman, brooding for nine months upon her own creation, is the pattern of all solipsism, that the historical attribution of narcissism to women is another true myth. Male bonding and patriarchy were the recourse to which man was forced by his terrible sense of woman's power, her imperviousness, her archetypal confederacy with Chthonian nature. Woman's body is a labyrinth in which man is lost. It is a walled garden. The medieval hortus conclusus, in which nature works its demonic sorcery. Woman is the primeval fabricator, the real first mover. She turns a gob of refuse into a spreading web of sentient being, floating on the snaky umbilical by which she leashes every man. Feminism has been simplistic in arguing that female archetypes were politically motivated falsehoods by men. The historical repugnance to woman has a rational basis, discussed as reasons proper. Response to the grossness of procreative nature. Reason and logic are the anxiety-inspired domain of Apollo, premier god of sky cult. The Apollonian is harsh and phobic coldly cutting itself off from nature. By its superhuman purity, I shall argue that Western personality and Western achievement are, for better or worse, largely Apollonian. Apollo's great opponent Dionysus is ruler of the Chthonian whose law is procreative femaleness. As we shall see, the Dionysian is liquid. Nature, a miasmic swamp whose prototype is the still pond of the Womb. We must ask whether the equivalence of male and female in far Eastern symbolism was as culturally efficacious as the higher archization of male over female has been in the West. Which system has ultimately benefited women more? Western science and industry have freed women from drudgery and danger. Machines do housework. The pill neutralizes fertility giving birth is no longer fatal. And the Apollonian line of Western rationality has produced the modern, aggressive woman who can think like a man and write obnoxious books. The tension and antagonism in Western metaphysics developed human higher cortical powers to great heights. Most of Western culture is a distortion of reality. But reality should be distorted. That is imaginatively amended. The Buddhist acquiescence to nature is neither accurate about nature nor just to human potential. The Apollonian has taken us to the stars. Demonic archetypes of woman, filling world mythology, represent the uncontrollable nearness of nature. Their tradition passes nearly unbroken from prehistoric idols through literature and art to modern movies. The primary image is the femme fatale, the woman fatal to man. The more nature is beaten back in the West, the more the femme fatale reappears, as a return of the repressed. She is the specter of the West's bad conscience about nature. She is the moral ambiguity of nature, a malevolent moon that keeps breaking through our fog of hopeful sentiment. Feminism dismisses the femme fatale as a cartoon and libel. If she ever existed, she was simply a victim of society, resorting to destructive womanly wiles because of her lack of access to political power. The femme fatale was a career woman monke, her energies neurotically diverted into the boudoir. By such techniques of demystification, Feminism has painted itself into a corner. Sexuality is a murky realm of contradiction and ambivalence. It cannot always be understood by social models, which feminism, as an heir of 19th century utilitarianism, insists on imposing on it. Mystification will always remain the disorderly companion of love and art. Eroticism is mystique that is, the aura of emotion and imagination around sex. It cannot be fixed by codes of social or 
moral convenience, whether from the political left or right. 4. Nature's fascism is greater than that of any society. There is a demonic instability in sexual relations that we may have to accept. The femme fatale is one of the most mesmerizing of sexual personae. She is not a fiction but an extrapolation of biologic realities. In women that remain constant. The North American Indian myth of the toothed vagina, vagina dentata, is a gruesomely direct transcription of female power and male fear. Metaphorically, every vagina has secret teeth, for the male exits as less than when he entered. The basic mechanics of conception require action in the male, but nothing more than passive receptivity in the female. Sex as a natural rather than social transaction, therefore, really as a kind of drain of male energy by female fullness, physical and spiritual. Castration is the danger every man runs in intercourse with a woman. Love is the spell by which he puts his sexual fear to sleep. Woman's latent vampirism is not a social aberration but a development of her maternal function for which nature has equipped her with tiresome thoroughness. For the male, every act of intercourse is a return to the mother and a capitulation to her. For men, sex is a struggle for identity. In sex, the male is consumed and released again by the toothed power that bore him, the female dragon of nature. The femme fatale was produced by the mystique of connection between mother and child. A modern assumption is that sex and procreation are medically, scientifically, intellectually, manageable. If we keep tinkering with the social mechanism long enough, every difficulty will disappear. Meanwhile, the divorce rate soars. Conventional marriage, despite its inequities, kept the chaos of libido in check. When the prestige of marriage is low, all the nasty demonism of sexual instinct pops out individualism the self unconstrained by society leads to the coarser servitude of constraint by nature every road from rousseau leads to sade the mystique of our birth from human mothers is one of the demonic clouds we cannot dispel by tiny declarations of independence apollo can swerve from nature but he cannot obliterate it. As emotional and sexual beings we go full circle. Old age is a second childhood in which earliest memories revive. Chillingly, comatose patients of any age automatically drift toward the fetal position, from which they have to be pried by nurses. We are tied to our birth by unshakable apparitions of sense memory. Rousseauist psychologies like feminism assert the ultimate benevolence of human emotion. In such a system, the femme fatale logically has no place. I follow Freud, Nietzsche, and Sade in my view of the amorality of the instinctual life. At some level, all love is combat, a wrestling with ghosts. We are only for something by being against something else. People who believe they are having pleasant, casual, uncomplex sexual encounters, whether with friend, spouse, or stranger, are blocking from consciousness the tangle of psychodynamics at work, just as they block the hostile clashings of their dream life. Family romance operates at all times. The femme fatale is one of the refinements of female narcissism, of the ambivalent self-directedness that is completed by the birth of a child, or by the conversion of spouse or lover into child. Mothers can be fatal to their sons. It is against the mother that men have erected their towering edifice of politics and sky cult. She is Medusa, in whom Freud sees the castrating and castrated female pubes. But Medusa's snaky hair is also the writhing vegetable growth of nature. Her hideous grimace is men's fear of the laughter of women. She that gives life also blocks the way to freedom. Therefore, 
I agree with Sade that we have the right to thwart nature's procreative compulsions, through sodomy or abortion. Male homosexuality may be the most valorous of attempts to evade the femme fatale and to defeat nature. By turning away from the Medusan mother, whether in honor or detestation of her, the male homosexual is one of the great forgers of absolutist Western identity. But of course nature has won, as she always does, by making disease. The price of promiscuous sex. The permanence of the femme fatale as a sexual persona is part of the weary weight of eroticism, beneath which both ethics and religion founder. Eroticism is society's soft point, through which it is invaded. By Chthonian nature, the femme fatale can appear as Medusan mother or as frigid nymph, masking in the brilliant luminosity of Apollonian high glamour. Her cool unreachability beckons, fascinates, and destroys. She is not a neurotic but, if anything, a psychopath. That is, she has an amoral effectlessness, a serene indifference to the suffering of others, which she invites and dispassionately observes as tests of her power. The mystique of the femme fatale cannot be perfectly translated into male terms. I will speak at length of the beautiful boy, one of the West's most stunning sexual personae. However, the danger of the um fatal, as embodied in today's boyish male hustler, is that he will leave, disappearing to other loves, other lands. He is a rambler, a cowboy and sailor. But the danger of the femme fatale is that she will stay, still, placid, and paralyzing. Her remaining is a demonic burden. The ubiquity of Walter Pater's Mona. Lisa, who smothers history. She is a thorny symbol of the perversity of sex. She will stick. We are moving in this chapter toward a theory of beauty. I believe that the aesthetic sense, like everything else thus far, is a swerve from the Chthonian. It is a displacement from one area of reality to Another, analogous to the shift from earth cult to sky cult. Ferency speaks of the replacement of animal nose by human eye, because of our upright stance. The eye is peremptory in its judgments. It decides what to see and why. Each of our glances is as much exclusion as inclusion. We select, editorialize, and enhance our idea of the pretty is a limited notion that cannot possibly apply to Earth's metamorphic underworld, a cataclysmic realm of Chthonian violence. We choose not to see this violence on our daily strolls. Every time we say nature is beautiful, we are saying a prayer, fingering our worry beads. The cool beauty of the femme fatale is another transformation of Chthonian ugliness. Female animals are usually less beautiful than males. The mother bird's dull feathers are camouflaged, protecting the nest from predators. Male birds are creatures of spectacular display, of both plumage and parade, partly to impress females and conquer rivals and partly to divert enemies from the nest. Among humans, male ritual display is just as extreme but for the first time the female becomes a lavishly beautiful object. Why? The female is adorned not simply to increase her property value, as Marxism would demystifyingly have it, but to assure her desirability. Consciousness has made cowards of us all. Animals do not feel sexual fear because they are not rational beings. They operate under a pure biologic imperative, mind, which has enabled humanity to adapt and flourish, as a species, has also infinitely complicated our functioning as physical beings. We see too much, and so have to stringently limit our seeing. Desire is besieged on all sides by anxiety and doubt. Beauty, an ecstasy of the eye, drugs us and allows us to act. Beauty is our Apollonian revision of the Chthonian. 
nature as a Darwinian spectacle of the eaters and the eaten. All phases of procreation are ruled by appetite, sexual intercourse, from kissing to penetration, consists of movements of barely controlled cruelty and consumption, the long pregnancy of the human female, and the protracted childhood of her infant, who is not self-sustaining, for seven years or more, have produced the argon of psychological dependency that burdens the male for a lifetime. Man justifiably fears being devoured by woman, who is nature's proxy. Repression is an evolutionary adaptation permitting us to function under the burden of our expanded consciousness. For what we are conscious of could drive us mad. Crude male slang speaks of female genitalia as slash or gash. Freud notes that Medusa turns men to stone because, at first sight, a boy thinks female genitals a wound, from which the penis has been cut. They are indeed a wound, but it is the infant who has been cut away by violence. The umbilical is a hawser sawed through by a social rescue party. Sexual necessity drives man back to that bloody scene, but he cannot approach it without tremors of apprehension. These he conceals by euphemisms of love and beauty, however, the less well-bred he is, that is, the less socialized, the sharper his sense of the animality of sex and the grosser his language, the foul-mouthed roughneck is produced not by society's sexism but by society's absence, for nature is the most foul-mouthed of us all. Woman's current advance in society is not a voyage from myth to truth but from myth to new myth. The rise of rational, technological. Woman may demand the repression of unpleasant archetypal realities. Ferency remarks, the periodic pulsations in feminine sexuality, puberty, the menses, pregnancies and parturitions, the climacterium, require a much more powerful repression on the woman's part than is necessary for the man. 3. In its argument with male society, feminism must suppress the monthly evidence of woman's domination by Chthonian nature. Menstruation and childbirth are an affront to beauty and form. In aesthetic terms, they are spectacles of frightful squalor. Modern life, with its hospitals and paper products, has distanced and sanitized these primitive mysteries, just as it has done with death, which used to be a grueling at-home affair. An awful lot is being swept under the rug. The awe and terror that is our lot. The wound-like rawness of female genitals is a symbol of the unread amability of Chthonian nature. In aesthetic terms, female genitals are lurid in color, vagrant in contour, and architecturally incoherent. Male genitals, on the other hand, though they risk ludicrousness by their rubbery indecisiveness, a Sylvia Plath heroine memorably thinks of turkey neck and turkey gizzards, have a rational mathematical design, a syntax. This is no absolute virtue. However, since it may tend to confirm the male in his abundant misperceptions of reality, aesthetics stop where sex begins. G. Wilson. Knight declares, all physical love is, in its way, a victory over physical secrecies and physical repulsions. For sex is sloppy and untidy. A return to what Freud calls the infant's polymorphous perversity, a zestful rolling around in every body fluid. St. Augustine says, we are born between feces and urine. This misogynistic view of the infant's sin-stained emergence from the birth canal is close to the Chthonian truth, but excretion, through which nature for once acts upon the sexes equally, can be saved by comedy, as we see in Aristophanes, Rabelais, Pope, and Joyce. Excretion has found a place in high culture. Menstruation and childbirth are too barbaric for comedy. 
their ugliness has produced the giant displacement of women's historical status as sex object, whose beauty is endlessly discussed and modified. Woman's beauty is a compromise with her dangerous archetypal allure. It gives the eye the comforting illusion of intellectual control over nature. My explanation for the male domination of art, science, and politics, an indisputable fact of history, is based on an analogy between sexual physiology and aesthetics. I will argue that all cultural achievement is a projection, a swerve into Apollonian transcendence, and that men are anatomically destined to be projectors. But as with Oedipus, destiny may be a curse. How we know the world and how it knows us are underlain by shadow patterns of sexual biography and sexual geography. What breaks into consciousness is shaped in advance by the demonism of the senses. Mind as a captive of the body. Perfect objectivity does not exist. Every thought bears some emotional burden. Had we time or energy to pursue it, each random choice, from the color of a toothbrush to a decision over a menu, could be made to yield its secret meaning in the inner drama of our lives. But in exhaustion, we shut out this psychic supersaturation. The realm of number, the crystalline mathematic of Apollonian purity, was invented early on by Western man as a refuge from the soggy emotionalism and bristling disorder of woman and nature. Women who excel in mathematics do so in a system devised by men for the mastery of nature. Number is the most imposing and least creaturely of pacifiers, man's yearning, hope for objectivity. It is to number that he, and now she, withdraws to escape from the Chthonian mire of love, hate, and family romance. Even now, it is usually men rather than women who claim logics superiority to emotion. This they comically tend to do at moments of maximum emotional chaos, which they may have incited and are helpless to stem. Male artists and actors have a cultural function in keeping the line of emotion open from the female to male realms. Every man harbors an inner female territory ruled by his mother, from whom he can never entirely break free. Since Romanticism, art, and the study of art have become vehicles for exploring the West's repressed emotional life, though one would never know it from half the deadening scholarship that has sprung up around them. Poetry is the connecting link between body and mind. Every idea in poetry is grounded in emotion. Every word is a palpation of the body. The Multiplicity of interpretation surrounding a poem mirrors the stormy uncontrollability of emotion, where nature works her will. Emotion is chaos. Every benign emotion has a flip side of negativity. Thus the flight from emotion to number is another crucial strategy of the Apollonian West in its long struggle with Dionysus. Emotion as passion, a continuum of eroticism and aggression. Love and hate are not opposites. There is only more passion and less passion, a difference of quantity and not of kind. To live in love and peace is one of the outstanding contradictions that Christianity has imposed on its followers, an ideal impossible and unnatural. Since Romanticism, artists and intellectuals have complained about the church's sex rules but these are just one small part of the Christian war with pagan nature. Only a saint could sustain the Christian code of love, and saints are ruthless in their exclusions. They must shut out an enormous amount of reality, the reality of sexual personae and the reality of nature. Love for all means coldness to something or someone, even Jesus, let us recall, was unnecessarily rude to his mother at Cana. The Chthonian superflux of emotion is a male problem. A man must do battle with that enormity, which resides in woman and nature. 
he can attain selfhood only by beating back the demonic cloud that would swallow him up. Mother love, which we may just as well call mother hate, mother love, mother hate, for her or from her. One huge conglomerate of natural power. Political equality for women will make very little difference in this emotional turmoil that is going on above and below politics, outside the scheme of social life. Not until all babies are born from glass jars will the combat cease between mother and son. But in a totalitarian future that has removed procreation from woman's hands, there will also be no affect and no art. Men will be machines, without pain but also without pleasure. Imagination has a price, which we are paying every day. There is no escape from the biologic chains that bind us. What has nature given man to defend himself against woman? Here we come to the source of man's cultural achievements, which follow so directly from his singular anatomy. Our lives as physical beings give rise to basic metaphors of apprehension, which vary greatly between the sexes. Here there can be no equality. Man is sexually compartmentalized. Genitally, he is condemned to a perpetual pattern of linearity, focus, aim, directedness. He must learn to aim. Without aim, urination and ejaculation end in infantile soiling of self or surroundings. Woman's eroticism is diffused throughout her body. Her desire for foreplay remains a notorious area of Miscommunication between the sexes. Man's genital concentration is a reduction but also an intensification. He is a victim of unruly ups and downs. Male sexuality is inherently manic depressive. Estrogen tranquilizes, but androgen agitates. Men are in a constant state of sexual anxiety, living on the pins and needles of their hormones. In Sex as in life they are driven beyond, beyond the self, beyond the body. Even in the womb this rule applies. Every fetus becomes female, unless it is steeped in male hormone, produced by a signal from the testes. Before birth, therefore, a male is already beyond the female. But to be beyond is to be exiled from the center of life. Men know. They are sexual exiles. They wander the earth seeking satisfaction, craving and despising, never content. There is nothing in that anguished motion for women to envy. The male genital metaphor is concentration and projection. Nature gives concentration to man to help him overcome his fear. Man approaches woman in bursts of spasmodic concentration. This gives him the delusion of temporary control of the archetypal mysteries that brought him forth. It gives him the courage to return. Sex is metaphysical for men, as it is not for women. Women have no problem to solve by sex. Physically and psychologically, they are serenely self-contained. They may choose to achieve, but they do not need it. They are not thrust into the beyond by their own fractious bodies. But men are out of balance. They must quest, pursue, court, or seize pigeons on the grass. Alas, in such parkside rituals we may savor the comic pathos of sex. How often one spots a male pigeon, making desperate, self-inflating sallies toward the female, as again. And again she turns her back on him and nonchalantly marches away. But by concentration and insistence he may carry the day. Nature has blessed him with obliviousness to his own absurdity. His purposiveness is both a gift and a burden. In human beings, sexual concentration is the male's instrument for gathering together and forcibly fixing the dangerous Chthonian superflux of emotion and energy that I identify with woman and nature. In sex, man is driven into the very abyss which he flees. He makes a voyage to non-being and back. 
through concentration to projection into the beyond. The male projection of erection and ejaculation is the paradigm for all cultural projection and conceptualization, from art and philosophy to fantasy, hallucination, and obsession. Women have conceptualized less in history not because men have kept them from doing so but because women do not need to conceptualize in order to exist. I leave open the question of brain differences. Conceptualization and sexual mania may issue from the same part of the male brain. Fetishism, for instance, a practice which like most of the sex perversions is confined to men, is clearly a conceptualizing or symbol-making activity. Man's vastly greater commercial patronage of pornography is analogous. An erection is a thought and the orgasm an act of imagination. The male has to will his sexual authority before the woman who is a shadow of his mother and of all women. Failure and humiliation constantly wait in the wings. No woman has to prove herself a woman in the grim way a man has to prove himself a man. He must perform, or the show does not go on. Social convention is irrelevant. A flop is a flop. Ironically, sexual success always ends in sagging. Fortunes anyhow. Every male projection is transient and must be anxiously, endlessly renewed. Men enter in triumph but withdraw in decrepitude. The sex act cruelly mimics history's decline and fall. Male bonding is a self-preservation society. Collegial reaffirmation. Through larger, fabricated frames of reference. Culture as man's iron. Reinforcement of his ever-imperiled private projections. Concentration and projection are remarkably demonstrated by. Urination. One of male anatomy's most efficient. Compartmentalizations. Freud thinks primitive man preened himself on his ability to put out a fire with a stream of urine. A strange thing to be proud of but certainly beyond the scope of woman who would scorch her hams in the process. Male urination really is a kind of accomplishment, an arc of transcendence. A woman merely waters the ground she stands on. Male urination is a form of commentary. It can be friendly when shared but is often aggressive, as in the defacement of public monuments by 60s rock stars. To piss on is to criticize. John Wayne urinated on the shoes of a grouchy director in full view of cast and crew. This is one genre of self-expression women will never master. A male dog marking every bush on the block is a graffiti artist leaving his rude signature with each lift of the leg. Women, like female dogs, are earthbound squatters. There is no projection beyond the boundaries of the self. Space is claimed by being sat on. Squatters writes, the cumbersome, solipsistic character of female physiology is tediously evident at sports events and rock concerts, where 50 Women wait in line for admission to the sequestered cells of the toilet. Meanwhile, their male friends zip in and out, in every sense, and stand around looking at their watches and rolling their eyes. Freud's notion of penis envy proves too true when the P.U.B. crawling male cheerily relieves himself in midnight alleyways, to the vexation of his bursting female companions. This compartmentalization or isolation of male genitality has its dark side, however. It can lead to a dissociation of sex and emotion, to temptation, promiscuity, and disease. The modern male homosexual, for example, has sought ecstasy in the squalor of public toilets, for women perhaps the least erotic place on earth. Man's metaphors of concentration and projection are echoes of both body and mind. Without them, he would be helpless before woman's power. Without them, woman would long ago have absorbed all of creation into herself. There would be no culture, no system, 
no pyramiding of one hierarchy upon another. Earth cult must lose to sky cult if mind is ever to break free from matter. Ironically, the more modern woman thinks with Apollonian clarity, the more she participates in the historical negation of her sex. Political equality for women, desirable and necessary as it is, is not going to remedy the radical disjunction between the sexes that begins and ends in the body. The sexes will always be jolted by violence shocks of attraction and repulsion. Androgyny, which some feminists promote as a pacifist blueprint for sexual utopia, belongs to the contemplative rather than active life. It is the ancient prerogative of priests, shamans, and artists. Feminists have politicized it as a weapon against the masculine principle. Redefined, it now means men must be like women and women can be whatever they like, androgyny is a cancellation of male concentration and projection, prescriptions for the future by bourgeois academics, and writers carry their own bias. The reform of a college English department cuts no ice down at the corner garage. Male concentration and projection are visible everywhere in the aggressive energy of the streets. Fortunately, male homosexuals of every social Class have preserved the cult of the masculine, which will therefore never lose its aesthetic legitimacy. Major peaks of Western culture have been accompanied by a high incidence of male homosexuality in classical Athens and Renaissance Florence and London. Male concentration and projection are self enhancing, leading to supreme achievements of Apollonian conceptualization. If sexual physiology provides the pattern for our experience of the world, what is woman's basic metaphor? It is mystery, the hidden. Karen Horney speaks of a girl's inability to see her genitals and a boy's ability to see his as the source of the greater subjectivity of women as compared with the greater objectivity of men. 5 2. Rephrase this with my different emphasis men's delusional certitude that objectivity is possible is based on the visibility of their genitals second this certitude is a defensive swerve from the anxiety inducing invisibility of the womb women tend to be more realistic and less obsessional because of their toleration for ambiguity which they learn from their inability to learn about their own bodies women Accept limited knowledge as their natural condition, a great human truth that a man may take a lifetime to reach. The female body's unbearable hiddenness applies to all aspects of men's dealings with women. What does it look like in there? Did she have an orgasm? Is it really my child? Who was my real father? Mystery shrouds woman's sexuality. This mystery is the main reason for the imprisonment man has imposed on women. Only by confining his wife in a locked harem guarded by eunuchs could he be certain that her son was also his. Man's genital visibility is a source of his scientific desire for external testing, validation, proof. By this method, he hopes to solve the ultimate mystery story, his Chthonian birth. Woman is veiled. Violent tearing of this veil may be a motive in gang rapes and rape murders, particularly ritualistic disembowelings of the Jack the Ripper kind. The Ripper's public nailing up of his victim's uterus is exactly paralleled in tribal ritual of South African Bushmen. Sex crimes are always male, never female, because such crimes are conceptualizing assaults on the unreachable omnipotence of woman and nature, every woman's body contains a cell of archaic night, where all knowing must stop. This is the profound meaning. Behind striptease, a sacred dance of pagan origins which, like prostitution, Christianity has never been able to stamp out. Erotic, dancing by males cannot be comparable, for a nude woman carries off the stage a final concealment that Chthonian darkness from which we come.
Woman's body is a secret, sacred space. It is a temenos or ritual. Precinct. A Greek word I adopt for the discussion of art. In the marked off space of woman's body, nature operates at its darkest and most mechanical. Every woman is a priestess guarding the temenos of demonic mysteries. Virginity is categorically different for the sexes. A boy becoming a man quests for experience. The penis is like eye or hand, an extension of self reaching outward. But a girl is a sealed vessel that must be broken into by force. The female body is the prototype of all sacred spaces from cave shrine to temple and church. The womb is the veiled holy of holies, a great problem, as we shall see. For sexual polemicists like William Blake who seek to abolish guilt and covertness in sex, the taboo on woman's body is the taboo that always hovers over the place of magic. Woman is literally the occult, which means the hidden. These uncanny meanings cannot be changed, only suppressed, until they break into cultural consciousness again. Political equality will succeed only in political terms. It is helpless against the archetypal. Kill the imagination. Lobotomize the brain. Castrate and operate. Then the sexes will be the same. Until then, we must live and dream in the demonic turbulence of nature. Everything sacred and inviolable provokes profanation and violation. Every crime that can be committed will be rape as a mode of natural aggression that can be controlled only by the social contract. Modern feminism's most naive formulation is its assertion that rape is a crime of violence but not of sex, that it is merely power. Masquerading as sex, but sex as power and all power is inherently aggressive. Rape is male power fighting female power. It is no more to be excused than as murder or any other assault on another's civil rights. Society is woman's protection against rape, not, as some feminists absurdly maintain, the cause of rape. Rape is the sexual expression of the will to power, which nature plants in all of us and which civilization rose to contain. Therefore the rapist is a man with too little socialization rather than too much. Worldwide evidence is overwhelming that whenever social controls are weakened, as in war or mob rule, even civilized men behave in uncivilized ways, among which is the barbarity of rape. The latent metaphors of the body guarantee the survival of rape which is a development in degree of intensity alone of the basic movements of sex. A girl's loss of virginity is always in some sense a violation of sanctity, an invasion of her integrity and identity. Defloration is destruction, but nature creates by violence and destruction. The commonest violence in the world is childbirth, with its appalling pain and gore. Nature gives males infusions of hormones for dominance in order to hurl them against the paralyzing mystery of woman, from whom they would otherwise shrink. Her power as mistress of birth is already too extreme. Lust and aggression are fused in male hormones. Anyone who doubts this has probably never spent much time around horses. Stallions are so dangerous they must be caged in barred stalls. Once gelded, they are docile enough to serve as children's mounts. The hormonal disparity in humans is not so gross, but it is grosser than Rousseauists like to think. The more testosterone, the more elevated the libido. The more dominant the male, the more frequent his contributions to the genetic pool. Even on the microscopic level, Male fertility is a function not only of number of sperm but of their motility, that is, their restless movement, which increases the chance of conception. Sperm are miniature assault troops, and the ovum is a solitary citadel that must be breached. 
weak or passive sperm just sit there like dead ducks. Nature rewards energy and aggression. Profanation and violation are part of the perversity of sex, which never will conform to liberal theories of benevolence. Every model of morally or politically correct sexual behavior will be subverted by nature's demonic law. Every hour of every day, some horror is being committed somewhere. Feminism, arguing from the milder woman's view, completely misses the blood lust in rape the joy of violation and destruction, and aesthetics and erotics of profanation, evil for the sake of evil, the sharpening of the senses by cruelty and torture, have been documented in Sade, Baudelaire, and Heisman's. Women may be less prone to such fantasies because they physically lack the equipment for sexual violence. They do not know the temptation of forcibly invading the sanctuary of another body. Our knowledge of these fantasies is expanded by pornography, which is why pornography should be tolerated, though its public display may reasonably be restricted. The imagination cannot and must not be policed. Pornography shows us nature's demonic heart, those eternal forces at work beneath and beyond social convention. Pornography cannot be separated from art. The two interpenetrate each other far more than humanistic criticism has admitted. Jeffrey Hartman rightly says, Great art is always flanked by its dark sisters. Blasphemy and pornography. 6 Hamlet itself, the cardinal western work, is full of lewdness. Criminals through history, from Nero and Caligula to Giles de Raiz and the Nazi commandants, have never needed pornography to stimulate their exquisite, gruesome inventiveness. The diabolic human mind is quite enough. Happy are those periods when marriage and religion are strong. System and order shelter us against sex and nature. Unfortunately, we live in a time when the chaos of sex has broken into the open. G. Wilson Knight remarks, Christianity came originally as a tearing down of taboos in the name of a sacred humanity, but the church it gave rise to has never yet succeeded in Christianizing the pagan evil magic of sex. Seven historiographies most glaring error has been its assertion that Judeo-Christianity defeated paganism. Paganism has survived in the thousand forms of sex, art, and now the modern media. Christianity has made adjustment after adjustment, ingeniously absorbing its opposition, as during the Italian Renaissance, and diluting its dogma to change with changing times. But a critical point has been reached. With the rebirth of the gods in the massive idolatries of popular culture, with the eruption of sex and violence into every corner of the ubiquitous mass media, Judeo. Christianity is facing its most serious challenge since Europe's confrontation with Islam in the Middle Ages. The latent paganism of Western culture has burst forth again in all its demonic vitality. Paganism never was the unbridled sexual licentiousness portrayed by missionaries of the young embattled Christianity, singling out as typical of paganism the orgies of bored late Roman aristocrats would be as unfair as singling out as typical of Christianity the sins of renegade priests or the Vatican revels of Pope Alexander VI. True, orgy was a ceremony of the Chthonian mother cults in which there were both sex and bloodshed. Paganism recognized honored, and feared nature's demonism, and it limited sexual expression by ritual. Formally, Christianity was a development of Dionysian mystery, religion which paradoxically tried to suppress nature in favor of a transcendental other world. The sole contact with nature that Christianity permitted its followers was sex sanctified by marriage. Chthonian nature embodied in great goddess figures, was Christianity's most formidable opponent. Christianity works best 
when revered institutions like monasticism or universal marriage channel sexual energy in positive directions. Western civilization has profited enormously from the sublimation Christianity forced on sex. Christianity works least when sex is constantly stimulated from other directions, as it is now. No transcendental religion can compete with the spectacular pagan nearness and concreteness of the carnal red media. Our eyes and ears are drowned in a sensual torrent. The pagan ritual identity of sex and violence is mass media's chief. Check to the complacent Rousseauism of modern humanists. The commercial media, responding directly to popular patronage, sidestep. The liberal censors who have enjoyed such long control over book, culture, in film, popular music, and commercials, we contemplate all the demonic myths and sexual stereotypes of paganism that reform. Movements from Christianity to feminism have never been able to eradicate. The sexes are eternally at war. There is an element of attack, of search and destroy in male sex, in which there will always be a potential for rape. There is an element of entrapment in female sex a subliminal manipulation leading to physical and emotional infantilization of the male. Freud notes, apropos of his theory of the primal scene, that a child overhearing his parents having sex thinks male is wounding female and that the woman's cries of pleasure are cries of pain. Most men merely grunt, at best, but woman's strange sexual cries come directly from the Chthonian. She is a maenad about to rend her victim. Sex is an uncanny moment of ritual and incantation, in which we hear woman's barbaric ululation of triumph, of the will. One domination dissolves into another. The dominated becomes the dominator. Every menstruating or childbearing woman is a pagan and primitive cast back to those distant ocean shores from which we have never fully evolved. On the streets of every city, prostitutes, the world's oldest profession, stand as a rebuke to sexual morality. They are the demonic face of nature, initiates of pagan mysteries. Prostitution is not just a service industry, mopping up the overflow of male demand, which always exceeds female supply. Prostitution testifies to the amoral power struggle of sex, which religion has never been able to stop. Prostitutes, pornographers, and their patrons are marauders in the forest of archaic night. That nature acts upon the sexes differently as proved by the test. Case of modern male and female homosexuality, illustrating how the sexes function separately outside social convention. The result According to statistics of sexual frequency, male satyriasis and female nesting, the male homosexual has sex more often than his heterosexual counterpart, the female homosexual less often than hers, a radical polarization of the sexes along a single continuum of shared sexual nonconformity, male aggression and lust are the energizing factors in culture. They are men's tools of survival in the pagan vastness of female nature. The old double standard gave men a sexual liberty denied to women. Marxist feminists reduce the historical cult of woman's virginity to her property value, her worth on the male marriage market. I would argue instead that there was and is a biologic basis to the double standard. The first medical reports on the disease killing male homosexuals indicated men most at risk were those with a thousand partners over their lifetime. Incredulity. Who could such people be? Why, it turned out, everyone one knew. Serious, kind, literate men, not bums or thugs. What an abyss divides the sexes. Let us abandon the pretense of sexual sameness and admit the terrible duality of gender. Male sex is quest romance, exploration and speculation. 
Promiscuity in men may cheapen love but sharpen thought. Promiscuity in women is illness, a leakage of identity. The promiscuous woman is self-contaminated and incapable of clear ideas. She has ruptured the ritual integrity of her body. It is in nature's best interests to goad dominant males into indiscriminate spreading of their seed. But nature also profits from female purity. Even in the liberated or lesbian woman there is some biologic restraint whispering. Keep the birth canal clean. Injudiciously, withholding herself, woman protects an invisible fetus. Perhaps this is the reason for the archetypal horror, rather than socialized fear, that many otherwise bold women have of spiders and other rapidly crawling insects. Women hold themselves in reserve because the female body is a reservoir, a virgin patch of still, pooled water where the fetus comes to term. Male chase and female flight are not just a social game. The double standard may be one of nature's organic laws. The quest romance of male sex is a war between identity and annihilation. An erection is a hope for objectivity, for power to act as a free agent. But at the climax of his success, woman is pulling the male back to her bosom, drinking and quelling his energy. Freud says, man fears that his strength will be taken from him by woman, dreads becoming infected with her femininity and then proving himself a weakling. Eight masculinity must fight off effeminacy day by day. Woman and nature stand ever ready to reduce the male to boy and infant. The operations of sex are convulsive from intercourse through menstruation and childbirth, tension and distension, spasm, contraction, expulsion, relief. The body is wrenched in serpentine, swelling and sloughing. Sex is not the pleasure principle but the Dionysian bondage of pleasure pain. So much as a matter of overcoming resistance, in the body or the beloved, that rape will always be a present danger. Male sex is repetition compulsion. Whatever a man writes in the commentary of his phallic projections must be rewritten again and again. Sexual man is the magician, sawing the lady in half. Yet the serpent head and tail always live in. Rejoin. Projection as a male curse. Forever to need something or someone to make oneself complete. This is one of the sources of art and the secret of its historical domination by males. The artist is the closest man has come to imitating woman's superb self-containment. But the artist needs his art, his projection. The blocked artist, like Leonardo, suffers tortures of the damned. The most famous painting in the world, the Mona Lisa, records woman's self-satisfied apartness her ambiguous mocking smile at the vanity and despair of her many sons. Everything great in Western culture has come from the quarrel with nature. The West and not the East has seen the frightful brutality of natural process, the insult to mind in the heavy blind rolling and milling of matter. In loss of self we would find not love or God but primeval squalor. This revelation has historically fallen upon the Western male, who is pulled by tidal rhythms back to the oceanic mother. It is to his resentment of this demonic undertow that we owe the grand constructions of our culture. Apollonianism, cold and absolute, is the West's sublime refusal. The Apollonian is a male line, drawn against the dehumanizing magnitude of female nature. Everything is melting in nature. We think we see objects, but our eyes are slow and partial. Nature is blooming and withering in long, puffy respirations, rising and falling in oceanic wave motion. A mind that opened itself fully to nature without sentimental preconception would be glutted by nature's coarse materialism, its relentless superfluity, an apple tree laden with fruit. How peaceful, how 
picturesque, but remove the rosy filter of humanism from our gaze. And look again. See nature spuming and frothing, its mad spermatic bubbles endlessly spilling out and smashing in that inhuman round of waste, rot, and carnage. From the jammed glassy cells of Ciro, too. The feathery spores poured into the air from bursting green pods. Nature is a festering hornet's nest of aggression and overkill. This is the Chthonian black magic with which we are infected as sexual beings. This is the demonic identity that Christianity so inadequately defines as original sin and thinks it can cleanse us of procreative. Woman is the most troublesome obstacle to Christianity's claim to Catholicity, testified by its wishful doctrines of immaculate conception and virgin birth. The procreativeness of Chthonian nature is an obstacle to all of Western metaphysics and to each man in his quest for identity against his mother. Nature is the seething excess of being. The most effective weapon against the flux of nature is art. Religion, ritual, and art began as one, and a religious or metaphysical element is still present in all art. Art, no matter how minimalist, is never simply design. It is always a ritualistic reordering of reality. The enterprise of art, in a stable collective era or an unsettled individualistic one, is inspired by anxiety. Every subject localized and honored by art is endangered by its opposite. Art is a shutting in in order to shut out. Art is a ritualistic binding of the perpetual motion machine that is nature. The first artist was a tribal priest casting a spell, fixing nature's demonic energy in a moment of perceptual stillness. Fixation is at the heart of art. Fixation as stasis and fixation as obsession. The modern artist who merely draws a line across a page is still trying to tame some uncontrollable aspect of reality. Art is spellbinding. Art fixes the audience in its seat, stops the feet before a painting, fixes a book in the hand. Contemplation is a magic act. Art is order, but order is not necessarily just kind, or beautiful. Order may be arbitrary, harsh, and cruel. Art has nothing to do with morality. Moral themes may be present, but they are incidental, simply grounding an artwork in a particular time and place. Before the Enlightenment, religious art was hieratic and ceremonial. After the Enlightenment, art had to create its own world, in which a new Ritual of artistic formalism replaced religious universals. 18th century Augustan literature demonstrates it is the order in morality, rather than the morality in order that attracts the artist. Only utopian liberals could be surprised that the Nazis were art connoisseurs, particularly in modern times, when high art has been shoved to the periphery of culture. Is it evident that art is aggressive and Compulsive. The artist makes art not to save humankind but to save himself. Every benevolent remark by an artist is a fog to cover his tracks, the bloody trail of his assault against reality and others. Art is a temenos, a sacred place. It is ritually clean, a swept floor, the threshing floor that was the first site of theater. Whatever enters, this space is transformed. From the bison of cave painting to Hollywood movie stars, represented beings enter a cultic other life, from which they may never emerge. They are spellbound. Art is sacrificial, turning its inherent aggression against both artist and representation. Nietzsche says, almost everything we call higher culture is based on the spiritualization of cruelty. Nine literatures. Endless murders and disasters are there for contemplative pleasure, not moral lesson. Their status as fiction, removed into a sacred precinct, intensifies our pleasure by guaranteeing that contemplation cannot turn into action. No lunge by a compassionate spectator can 
avert the cool inevitability of that hieratic ceremony, ritually. Replayed through time. The blood that is shed will always be shed. Ritual in church or theater is a moral fixation, dispelling anxiety by formalizing and freezing emotion. The ritual of art is the cruel law of pain made pleasure. Art makes things. There are, I said, no objects in nature, only the grueling erosion of natural force, flecking, dilapidating, grinding down, reducing all matter to fluid, the thick primal soup from which new forms bob, gasping for life. Dionysus was identified with liquids, blood, sap, milk, wine. The Dionysian is nature's Chthonian fluidity. Apollo, on the other hand, gives form and shape, marking off one being from another. All artifacts are Apollonian. Melting and union are Dionysian. Separation and individuation, Apollonian. Every boy who leaves his mother to become a man is turning the Apollonian against the Dionysian. Every artist who is compelled toward art, who needs to make words or pictures as others need to breathe, is using the Apollonian to defeat Chthonian nature. In sex, men must mediate between Apollo and Dionysus. Sexually, woman can remain oblique, opaque, taking pleasure without tumult or conflict. Woman is temenos of her own dark mysteries. Genitally, man has a little thing that he must keep dipping in Dionysian dissolution, a risky business. Thing-making, thing-preserving is central to male experience. Man is a fetishist. Without his fetish, woman will just gobble him up again. Hence the male domination of art and science. Man's focus, directedness, concentration, and projection, which I identified with, urination and ejaculation, are his tools of sexual survival, but they have never given him a final victory. The anxiety in sexual experience remains as strong as ever. This man attempts to correct by the cult of female beauty. He is erotically fixated on woman's shapeliness. Those spongy maternal fat deposits of breast, hip, and buttock which are ironically the wateriest and least stable parts of her anatomy. Woman's billowy body reflects the surging sea of Chthonian nature. By focusing on the shapely, by making woman a sex object, man has struggled to fix and stabilize nature's dreadful flux. Objectification is conceptualization, the highest human faculty, turning people into sex. Objects is one of the specialties of our species. It will never disappear, since it is intertwined with the art impulse and may be identical to it. A sex object is ritual form imposed on nature. It is a totem of our perverse imagination. Apollonian thing-making is the main line of Western civilization, extending from ancient Egypt to the present. Every attempt to repress this aspect of our culture has ultimately been defeated. First Judaism, then Christianity turned against pagan idol-making. But Christianity, with wider impact than Judaism, became the most art-laden, art-dominated religion in the world. Imagination always remedies the defects of religion. The hardest object of Apollonian thing-making is Western personality, the glamorous, striving, separatist ego that entered literature in the Iliad but, I will show, first appeared in art in Old Kingdom Egypt. Christianity, wiping out paganism's secular glamours, tried to make spirituality primary. But as an embattled sect, it ended by reinforcing the West's absolutist ego structure. The hero of the medieval church militant, the knight in shining armor, is the most perfect Apollonian thing in world history. Art books need to be rewritten. There is a direct line from Greek and Roman sculpture through medieval armor to the Renaissance revival of classicism. Arms and armor are not handicrafts but art. 
They carry the symbolic weight of Western personality. Armor is the pagan continuity in medieval Christianity. After the Renaissance released the sensual, idolatrous art making of classicism, the pagan line has continued in brazen force to today. The idea that the Western tradition collapsed after World War I is one of the myopic little sulks of liberalism. I will argue that high culture made itself obsolete through modernisms, neurotic nihilism, and that popular culture is the great heir of the Western past. Cinema is the supreme Apollonian genre, thing making, and thing made, a machine of the gods. Man, the sexual conceptualizer and projector, has ruled art because art is his Apollonian response toward and away from woman. A sex object is something to aim at. The eye is Apollo's arrow following the arc of transcendence I saw in male urination and ejaculation. The Western eye is a projectile into the beyond, that wilderness of the male condition. By no coincidence, Europe first made firearms for gunpowder, which China had invented centuries earlier but found little use for. Phallic aggression and projection are intrinsic to Western conceptualization. Arrow, eye, gun, cinema. The blazing light beam of the movie projector as our modern path of Apollonian transcendence. Cinema is the culmination of the obsessive, mechanistic male drive in Western culture. The movie projector as an Apollonian straight shooter, demonstrating the link between aggression and art. Every pictorial framing is a ritual limitation, a barred precinct. The rectangular movie screen is clearly patterned on the post Renaissance framed painting. But all conceptualization is a framing. The history of costume belongs to art history but is too often regarded as a journalistic lady's adjunct to scholarship. There is nothing trivial about fashion. Standards of beauty are conceptualizations projected by each culture. They tell us everything. Women have been the most victimized by fashions ever turning. Wheel, binding their feet or bosom to phantom commands. But, fashion is not just one more political oppression to add to the feminist. Litany, standards of beauty, created by men but usually consented to, by women, ritually limit women's archetypal sexual allure. Fashion is an externalization of woman's demonic invisibility, her genital mystery. It brings before man's Apollonian eye what that eye can never see. Beauty is an Apollonian freeze frame. It halts and condenses the flux and indeterminacy of nature. It allows man to act by enhancing the desirability of what he fears. The power of the eye in Western culture has not been fully appreciated or analyzed. The Asian abysses the eyes and transfers value into a mystic third eye, marked by the red dot on the Hindu forehead. Personality is inauthentic in the East, which identifies self with group. Eastern meditation rejects historical time. We have a parallel religious tradition. The paradoxical axioms of Eastern end. Western mystics and poets are often indistinguishable. Buddhism and Christianity agree in seeing the material world as samsara, the veil of illusion. But the West has another tradition, the pagan, culminating in cinema. The West makes personality and history numinous objects of contemplation. Western personality is a work of art, and history is its stage. The 20th century is not the age of anxiety but the age of Hollywood. The pagan cult of personality has reawakened and dominates all art, all thought. It is morally empty but ritually profound. We worship it by the power of the Western eye. Movie, screen and television screen are its sacred precincts. Western culture has a roving eye. Male sex is hunting and scanning. Boys hang yelping from honking cars, acting like jerks over 
strolling girls, men lunching on girders go through the primitive book of wolf whistles and animal clucks. Everywhere, the beautiful woman is scrutinized and harassed. She is the ultimate symbol of human desire. The feminine is that which is sought. It recedes beyond our grasp. Hence there is always a feminine element in the beautiful young man of male homosexuality. The feminine is the ever-elusive, a silver shimmer on the horizon. We follow this image with longing. Eyes. Maybe this one. Maybe this time. The pursuit of sex may conceal a dream of being freed from sex. Sex, knowledge, and power are deeply tangled. We cannot get one without the others. Islam is wise to drape women in black, for the eye is the avenue of arrows. Western culture's hard, defined personalities suffer from inflammation of the eye. They are so numerous that they have never been catalogued, except in our magnificent portrait art. Western sexual personae are nodes of power, but they have made a torment of eroticism. From this torment has come our grand tradition of literature and art. Unfortunately, there is no way to separate the whistling ass on his girder from the rapt visionary at his easel. In accepting the gifts of culture, women may have to take the worm. With the apple, Judeo-Christianity has failed to control the pagan western eye. Our thought processes were formed in Greece and inherited by Rome whose language remains the official voice of the Catholic Church. Intellectual inquiry and logic are pagan. Every inquiry is preceded by a roving eye. And once the eye begins to rove, it cannot be morally controlled. Judaism, due to its fear of the eye, put a taboo on visual representation. Judaism is based on word rather than image. Christianity followed suit until it drifted into pictorialism to appeal to the pagan masses. Protestantism began as an iconoclasm, a breaking of the images of the corrupt Roman church. The pure, Protestant style is a bare white church with plain windows. Italian, Catholicism, I am happy to say, retains the most florid pictorialism. The bequest of a pagan past that was never lost. Paganism is I intense. It is based on cultic exhibitionism, in which sex and sadomasochism are joined. The ancient Chthonian mysteries have never disappeared from the Italian church. Waxed, saints' corpses under glass, tattered arm bones in gold reliquaries, half nude Saint Sebastian pierced by arrows, Saint Lucy holding her eyeballs out on a platter. Blood, torture, ecstasy, and tears. It's lurid. Sensationalism makes Italian Catholicism the emotionally most complete cosmology in religious history. Italy added pagan sex and violence to the ascetic Palestinian creed. And so to Hollywood, the modern Rome. It is pagan sex and violence that have flowered so vividly in our mass media. The camera has unbound demonic, western imagination, cinema as sexual showing, a pagan flaunting, plot and dialogue are obsolete word baggage. Cinema, the most eye, intense of genres, has restored pagan antiquities cultic exhibitionism. Spectacle is a pagan cult of the eye. There is no such thing as mere image. Western culture is built on perceptual relations. From the soaring god projections of ancient sky, cult to the celebrity inflating machinery of American commercial promotion, Western identity has organized itself around charismatic, sexual personae of hierarchic command. Every god is an idol, literally. An image, Latin idolum from Greek idolon. Image is implied. Visibility. The visual is sorely undervalued in modern scholarship. Art. History has attained only a fraction of the conceptual sophistication of literary criticism, and literature and art remain unmeshed. Drunk. With self-love. 
criticism has hugely overestimated the centrality of language to Western culture. It has failed to see the electrifying sign. Language of images. The war between Judeo-Christianity and paganism is still being waged in the latest ideologies of the university. Freud, as a Jew, may have been biased in favor of the word. In my opinion, Freudian theory overstates the linguistic character of the unconscious and slights the gorgeously cinematic pictorialism of the dream life. Furthermore, arguments by the French about the rationalist limitations of their own culture have been illegitimately transferred to England and America, with poor results. The English language was created by poets, a 500-year enterprise of emotion and metaphor, the richest internal dialogue in world literature. French rhetorical models are too narrow for the English tradition. Most pernicious of French imports is the notion that there is no person behind a text. Is there anything more affected? aggressive, and relentlessly concrete than a Parisian intellectual behind his, her turgid text. The Parisian is a provincial when he pretends to speak for the universe. Behind every book is a certain person with a certain history. I can never know too much about that person and that history. Personality is Western reality. It is a visible condensation of sex and psyche outside the realm of words. We know it by Apollonian vision, the pagan cinema of Western perception. Let us not steal from the eye to give to the ear. Word worship has made it difficult for scholarship to deal with the radical cultural change of our era of mass media. Academics are constantly fighting a rearguard action. Traditional genre criticism is moribund. The humanities must abandon their insular fiefdoms and begin thinking in terms of imagination, a power that crosses the genres and unites high with popular art, the noble with the sleazy. There is neither decline nor disaster in the triumph of mass media, only a shift from word to image, in other words, a return to Western cultures. Pre Gutenberg pre-Protestant pagan pictorialism. That popular culture reclaims what high culture shuts out as clear. In the case of pornography, pornography is pure pagan imagism. Just as a poem is ritually limited verbal expression, so is pornography. Ritually limited visual expression of the demonism of sex and nature. Every shot, every angle in pornography, no matter how silly, twisted or pasty, is yet another attempt to get the whole picture of the enormity of Chthonian nature. Is pornography art? Yes. Art is contemplation and conceptualization, the ritual exhibitionism of primal mysteries. Art makes order of nature's cyclonic brutality. Art, I said, is full of crimes. The ugliness and violence in pornography reflect the ugliness and violence in nature. Pornography's male-born explicitness renders visible what is invisible. Woman's Chthonian internality. It tries to shed Apollonian light on woman's anxiety provoking darkness. The vulgar contortionism of pornography is the serpentine tangle of Medusan. Nature. Pornography is human imagination intense theatrical action. Its violations are a protest against the violations of our freedom by nature. The banning of pornography, rightly sought by Judeo-Christianity, would be a victory over the West's stubborn paganism. But pornography cannot be banned, only driven underground, where its illicit charge will be enhanced. Pornography's amoral pictorialism will live forever as a rebuke to the humanistic cult of the redemptive word. Words cannot save the cruel flux of pagan nature. The Western eye makes things, idols of Apollonian objectification. Pornography makes many well-meaning people uncomfortable, because it isolates the voyeuristic element present in all art, and especially cinema. 
all the personae of art are sex objects. The emotional response of spectator or reader is inseparable from erotic response. As I said, our lives as physical beings are a Dionysian continuum of pleasure pain. At every moment we are steeped in the sensory, even in sleep. Emotional arousal is sensual arousal. Sensual arousal is sexual arousal. The idea that emotion can be separated from sex is a Christian illusion. One of the most ingenious but finally unworkable strategies in Christianity's ancient campaign against pagan nature. Agape, spiritual love, belongs to Eros but has run away from home. We are voyeurs at the perimeters of art, and there is a sadomasochistic sensuality in our responses to it. Art is a scandal, literally a stumbling block, to all moralism, whether on the Christian right or Rousseau-esque left. Pornography and art are inseparable, because there is voyeurism and voracity in all our sensations as seen, feeling beings. The fullest exploration of these ideas is Edmund Spencer's Renaissance epic, The Fairy Queen. In this poem, which prefigures cinema by its radiant Apollonian projections, the voyeuristic and sadomasochistic latency in art and sex is copiously documented. Western perception is a demonic theater of ritual surprise. We may not like what we see when we look into the dark mirror of art, sex object, artwork, personality. Western experience is cellular and divisive. It imposes a graph of marked-off spaces on nature's continuity and flow. We have made Apollonian demarcations that function as ritual preserves against nature. Hence our complex criminal codes and elaborate erotics of transgression. The weakness in radical critiques of sex and society is that they fail to recognize that sex needs ritual binding to control its demonism and secondly that society's repressions increase sexual pleasure. There is nothing less erotic than a nudist colony. Desire is intensified by ritual limitations. Hence the mask, harness, and chains of sadomasochism. The Western cells of holiness and criminality are a cognitive advance in human history. Our cardinal myths are Faust, who locks himself in his study to read books and crack the code of nature, and Don Juan who makes a war of pleasure and counts his conquests by Apollonian number. Both are cellular egos, seducers and criminal knowers, in whom sex, thought, and aggression are fused. This cell, separated from nature as our brain and eye, our hard personalities are imagistic projections from the Apollonian higher cortex. Personae are visible ideas. All facial expressions and theatrical postures, present among animal primates, are fleeting shadows of personae. While Japanese decorum limits facial expressions, Western art since the Hellenistic era has recorded every permutation of irony, anxiety, flirtation, and menace. The hardness of our personalities and the tension with which they are set off from nature have produced the West's vulnerability to decadence, tension leads to fatigue and collapse, late phases of history in which sadomasochism flourishes. As I will show, decadence is a disease of the eye, a sexual intensification of artistic voyeurism. The Apollonian things of Western sex and art reach their economic glorification in capitalism. In the past 15 years, Marxist Approaches to literature have enjoyed increasing vogue. To be conscious of the social context of art seems automatically to entail a leftist orientation. But a theory is possible that is both avant-garde and capitalist. Marxism was one of Rousseau's 19th century progeny, energized by faith in the perfectibility of man. Its belief that Economic forces are the primary dynamic in history as romantic naturism in disguise. That is, 
it sketches a surging wave motion in the material context of human life, but tries to deny the perverse demonism of that context. Marxism is the bleakest of anxiety formations against the power of Chthonian mothers. Its influence on modern historiography has been excessive. The great man theory of history was not as simplistic as claimed. We have barely recovered from a world war in which this theory was proved evilly true. 1. Man can change the course of history, for good or ill. Marxism is a flight from the magic of person and the mystique of hierarchy. It distorts the character of Western culture, which is based on charismatic power of person. Marxism can work only in pre-industrial societies of homogeneous populations raise the standard of living, and the rainbow riot of individualism will break out. Personality and art, which Marxism fears and censors, rebound from every effort to repress them. Capitalism, gaudy and greedy, has been inherent in Western aesthetics from ancient Egypt on. It is the mysticism and glamour of things, which take on a personality of their own. As an economic system, it is in the Darwinian line of Sade, not Rousseau. The capitalist survival of the fittest is already present in the Iliad. Western sexual personae clash by day and by night. Homer's gleaming bronze clad warriors are the Apollonian soup cans that crowd the sunny temples of our supermarkets and compete for our attention on television. The West objectifies persons and personalizes objects. The teeming multiplicity of capitalist products is an Apollonian correction of nature. Brand names are territorial cells of Western identity. Our shiny chrome automobiles, like our armies of grocery boxes and cans, are extrapolations of hard, impermeable Western personality. Capitalist products are another version of the artworks flooding. Western culture. The portable frame painting appeared at the birth of modern commerce in the early Renaissance. Capitalism and art have challenged and nourished each other ever since. Capitalist and artist are parallel types. The artist is just as amoral and acquisitive as the capitalist, and just as hostile to competitors. That in the age of the Merchant Prince artworks are hawked and sold like hot dogs. Supports my argument but is not central to it. Western culture is animated by a visionary materialism. Apollonian formalism has stolen from nature to make a romance of things. Hard, shiny, crass, and willful. The capitalist distribution network, a complex chain of factory, transport, warehouse, and retail outlet, is one of the greatest male accomplishments in the history of culture. It is a lightning-quick Apollonian circuit of male bonding. One of feminism's irritating reflexes is its fashionable disdain for patriarchal society, to which nothing good is ever attributed. But it is patriarchal society that has freed me as a woman. It is capitalism that has given me the leisure to sit at this desk writing this book. Let us stop being small-minded about men and freely acknowledge what treasures their obsessiveness has poured into culture. We could make an epic catalog of male achievements, from paved roads, indoor plumbing, and washing machines to eyeglasses, antibiotics, and disposable diapers. We enjoy fresh, safe milk and meat and vegetables and tropical fruits heaped in snowbound cities. When I cross the George Washington Bridge or any of America's great bridges, I think men have done this. Construction as a sublime male. Poetry. When I see a giant crane passing on a flatbed truck, I pause in awe and reverence, as one would for a church procession. What? power of conception. What grandiosity. These cranes tie us to ancient Egypt, where monumental architecture was first imagined and achieved. 
if civilization had been left in female hands, we would still be living in grass huts. A contemporary woman clapping on a hard hat merely enters a conceptual system invented by men. Capitalism is an art form, an Apollonian fabrication to rival nature. It is hypocritical for feminists and intellectuals to enjoy the pleasures and conveniences of capitalism while sneering at it. Even Thoreau's Walden was just a two-year experiment. Everyone born into capitalism has incurred a debt to it. Give Caesar his due. The pagan dialectic of Apollonian and Dionysian was sweepingly comprehensive and accurate about mind and nature. Christian love is so lacking its emotional polarity that the devil had to be invented to focus natural human hatred and hostility. Russism's Christianized psychology has led to the tendency of liberals toward glumness or depression in the face of the political tensions, wars, and atrocities that daily contradict their assumptions. Perhaps the more we are sensitized by reading and education, the more we must repress the facts of Chthonian nature. But the insupportable feminist dichotomy between sex and power must go, just as the hatreds of divorce court expose the dark face beneath the mask of love, so is the truth about nature revealed during crisis. Victims of tornado and hurricane instinctively speak of the fury of Mother Nature. How often we hear that phrase as the television camera follows dazed survivors, picking through the wreckage of homes and towns. In the unconscious, everyone knows that Jehovah has never gained control of the savage elements. Nature is pandemonium, an all-devil's day. There are no accidents, only nature throwing her weight around. Even the bomb merely releases energy that nature has put there. Nuclear war would be just a spark in the grandeur of space. Nor can radiation alter nature. She will absorb it all. After the bomb, nature will pick up the cards we have spilled, shuffle them, and begin her game again. Nature is forever playing solitaire with herself. Western love has been ambivalent from the start. As early as Sappho, 600 BC, or even earlier in the epic legend of Helen of Troy. Art records the push and pull of attraction and hostility in that perverse fascination we call love. There is a magnetics of eroticism in the West, due to the hardness of Western personality. Eroticism is an electric force field between masks, the modern pursuit of self. Realization has not led to sexual happiness, because assertions of selfhood merely release the amoral chaos of libido. Freedom is the most overrated modern idea, originating in the Romantic Rebellion against bourgeois society. But only in society can one be an individual. Nature is waiting at society's gates to dissolve us in her Chthonian bosom, out with stereotypes. Feminism proclaims. But, stereotypes are the West's stunning sexual personae, the vehicles of art's assault against nature. The moment there is imagination, there is myth. We may have to accept an ethical cleavage between imagination and reality, tolerating horrors, rapes, and mutilations in art that we would not tolerate in society. For art is our message from the beyond telling us what nature is up to. Not sex but cruelty is the great neglected or suppressed item on the modern humanistic agenda. We must honor the Chthonian but not necessarily yield to it. In the Rape of the Lock, Pope counsels good humor as the only solution to sex war. So with our enslavement by Chthonian nature, we must accept our pain, change what we can, and laugh at the rest. But let us see art for what it is and nature for what it is. From remotest antiquity, Western art has been a parade of sexual personae, emanations of absolutist Western mind. Western art is a cinema of sex. 
and dreaming. Art is form struggling to wake from the nightmare of nature. 2. The birth of the Western Eye. Mythology begins with cosmogony, the creation of the world. Somehow out of the chaos of matter comes order. The plenum, a soupy fullness, divides itself into objects and beings. Cosmogonies vary among societies. Earth cult admits the priority and primacy of nature. For Judeo Christianity, a sky cult, God creates nature rather than vice versa. His consciousness precedes and engulfs all. Hebrew cosmogony, in the polemical poetry of Genesis, is lofty in its claims. Creation is rational and systematic. The evolution of forms proceeds majestically, without carnage or cataclysm. God presides, with workmanlike detachment. The cosmos is something constructed, a framed dwelling for man. God is a spirit, a presence. He has no name and no body. He is beyond sex and against sex, which belongs to the lower realm. Yet God is distinctly he, a father and not a mother. Femaleness is subordinate, an afterthought. Eve is merely a sliver pulled from Adam's belly. Maleness is magic, the potent principle of universal creativity. The book of Genesis is a male declaration of independence from the ancient mother cults. Its challenge to nature, so sexist to modern ears, marks one of the crucial moments in Western history. Mind can never be free of matter, yet only by mind imagining itself free can culture advance. The mother cults, by reconciling man to nature, entrapped him in matter. Everything great in Western civilization has come from struggle against our origins. Genesis is rigid and unjust, but it gave man hope as a man. It remade the world by male dynasty, canceling the power of mothers. Jehovah exists somewhere outside his creation, beyond space and time. Most ancient cosmogonies begin with a primeval being who embraces all opposites and contains everything that is or can be. Why? Should any eternal, self-sufficient God add to what already is? Whether out of loneliness or a craving for drama, primeval deities set off the motion machine and add to their own troubles. My favorite, such God as Egyptian Kapera, who gives birth to the second stage of existence by an act of masturbation. I had union with my hand, and I embraced my shadow in a love embrace. I poured seed into my own mouth and sent forth from myself issue in the form of the god's shoe and tefnut. One logically, primeval hierarchs must dig into themselves to continue the story of creation. Jehovah, as much as Kapera, multiplies by self-compounding. Virtually all cosmogonies but ours are overtly sexual. The primeval deity may be hermaphroditic, like Egypt's mother goddess Mut, who has both male and female genitals. Or there is wholesale incest, the only sex possible when the in-group is the only group. Developed. Mythologies ignore the incest or edit it out, as Genesis does in. Discreetly passing over the question of whom Cain and Abel must marry to get on with history. Similarly, Greek myth stresses Hera as Zeus' wife but makes little of the fact that she is also his sister. In Egypt there never was so stringent a purification of sacred texts, and primitive motifs lingered on to the end. Isis and Osiris are distinctly sister and brother as well as wife and husband. Egyptian gods are tangled in archaic family romance. The mother goddess Hathor, for example, is eerily called the mother of her father and the daughter of her son. As in Romanticism, identity is regressive and Super condensed. The sexual irregularities of fertility gods are intrinsic to the dark, disorderly mystery of sexual growth. Judaism, though ascribing artfulness to God, is inhospitable to art. In man, earth cults' lurid sexual symbolism contains a psychic truth. There is a sexual element in all creation, in nature or art. Capera, eating his own seed, is a model of romantic creativity, where the self is isolated and sexually dual. Capera bent over himself as a Euroboros, the serpent eating its own tail, a magic circle of regeneration and 
rebirth. The Euroboros is the prehistoric track of natural cycle, from which Judaism and Hellenism make a conceptual break. Later in this book, I will argue that Romanticism restores the archaic Western past, divining lost or suppressed pagan myths. Incest, erotic solipsism, is everywhere in Romantic poetry. Masturbation, subliminal in Coleridge and Poe, boldly emerges in later Romantics like Walt. Whitman, Aubrey Beardsley, and Jean Genet, libidinous solitary, dreamers, Capera as the androgyne as demiurge, the supreme symbol of fertility religion as the great mother, a figure of double-sexed primal power. Many mother goddesses of the Mediterranean world were indiscriminately fused in the syncretism of the Roman Empire. They include Egyptian Isis, Cretan and Mycenaean, Gaia and Rhea. Cyprian Aphrodite, Phrygian Cybele, Ephesian, Artemis, Syrian Dia, Persian Anatus, Babylonian Ishtar, Phoenician, Astarte, Canaanite Atargatus, Cappadocian Ma, and Thracian Bendis, and Katitu, the Great Mother embodied the gigantism and unknowability of primeval nature. She descended from the period before agriculture, when nature seemed autocratic and capricious. Woman and nature were in mysterious harmony. Early man saw no necessary connection between coitus and conception, since sexual relations often preceded menstruation. Even today, pregnancy is unpredictable and takes months to show. Woman's fertility, following its own laws, inspired awe and fear. Though woman was at the center of early symbolism, real women were powerless. A fantasy dogging feminist writing is that there was once a peaceable matriarchy overthrown by warmongering men, founders of patriarchal society. The idea began with Bachofen in the 19th century and was adopted by Jane Harrison, that great scholar's one error. Not a shred of evidence supports the existence of matriarchy anywhere in the world at any time. Matriarchy, political, rule by women must not be confused with matrilineage, passive transmission of property or authority through the female side. The matriarchy hypothesis, revived by American feminism, continues to flourish outside the university. Primitive life, far from peaceable, was submerged in the turbulence of nature. Man's superior strength provided protection to women, particularly in the incapacitating final stages of pregnancy. The Polarization of sex roles probably occurred rather early. Men roamed and hunted, while women in their gathering forays ventured no farther from the campsite than they could carry their nursing infants. There was simple logic in this, not injustice. The link between father and child was a late development. Margaret Mead remarks, human fatherhood is a social invention. 2 James Joyce says, paternity may be a legal fiction. Three society had advanced when the male contribution to conception was acknowledged. Both sexes have profited from the consolidation and stability of the family. The myth of matriarchy may have originated in our universal experience of mother power in infancy. We are all born from a female. Colossus, Eric Newman calls the first stage of psychic development matriarchal. For therefore every person's passage from nursery to Society as an overthrow of matriarchy. As history, the idea of matriarchy is spurious, but as metaphor, it is poetically resonant. It is crucial for the interpretation of dreams and art, in which the mother remains dominant. Matriarchy hovers behind art works like the Venus, de Milo, Mona Lisa, and Whistler's mother, which popular imagination has made culturally archetypal. We will examine the way. Romanticism, as part of its archizing movement, restores the mother to matriarchal power, notably in Goethe, Wordsworth, and Swinburne. The autonomy of the ancient mother goddesses was sometimes called virginity. A virgin fertility seems contradictory, but it survives. In the Christian virgin birth, Hera and Aphrodite annually renewed their virginity by bathing in a sacred spring. The same duality appears in Artemis, who was honored both as virgin huntress and patron of childbirth. 
the Great Mother is a virgin insofar as she is independent of men. She is a sexual dictator, symbolically impenetrable. Males are non-persons. Newman elsewhere speaks of the anonymous power of the fertilizing agent. 5 Thus Joyce's sensual Great Mother, Molly Bloom, sleepily mulls over all the men in her life. As he, implying their casual interchangeability, the Great Mother did not even need a male to fertilize her. The Egyptian goddess Net gives birth to Ra by parthenogenesis or self fecundation. The mother goddess gives life but takes it away. Lucretius says, the universal mother is also the common grave. 6. She is morally ambivalent, violent as well as benevolent. The sanitized pacifist, goddess promoted by feminism as wishful thinking. From prehistory to the end of the Roman Empire, the great mother never lost her barbarism. She is the ever-changing face of Chthonian nature, now savage, now smiling. The medieval Madonna, a direct descendant of Isis, is a great mother with her Chthonian terror removed. She has lost her roots in nature, because it is pagan nature that Christianity rose to oppose. The masculine side of the great mother is often expressed in serpents, wound about her arms or body. Mary trampling the serpent. Underfoot recalls pagan images in which goddess and serpent are one. The serpent inhabits the womb-like underworld of Mother Earth. It is both male and female, piercing and strangling. Apuleius calls the Syrian goddess, omnipotens et omniparens, all potent and all. Producing 0.7 energy and abundance on so vast a scale can be crushing and cold. The fluid serpent will never be converted to friend. The goddess animal fecundity was cruelly dramatized in ritual. Her devotees practiced castration, breast amputation, self-flagellation, or slashing, and dismemberment of beasts. This sacrificial extremity of experience mimics the horrors of Chthonian nature. Today such behavior survives only in sexual sadomasochism, universally labeled perverse. I think sadomasochism an archizing phenomenon. Returning the imagination to pagan nature worship. Louis Farnell says whipping and vegetation rites was meant to increase fertility or, more often, to drive out from the body impure influences or spirits, so that it may become the purer vehicle of divine force. 8 In the Roman Lupercalia, depicted in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, Use Ran naked through the streets and struck matrons with leather thongs to stimulate childbearing. Newlyweds are pelted with rice to drive off evil spirits and fertilize the bride. Blows mark a rite of passage into maturity. The kneeling knight is struck with sword on shoulder by his lord. At Catholic confirmation, the kneeling adolescent is slapped by the bishop. The orthodox Jewish girl at first menstruation is slapped by her mother. In Stover at Yale, 1911, the lucky initiate to skull and bones is ambushed at night and slammed on the back. Blows are archaic magic, punishing marks of election. Castration in the mother cults may have imitated the reaping of crops. Only stone tools could be used for ritual castration, bronze or iron was forbidden, indicating the custom's prehistoric origins. Edith. Weigert Bauwinkel endorses the view that the Phrygians borrowed castration from the Semites, who altered it over time to circumcision, and that the celibacy of Catholic priests is a substitute for castration. Point nine: The Halalike tonsure of Catholic monks, like the shaved heads of priests of Isis, is a lesser self-mutilation. By castration, the devotee subordinated himself to the female life force. Contact with the goddess was dangerous. After making love with Aphrodite, Anchises ended up crippled, so that he had to be carried from burning Troy by his son Aeneas. The story that he was punished for boasting of his tryst is likely a late addition. H. J. Rose says of Anchises' handicap, the business of fertilizing the great mother was so exacting as utterly to exhaust the strength of her inferior male partner, who consequently if he did not die, became a eunuch. 10. Maleness is obliterated by shocks of female power. Self-castration was a one-way road to ritual impersonation. 
In the mystery religions, which influenced Christianity, the devotee imitated and sought union with his god. The priest of the Great Mother changed sex in order to become her. Transsexualism was the severe choice, transvestism less so. In ceremonies at Syracuse, men were initiated in Demeter's purple robe. In ancient Mexico, a woman representing the goddess was flayed and her skin put on by a male priest. The Great Mother's eunuch priest was called she. Thus after Catullus Attis castrates himself, the pronouns shift from masculine to feminine. Today, etiquette requires one to refer to the urban drag queen as she, even when he is in male dress. Spiritual enlightenment produces feminization of the male. Mead says, the more intricate biological pattern of the female has become a model for the artist, the mystic, and the saint. Eleven intuition or extrasensory perception is a feminine hearkening to the secret voices in and beyond things. Farnell says, many ancient observers noted that women, and effeminate men, were especially prone to orgiastic religious seizure. Twelve hysteria means womb madness, from the Greek. Eustera, womb. Women were sibyls and oracles, subject to prophetic visions. Herodotus speaks of Scythian enaries, male prophets afflicted by a female disease, probably sexual impotence. Point one three. This phenomenon called shamanism migrated northward to Central Asia and has been reported in North and South America and Polynesia. Fraser describes the shaman stages of sexual transformation, which resemble those of our candidates for sex reassignment surgery. The religious call may come as a dream in which the man is possessed by a female spirit. He adopts female speech, hairstyle, and clothing and finally takes a husband. Point one four, the Siberian shaman, who wears a woman's caftan sewn with large round discs as female breasts, is for Mercia Iliadi an example of ritual androgyny symbolizing the coincidentia oppositorum or reconciliation of opposites. Point one five inspired, the shaman goes into a trance and falls unconscious. He may disappear, either to fly over distant lands or to die and be resurrected. The shaman is an archaic prototype of the artist, who also crosses sexes and commands space and time. How many modern transsexuals are unacknowledged shamans? Perhaps it is to poets they should go for counsel, rather than surgeons. Tiresias, the androgynous Greek shaman, is depicted as an old man with long beard and pendulous female breasts. In Homer, Circe tells Odysseus his quest for home cannot succeed until he descends to the underworld to consult the seer. It is as if Tiresias, in the underworld of racial memory, represents a fullness of emotional knowledge fusing the sexes. The masculine glamour of the Iliad is gone. When we first see the hero of the Odyssey, he is weeping. The ruling virtues of this poem are female perception and endurance, rather than aggressive action. In Sophocles' Oedipus Rex, Tiresias is the hero's double. Tiresias and Oedipus are involuntary initiates into an uncanny range of sexual experience. At the start, Tiresias holds the key to the mystery of plague and perversion. He alone knows the secret of Oedipal family romance, with its inflamed multiplicities of identity. Oedipus as husband and son, father and brother. At play's end, Oedipus has literally become Tiresias, a blind holy man who pays the price of esoteric knowledge. In the wasteland, T.S. Eliot, following Apollinaire, makes Tiresias the witness and repository of modern sexual miseries. How did Tiresias become an androgyne? On Mount Scytherin, where infant Oedipus was exposed, he stumbled upon two snakes, mating, for which he was punished by being turned into a woman. Seven years later, he came upon the same site and was turned back into a man. The tale confirms the terrible consequences of seeing something forbidden to mortals. Thus Actaeon was torn to pieces by his hunting dogs for finding Artemis at her bath. Callimachus claims Tiresias was blinded for accidentally seeing Athena bathing. 
Hesiod, says. This same Tiresias was chosen by Zeus and Hera to decide the question whether the male or the female has most pleasure in intercourse, and he said, of ten parts a man enjoys one only, but a woman sense enjoys all ten in full. For this Hera was angry and blinded him, but Zeus gave him the seer's power. 16 The oldest part of Tiresias' story is the meeting with mating snakes, a Chthonian motif. The uncanny or grotesque in myth is evidence of extreme antiquity. The bantering comic tone of Zeus and Hera's domestic dispute marks it as later ornamentation. Charm in myths is a coming in from the Chthonian cold. I adopt the name, Tiresias, for a category of androgyne, the nurturant male or male mother. He can be found in sculptures of classical river gods, in romantic poetry, Wordsworth and Keats, and in modern popular culture, television talk show hosts. I take one more model from Greek prophetic transsexualism, the Delphic Oracle. Delphi, holiest spot of the ancient Mediterranean, was once dedicated to female deities, as the priestess recalls at the opening of Aeschylus. Eumenides. W. F. Jackson Knight asserts that Delphi means the female generative organ. 17 The delta has been found to symbolize the female pubes in societies as far as the Brazilian jungle. The Delphic oracle was called the Pythia or Pythoness after the giant serpent Pytho, slain by invading Apollo. Legend claims the oracle was maddened by fumes rising from a chasm above the decaying Chthonian serpent, but no chasm has been found at Delphi. The oracle was Apollo's high priestess and spoke for him. Pilgrims, royal and lowly, arrived at Delphi with questions and left with cryptic replies. It was after descending from Delphi that Oedipus collided with his father at the crossroads, a spot in the Greek pastureland still unchanged after 3,000 years of ghostly legend. The prophesying oracle was the instrument of the god of poetry, a lyre, upon which he played. E. R. Dodd states, the Pythia became Entheos, Plena Deo. The god entered into her and used her vocal organs, as if they were his own, exactly as the so-called control does in modern spirit mediumship. That is why Apollo's Delphic utterances are always couched in the first person, never in the third. 18 This resembles the ventriloquism Fraser ascribes to entranced shamans. Michelangelo uses the Delphic metaphor in a madrigal comparing a Renaissance virago, intellectual and poet Vittoria Colonna, to the oracle. A man and a woman, indeed a god, speaks through her mouth. The Delphic oracle is a woman invaded by a male spirit. She suffers usurpation of identity, like the mental sex transformations of great dramatists and novelists. I designate as the Pythoness, another category of androgyne, of which my best example will be the Sibylline. Comedienne Gracie Allen, the great mother is the master image from which split off surrogate subforms of female horrors, like Gorgon and Fury. The vagina dentata literalizes the sexual anxiety of these myths. In the North American Indian version, says Newman, a meat-eating fish inhabits the vagina of the terrible mother. The hero is the man who overcomes the terrible mother, breaks the teeth out of her vagina, and so makes her into a woman. 19 The toothed vagina is no sexist. Hallucination. Every penis is made less in every vagina, just as mankind, male and female, is devoured by Mother Nature. The vagina, dentata is part of the romantic revival of pagan myth. It is subliminally present in Poe's voracious maelstrom and dank, scythe, swept pit. It overtly appears in the Bible of French decadence. Heisman's A Rebors, 1884, where a dreamer is magnetically drawn toward Mother Nature's open thighs, the bloody depths of a carnivorous flower rimmed by sword blades. 20. The Greek gorgon was a kind of vagina dentata. In archaic art, she is a grinning head with beard, tusks, and outthrust tongue. She has snakes in her hair or around her waist. 
She runs in swastika form, a symbol of primitive vitality. Her beard, a postmenopausal virilization, turns up on the witches of Macbeth. She is like a jack o' lantern or death's head, the spectral night face of Mother Nature. The Gorgonian or bodiless head of fright antedates by many centuries. The Gorgon with a woman's body. Point two one. The Perseus legend obscures an ancient prototype. The hero seizes a trophy that cannot be severed or slain. Fig. One. Men, never women, are turned to stone by gazing at Medusa. Freud interprets this as the terror of castration, felt by boys at their first glimpse of female genitals. Point two two. Richard Tristman feels the staring mechanism involved in male consumption of pornography as a compulsive scrutiny or searching for the missing female penis. That female genitals do resemble a wound as evident in those slang terms. Slash, and, gash. Heismans calls the genital flower a hideous flesh-wound flower, mouth, wound. The gorgon is a reverse image of the mystic Rose of Mary. Woman's genital wound is a furrow in Female Earth, Snaky Medusa is the thorny undergrowth of nature's relentless fertility. 1. Perseus cutting off the head of Medusa, from the metope of Temple C at Selinus, Sicily, ca. 550-540 BC. The Gorgon's name comes from the adjective Gorgos, terrible, fearful, fierce, Gorgopos, fierce-eyed, terrible, is an epithet of Athena who wears the gorgon's head on breast and shield, a gift. From Perseus, it is an apotropion, a charm to ward off evil spirits. Like the giant eye painted on prows of ancient ships, Jackson Knight, says of the gorgonian, it occurs on shields, on the brow bands of war horses, and on the doors of ovens, where it was meant to exclude evil influences from the bread. 23 Jane Harrison compares the Gorgon's head to primitive ritual masks. They are the natural agents of a religion of fear and riddance. The function of such masks is permanently to make an ugly face at you if you are doing wrong, breaking your word, robbing your neighbor, meeting him in battle for you if you are doing right. 24 apotropaic charms are common in Italy, where belief in the evil eye is still strong. Gold hands and red are Gold horns dangle from necks and hang in kitchens next to chains of garlic to drive away vampires. The Mediterranean has never lost its Chthonian cultism. I use the apotropaic Gorgonian in two major ways. Art and religion come from the same part of the mind. Great cult symbols transfer smoothly into artistic experience. Solitary or highly original, artists often make apotropaic art. The Mona Lisa for example, seems to have functioned as an apotropion for Leonardo, who refused to part with it until his death at the court of the French king, hence its presence in the Louvre. Ambiguous Mona Lisa, presiding over her desolate landscape, is a Gorgonian, staring hierarch of pitiless nature, a second apotropion. Joyce's dense modernist style. Joyce has only one subject, Ireland. His writing is both a protest against an intolerable spiritual dependency and ironically an immortalization of the power that bound him. Ireland as a gorgon, in Joyce's words, the mother so who eats her children. Knight compares the maze-like meander design on Greek houses to tangled thread, charms on British doorsteps. Tangled drawings are meant to entangle intruders as the tangled reality of a labyrinthine construction at the approach to a fort actually helps very much to entangle attackers. 25 Language As Labyrinth Joyce's aggressive impenetrability as the hex sign of Harrison's religion of fear and riddance. We will later examine the creator of the first impenetrable modern style, Henry James. There, we return full circle to the Great Mother, for my theory is that James's decadent late style is the heavy ritual transvestism of a eunuch priest of the mother goddess. My third apotropion, Virginia Waltz to the Lighthouse, a novel as Ghost Dance, 
as invocation and exorcism. From Walf's diary, Father's birthday. He would have been 96, 96, yes, today. And could have been 96, like other people one has known, but mercifully was not. His life would have entirely ended mine. What would have happened? No writing, no books. Inconceivable. I used to think of him and mother daily, but writing the lighthouse laid them in my mind. And now he comes back. Sometimes, but differently. I believe this to be true, that I was obsessed by them both, unhealthily, and writing of them was a necessary act. 26. An apotropion bars encroachment by the dead. The ghost of Odysseus' mother, let us recall, is thirsty for blood. Unsentimentally, Wolf wishes for no longer years for her father. Contest for life is a Sade and power struggle. To the lighthouse is filled with imagines. Ancestor masks. The Romans put them in the atrium to keep them out of the bedroom. As family romance, to the lighthouse is the Gorgonian on the oven door, which must be shut to make a room of one's own. The novel has a second ritual pattern. The Eleusinian. Eurysis or, finding again, of Persephone by Demeter. Into the lighthouse, mother and daughter reunite, but only to bid farewell. Now my other major use of the Gorgonian. The ugly staring. Gorgon is the demonic eye. She is the paralyzing animal eye of Chthonian nature, the glittering, mesmerizing eye of vampires and seductresses. The tusked Gorgon is the eye which eats. In other words, the eye is still bound to biology. It hungers. I will show that the West invented a new eye, contemplative, conceptual, the eye of art. It was born in Egypt. This is the Apollonian solar disk, illuminating and idealizing. The Gorgon is the night eye, Apollo the day. I will argue that the origin of the Greek Apollonian is in Egypt. Greek ideas are creatures of Egyptian formalism. It is untrue the Egyptians had no ideas. There are, I said, ideas in images. Egyptian images made. Western imagination. Egypt liberated and divinized the human eye. The Apollonian eye is the brain's great victory over the bloody open mouth of Mother Nature. Only the Sphinx is as symbolically rich as the Gorgon. There are benign male Sphinxes in Egypt, but the famous one is female, born of the incest of half-serpent Echidna with her dog son Orthus. The Sphinx has a woman's head and bosom, a griffin's wings, and a lion's claws and rump. Her name means, the throttler, from the Greek, Sphigo, strangle, the riddle by which she defeats all men but Oedipus is the ungraspable mystery of nature, which will defeat Oedipus anyway. The Gorgon rules the eye, while the Sphinx rules. Words. She rules them by stopping them, stillborn, in the throat. Poets. Appeal to the muse to stave off the Sphinx. In Coleridge's Christabel, one of the great horror stories of Romanticism, Muse and Sphinx. Merge. Changing the poet's sex and making him mute. Birth as taking. First breath. But the Sphinx of nature throttles us in the womb. Other subforms of the great mother cluster in groups. The Furies. Or Arenaes or Avengers. Without fixed shape in Homer, they first gain. One in the Orestia. Hesiod says the Furies sprang from drops of blood, falling to earth from Uranus's castration by his son Kronos. They are cruel Chthonian emanations of the soil. The motif of seminal splashes recurs in Pegasus' birth from drops of blood from Medusa's severed head, suggesting the Gorgon's half maleness. In early ritual, throats were cut or blood poured directly on the field to stimulate Earth's fertility. The ugly, barbaric Furies are first cousin to Aphrodite. She comes from another seminal splashdown, from the foam cast up by Uranus's castrated organs hitting the sea. It is her arrival on shore, by convenient seashell, that Botticelli depicts in the birth of Venus. Aphrodite is therefore a Fury washed clean of her Chthonian origins. Aeschylus gives the Furies a dog-like room. Their eyes drip with pus. They are the demonic eye as running sore, the impacted, putrefying womb of nature. The harpies are servants of the Furies. 
they are, the Snatchers. From Harpazo, Snatch, airborne pirates, befouling men with their droppings. They represent the aspect of femaleness that clutches and kills in order to feed itself. The archetypal power of Alfred. Hitchcock's great saga of malevolent nature, The Birds, 1963, comes from its reactivation of the harpy myth, shown as both bird and woman. Caris resemble harpies as female carriers of disease and pollution. They are smoky intruders from the underworld. Greek art and literature never did crystallize a shape and story for them, so they remain vague. The sirens, on the other hand, made it into the erotic big time. They are graveyard creatures who appear in archaic art much like harpies, as birds with female heads and male beards. Homer's sirens are twin singers luring sailors to destruction on the rocks. They sit there in a meadow piled high with the moldering skeletons of men, whose withered skin still hangs upon their bones. 27 The sirens are the triumph of matter. Man's spiritual trajectory ends in the rubbish heap of his own mother-born body. Some female monsters shifted from plural to singular. Lamia, a bisexual Greek and Roman succubus who kidnapped children and drank their blood, was once one of many, like the child killer Mormo. Joseph Fontenrose calls the Lamiae, phasmata that rose from earth in woods and glens, while the Mormons were wandering. Daemons. 28 Jello, another child stealer, remains part of Greek. Superstition today. The night stalking vampire Impusa devoured her. Pray after the sex act. These examples catch myth midcourse. Spooks. And goblins, who run in packs in the primeval murk, begin to emerge. As personalities. But they must be condensed and refined by the popular imagination or by a great poet. Circe owes everything to Homer. An Italian sorceress living among. Pigs has been gorgeously enhanced with cinematic glamour. Lordly in her cold stone house, Circe waves her phallic wand over her subject. Males, grunting in the slop of infancy. She is the prison of sex, a tomb. In a thicket, Circe's Hebrew counterpart is Lilith, Adam's first wife, whose name means, of the night. Harold Bloom says Lilith, originally a Babylonian wind demoness, sought ascendancy in the sex. Act. The vision men call Lilith is formed primarily by their anxiety at what they perceive to be the beauty of a woman's body, a beauty they believe to be, at once, far greater and far less than their own. 29 Like Aphrodite, Circe and Lilith are the ugly made beautiful. Natures. Medusan Hag dons her magic mask in the Hall of Art. Sexually dominated by him, Circe warns Odysseus of future dangers. Her description of Skyla has relish, for Skyla is her outdoor alter ego. A cliff monster with twelve feet, six heads, and triple rows of teeth who plucks sailors off ships. Like the harpy, she is a snatcher, a gnawing female appetite. Skyla's female companion, Charybdis, is her upside-down mirror image, sucking and spewing. Three times a day, the killer whirlpool is the womb vortex of the Nature Mother. It is probably into Charybdis that Poe's hero sinks in. Descent into the maelstrom. Ovid Sir stunts Skyla's legs and girds. Her belly with a pack of wild dogs with gaping mouths. 30 Skyla. Becomes a vagina dentata or sexual she wolf. At the gates of hell in Milton's Paradise Lost. She is Sin, the torso of a beautiful woman. Ending in a scaly serpent with a scorpion sting. Her waist is ringed, with screeching hellhounds that kennel in her womb. The dogs are, insatiable, ulcerating lusts, like the Indian man eating fish. Sexual, disillusion leads to Skyla and Charybdis. King Lear, hanging a white, beard on his witchy daughter Goneril, sees woman as animal loined. A stinking, sulfurous pit, sucking men to hell. 4.vi.97-135 Attraction is repulsion, necessity bondage. The great mother's main disciple is her son and lover, the dying. God of Near Eastern mystery religion. Newman says of Addis, Adonis. 
Tammuz, and Osiris. They are loved, slain, buried, and bewailed by her, and are then reborn through her. Maleness is merely a shadow. World round in nature's eternal cycle. The boy gods are, phallic. Consorts of the Great Mother. Drones serving the Queen Bee, who are killed off as soon as they have performed their duty of fecundation. Mother love smothers what it embraces. The dying gods are, delicate. Blossoms, symbolized by the myths as anemones, narcissi, hyacinths, or violets. The ewes, who personify the spring, belong to the great. Mother, they are her bond slaves, her property, because they are. The sons she has born. Consequently the chosen ministers and Priests of the Mother Goddess are eunuchs. For her, loving, dying, and being emasculated are the same thing. Point three one. Masculinity flows from the Great Mother as an aspect of herself and is recalled and cancelled by her at will. Her son is a servant of her cult. There is no going beyond her. Motherhood blankets existence. The most brilliant perception of the Golden Bough, muted by Prudence, is Fraser's analogy between Jesus and the dying gods. The Christian ritual of death and redemption is a survival of pagan mystery religion. Fraser says, the type, created by Greek artists, of the sorrowful goddess with her dying lover in her arms, resembles, and may have been the model of the Pieta of Christian art. 32 Early Christian and Byzantine Christs were virile, but once the church settled in Rome. Italy's vestigial paganism took over. Christ relapsed into Adonis. Michelangelo's Pietà is one of the most popular works of world art partly because of its pagan evocation of the archetypal mother relation. Mary, with her unmarked maiden's face, is the mother goddess ever young and ever virgin. Jesus is remarkably epicene, with aristocratic hands and feet of morbid delicacy. Michelangelo's androgynous dying god fuses sex and religion in the pagan way. Grieving in her oppressive robes, Mary admires the sensual beauty of the son she has made. His glassy nude limbs slipping down her lap, Adonis sinks back to earth, his strength drained by and returned to his immortal mother. Freud says, it is the fate of all of us, perhaps, to direct our first sexual impulse towards our mother. 33 Incest is at the start of all. Biography and Cosmogony The man who finds his true wife has found his mother. Male mastery in marriage is a social illusion. Nurtured by women exhorting their creations to play and walk. At the emotional heart of every marriage is a pieta of mother and son. I will find traces of the archaic incest of mother cults in Poe and James in in Tennessee Williams's Suddenly Last Summer, where a queen mother, ruling a brutal primeval garden, marries her homosexual esthete, son, who is ritually slain and mourned. Female dynamism is the law of nature. Earth husbands herself. The residual paganism of Western culture bursts out full flower in modern show business. An odd phenomenon, over 50 years old, is the cultishness of male homosexuals around female superstars. There is no equivalent taste among lesbians, who as a group in America seem more interested in softball than art and artifice. The female superstar is a goddess, a universal mother-father. Cabaret parodies by female impersonators unerringly find the androgyny in the great stars. Mae West, Marlene Dietrich, Betty Davis, Eartha Kitt, Carol. Channing, Barbara Streisand, Diana Ross, Joan Collins, Joan Rivers, all are self-exalting females of cold male wool, with subtle sexual ambiguities of manner and look. Judy Garland inspired mob hysteria. Among male homosexuals, media reports speak of uncanny shrieking, mass assaults on the stage, blinding showers of bouquets. These were Orgiastic eunuch rites at the shrine of the goddess. Photos show posturing men making sensational entrances in garlands glittery costume, just like transvestite devotees of the ancient great mother. Such spectacles became rarer in the 70s, when American homosexuals went macho. But I sense a return to imaginative 
sensibility among younger men. Cultishness still thrives among homosexual opera fans, whose supreme diva was tempestuous Maria. Callis. I interpret this phenomenon, like pornography and perversion, as more evidence of men's tendency toward sexual conceptualization. For me a biological faculty at the roots of art, one result of the disease. Claiming so many lives is that homosexuals have been involuntarily rude to their shamanistic identity, fatal, sacrificial, outcast, to make sexual ideas out of reality, as they did in their fevered cult of the female star, is more profitable to culture than to act out such ideas in bar or bedroom. Art advances by self-mutilation of the artist. The more negative homosexual experience, the more it belongs to art. Our first exhibit from Western art is the so-called Venus of Willendorf, a tiny statuette, height 4 and 3 eighths, from the Old Stone Age. Found in Austria, Fig. 2. In it we see all the strange laws of primitive. Earth cult. Woman as idol and object, goddess and prisoner. She is buried in the bulging mass of her own fecund body. The Venus of Willendorf is comically named, for she is unbeautiful by every standard, but beauty has not yet emerged as a criterion for art. In the old stone age, art is magic, a ritual recreation of what is desired. Cave paintings were not meant to be seen. Their beauty for us is incidental. Bison and reindeer crowd the walls, following rock ridges and grooves. Art was invocation, a summoning. Mother Nature. Let herds return that man might eat. Caves were the bowels of the goddess, and art was a sexual scribbling, an impregnation. It had rhythm and vitality but no visual status. The Venus of Willendorf, a cult image half-molded from a rough stone, is unbeautiful because art has not yet found its relation to the eye. Her fat is a symbol of abundance in an age of famine. She is the too muchness of nature, which man longs to direct to his salvation. 2. Venus of Willendorf, ca. 30,000 BC. Venus of Willendorf carries her cave with her. She is blind, masked. Her ropes of cornrow hair look forward to the invention of agriculture. She has a furrowed brow. Her facelessness is the impersonality of primitive sex and religion. There is no psychology or identity yet, because there is no society, no cohesion. Men cower and scatter at the blast of the elements. Venus of Willendorf is eyeless, because nature can be seen but not known. She is remote even as she kills and creates. The statuette, so overflowing and protuberant, is ritually invisible. She stifles the eye. She is the cloud of archaic night. Bulging, bulbous, bubbling. Venus of Willendorf, bent over her own belly, tends the hot pot of nature. She is eternally pregnant. She broods in all senses. She is hen, nest, egg. The Latin mater and materia, mother and matter, are etymologically connected. Venus of Willendorf is the nature mother as primeval muck, oozing into infant forms. She is female but not feminine. She is turgid with primal force, swollen with great expectations. She has no feet, placed on end, she would topple over. Woman is immobile, weighed down by her. Inflated mounds of breast, belly, and buttock. Like Venus de Milo, Venus of Willendorf has no arms. They are flat flippers scratched on. The stone, unevolved, useless. She has no thumbs and therefore no tools. Unlike man, she can neither roam nor build. She is a mountain that can be climbed but can never move. Venus is a solipsist, navel-gazing. Femaleness is self-referential and self-replicating. Delphi was called the omphalos or navel of the world, marked by a shapeless holy stone. A black meteorite, a primitive image of Cybele, was brought to Rome from Phrygia to save the city. In the last Punic War, the Palladium, a Zeus-sent image of Athena, upon which Troy's fate depended, was probably such a meteorite. Today, the Kaaba, the inner sanctuary of the Great Mosque of Mecca, enshrines a meteorite, the Black Stone, as the holiest relic of Islam.
The Venus of Willendorf is a kind of meteorite, a quirky found object. Lumpish and mystic. The Delphic Omphalo stone was cone, womb, and beehive. The braided cap of Venus of Willendorf is hive-like, prefiguring the provocative beehives of French court wigs and shellacked swinging 60s towers. Venus buzzes to herself, queen for all days, woman for all seasons. She sleeps. She is hibernation and harvest, the turning wheel of the year. The egg-shaped Venus thinks in circles. Mind under matter, sex, I said, is a descent to the nether realms, a daily sinking from sky cult to earth cult. It is abdominal, abominable, demonic. Venus, of Willendorf is going down, disappearing into her own labyrinth. She, is a tuber, rooted from a pocket of earth. Kenneth Clark divides, female nudes into the vegetable and the crystalline Aphrodite. Inert, and self-communing. Venus of Willendorf represents the obstacle of sex and vegetable nature. It is at her shrine that we worship in oral sex. In the bowels of the Earth Mother, we feel but do not think or see. Venus dwindles to a double pubic delta, knees clamped and cramped in the sharp pelvic angle of the wide hipped childbearing woman, which prevents her from running with ease. Female jiggle is the duck like waddle of our wallowing Willendorf who swims in the underground river of liquid nature. Sex is probings, plumbing, secretions, gushings. Venus is drowsing and dowsing, hearkening to the stirring in her sack of waters. Is the Venus of Willendorf just a female experience? Yes, woman, is trapped in her wavy, watery body. She must listen and learn from something beyond and yet within her. The Venus of Willendorf, blind. Tongueless, brainless, armless, knock kneed, seems a depressing model of gender. Yet woman is depressed, pressed down, by Earth's gravitation, calling us back to her bosom. We will see that malign magnetism at work in Michelangelo, one of his great themes and obsessions. In the West, art is a hacking away at nature's excess. The Western mind makes definitions, that is, it draws lines. This is the heart of Apollonianism. There are no lines in the Venus of Willendorf, only curves and circles. She is the formlessness of nature. She is mired. In the miasmic swamp, I identify with Dionysus. Life always begins and ends in squalor. The Venus of Willendorf, slumping, slovenly, sluttish, is in a rut, the womb tomb of Mother Nature. Never send to know for whom the bell tolls. She tolls for thee. How did beauty begin? Earth cult, suppressing the eye, locks man in the belly of mothers. There is, I insisted, nothing beautiful in nature. Nature is primal power, coarse and turbulent. Beauty is our weapon against nature. By it we make objects, giving them limit, symmetry, proportion. Beauty halts and freezes the melting flux of nature. Beauty was made by men acting together. Hamlets, forts, cities, spread across the Near East after the founding of Jericho, ca. 8000 BC, the first known settlement in the world. But it was not until Egypt that art broke its enslavement to nature. High art is non utilitarian, that is, the art object, though retaining its ritualism, is no longer a tool of something else. Beauty is the art object's license to life. The object exists on its own, godlike. Beauty is the art object's light from within. We know it by the eye. Beauty is our escape from the murky flesh envelope that imprisons us. Egypt, making a state, made beauty. The reign of Chephren, FL, 2565 BC, gave Egyptian art its supreme style, a tradition to last until the time of Christ, Fig. 3. Pharaoh was the state. The concentration of power in one man, a living God, was a great cultural advance. A. King's emergence out of feuding tribal chieftains is always a step forward in history, as in the medieval era with its quarrelsome barons, commerce, technology, and the arts profit when nationalism wins over parochialism. Egypt, the first totalitarian regime, made a 
mystique out of one man rule. And in that mystique was the birth of the Western Eye. A king, ruling alone, is the head of state, as the people are the body. Pharaoh is a wise eye, never blinking. He unifies the scattered, many. The unification of Upper and Lower Egypt, a geographical triumph, was man's first experience of concentration, condensation, conceptualization, social order and the idea of social order emerge. Egypt as history's first romance of hierarchy. Pharaoh, elevated and sublime, contemplated life's panorama. His eye was the sun disk at the apex of the social pyramid. He had point of view, an Apollonian sightline. Egypt invented the magic of image. The mystique of Kingship had to be projected over thousands of miles to keep the nation together. Conceptualization and projection in Egypt is forged. The formalistic Apollonian line that will end in modern cinema. Master genre of our century. Egypt invented glamour, beauty as power and power as beauty. Egyptian aristocrats were the first beautiful people. Hierarchy and eroticism fused in Egypt, making a Pagan unity the West has never thrown off. The eros of hierarchical orders, separate but mutually intrusive, is one of the West's most characteristic perversions, later intensified by the Christian taboo. Upon sex, Egypt makes personality and history numinous. This idea, entering Europe through Greece, remains the principal distinction between Western and Eastern culture. 3. Chephren from the pyramid complex at Giza, ca. 2500 BC. A black line on a white page. The Nile, cutting through the desert, was the first straight line in Western culture. Egypt discovered linearity, a phallic track of mind piercing the entanglements of nature. The 30 royal dynasties of Egypt were the cascading river of history. Ancient Egypt was a thin band of cultivated land and average of 5 miles wide but 600 miles long. An absolutist. Geography produced an absolutist politics and aesthetics. At its height, in the Old Kingdom, pharaonic power created the pyramid, a mammoth design of converging lines. At Giza are remnants of the elevated causeway leading up from the Nile past the Great Sphinx to the Pyramid of Chephren. Long causeways, for construction crews and religious processions, were highways into history. Egyptian linearity cut the knot of nature. It was the eye shot forward into the far distance. The masculine art form of construction begins in Egypt. There were public works before, as in the fabled walls of Jericho, but they did not cater to the eye. In Egypt, construction is male geometry, a glorification of the visible. The first clarity of intelligible form appears in Egypt, the basis of Greek Apollonianism in art and thought. Egypt discovers four square architecture, a rigid grid laid against Mother Nature's melting ovals. Social order becomes a visible aesthetic, countering nature's Chthonian invisibilities. Pharaonic construction is the perfection of matter in art. Fascist political power, grandiose and self divinizing creates the hierarchical, categorical, superstructure of Western mind. Pyramids are man-mountains to rival nature, ladders to the sun of sky cult. Colossalism, monumentality, the ideal human figure in Egypt is a pillar, an element of architecture and geometry. The gigantism of procreative nature has been masculinized and hardened. Egypt had little wood but lots of stone. Stone makes an art of permanence. The body is an obelisk, square, phallic, sky pointing, an Apollonian line defying time and organic change. Egyptian art is glyptic, that is, carved or engraved. It is based on the incised edge, which I identify as the Apollonian element in Western culture. Stone is obdurate, unregenerate nature. The incised edge is the line drawn between nature and culture. It is the steely autograph of the Western will. We will find the sharp Apollonian contour in psychology as well as art. Western personality is hard, impermeable, intractable. Spengler says, the brilliant polish of the stone in Egyptian art makes the eye, 
glide, along the statue. Surface point 34 The West's armored eagle begins in the shiny stone. Idealizations of Old Kingdom pharaohs. Objects d'ar and objects de cult. The green diorite statue of enthroned Chephren from Giza is a masterpiece of smooth, glossy, Apollonian definitiveness. Its hardness of surface repels the eye. This masculine hardness is an abolition of female interiority. There are no warm womb spaces in aristocratic Egyptian art. The body is a shaft of frozen Apollonian will. The flatness of Egyptian wall painting and relief serves the same function. Obliterating woman's inner darkness. Every angle of the body is crisp, clean, and sunlit. Sagging maternal breasts of the Willendorf kind usually appear, oddly enough, only on male fertility gods like Happy. The Nile god. Egypt is the first to glamorize small breasts. The breast, as vernal adornment rather than rubbery milksack, outline rather than volume. Apollonian Egypt made the first shift of value from femaleness to femininity, an advanced erotic art form. Chthonian internality, as we shall see, was projected into the world of the dead, but Egypt also translated inner space into entirely social terms. Egypt invented interior decor, civilized living, it made beauty. Out of social life, the Egyptians were the first aesthetes. An aesthete does not necessarily dress well or collect artworks, an aesthete is one who lives by the eye. The Egyptians had taste, taste as Apollonian, discrimination, judgment, connoisseurship. Taste is the visible logic of objects. Arnold Hausa says of the Middle Kingdom, the stiffly ceremonial forms of courtly art are absolutely new and come into prominence here for the first time in the history of human culture. 35. The Egyptians lived by ceremony. They ritualized social life. The aristocratic house was a cool, airy temple of harmony and grace. The minor arts had unparalleled quality of design. Jewelry, makeup, costume, chairs, tables, cabinets. From the moment Egyptian style was rediscovered by Napoleon's invaders, it has been the rage in Europe and America, influencing fashion, furniture, and tombstones and even producing the Washington Monument, artifacts from other Near Eastern cultures, the Golden Bull's lyre from Ur, for example, seem cluttered, bulky, muscle-bound. In their cult of the eye, the Egyptians saw edges. Even their stylized gestures in art have a superb balletic contour. The Egyptians invented elegance. Elegance is reduction, simplification, condensation. It is spare, stark, sleek. Elegance is cultivated abstraction, the source of Greek and Roman classicism. Clarity, order, proportion, balance, is in Egypt. Egypt remains unabsorbed by humanistic education. Though its art and history are taught, it is taken far less seriously than Greece. The thinness of Egyptian literature keeps it out of core curricula. The superstition of Egyptian religion repels the rational, and the autocracy of Egyptian politics repels the liberal. But Egypt's power to fascinate endures, alluring poets, artists, actresses, and fanatics. Egyptian high culture was more complex and conceptual than has been acknowledged. It is underestimated because of the moralistic obsession with language that has dominated modern academic thought. Words are not the only measure of mental development. To believe that they are as a very Western or Judeo-Christian illusion. It stems from our invisible God, who talks creation into existence. Words are the most removed of human inventions from things as they are. The most ancient conflict in Western culture, between Jew and Egyptian, continues today. Hebrew word worship versus pagan. Imagism. The great unseen versus the glorified thing. The Egyptians were visionary materialists. They began the Western line of Apollonian aestheticism that we see in the Iliad, in Phidias, Botticelli, Spencer, Angra, Wilde, and Hollywood cinema. Apollonian. Things are the cold Western eye cut out of nature. Egyptian culture flourished relatively unchanged for three thousand years, 
far longer than Greek culture. Stagnancy, a stultifying lack of individualism, says the humanist. But Egyptian culture lasted because it was stable and complete. It worked. The Apollonian element in Egypt is so pronounced that the idea of classical antiquity should be revised to contain it. Egypt and the ancient Near East were also the source of the Dionysian countercurrent in Greek culture. In Greece Apollo and Dionysus were at odds, but in Egypt they were reconciled. Egyptian culture was a fusion of the conceptual with the Chthonian, the form making of consciousness with the shadowy flux of procreative nature. Day and night were equally honored. Here alone in the world were sky cult and earth cult yoked and harmonized. Fertility religion always comes first in history, but as the food problem is solved, nature's moral and aesthetic incoherence gradually becomes apparent. Egypt evolved into the sun worship of sky cult, without ever losing its orientation toward the earth. This was because of the Nile, center of the Egyptian economy. Each year the river flooded and receded, leaving a plain of rich black mud. Each year the hard went soft, earth turned liquid. John Reed says alchemy probably began in Egypt, since Chem was the ancient name of Egypt, the country of dark soil, the biblical land of Ham. 36 Metamorphosis is the Chthonian magic of shapeshifting Dionysus. The fertile muck was the primeval matrix with which Egyptians came into annual contact. The Apollonian as chaste contour, borderlines, the Nile, transgressing its borders with majestic regularity, was the triumph of mother, nature. Egypt's ideology of sun and stone rested on Chthonian ooze. The swamp of generation I identify with Dionysus. The oscillations of the Egyptian calendar produced a fruitful duality of point of view one of the greatest constructs of Western imagination. Chthonian mysteries are the secret of Egypt's perennial fascination. The gross and barbaric proliferated. A dung beetle, the scarab, was worshipped and worn as a gemstone. The scarab was minister of nature's decay, the bath of dissolution. Egyptian literature was undeveloped because internality was preempted by the death cult. There was only one ethical principle. Justice, mayat, a public virtue. Above ground or below, spirituality was projected into the afterlife. The Book of the Dead was demonic thought, ruminations, earth. Chawings. The mummy, swaddled like an infant, returned to nature's womb for rebirth. The painted tomb was cave art, prayers to demonic darkness. Egyptian culture was both earth tending and earth rejecting. Herodotus reports Egyptian men urinated like women. Egyptian gods were incompletely emerged from prehistoric animism. They were monstrous hybrids, half human and half animal, or animal joined to animal. E. A. Wallace Budge says the Egyptians clung to their composite creatures, despite the ridicule of foreigners. 371 God had a serpent head on a leopard body, another a hawk head on the body of a lion and horse, still another was a crocodile with the body of a lion and hippopotamus. Chthonian energy, like the Nile, is overflow and superfetation. The logic and rigor of the Apollonian eye had to defeat Egypt's fuzzy tribal fetishism. The Egyptian synthesis of Chthonian and Apollonian was of enormous consequence for Western tradition. It was in the interplay between earth and sky that idealized form began. Western personality is an Egyptian object dar, an exclusive zone of aristocratic privilege. The cartouche, a closed oval, surrounds a hieroglyphic name. In early Egyptian art, a serek or square palace facade signified kingship. Cartouche and serek are symbols of hierarchic sequestration, a closing in of the holy and royal to exclude the profane. They are a temenos, the Greek word for the sacred precinct around a temple. The reserved space of the cartouche is analogous to the wedjot, the apotropaic eye of Horus studying so many amulets and hieroglyphic displays, fig. 4. The Egyptian eye is synonymous with Western personality. Because the soul was thought to reside there, the eye is always shown full face, 
flounder-like, even when the head is in painted profile. The eye is licensed in Egypt. That is, it is released but ritually bound. The glamorous black-tailed outline of Egyptian eye. Makeup is a hieratic accent, both fish and fence. It contains an blocks out. Egypt honored the earth but also feared it. The pure, clean, Apollonian contour of Egyptian art is a defense against Chthonian. Muck and muddle. Egypt created the distance between eye and object, which is a hallmark of Western philosophy and aesthetics. That distance is a charged force field, a dangerous temenos. Egypt created Apollonian objects out of Chthonian fear. The Western line of Apollonian thing making, from Homer's bronzed warriors to capitalist cars and cans, begins in the Egyptian caged eye. 4. Steel of the Overseer of Magazine of Amon, Nib Amon, and his wife, Hoy, 18th. Dynasty, one of the most misunderstood features of Egyptian life, was the veneration of cats, whose mummified bodies have been found. By the thousands, my theory is that the cat was the model for Egypt's unique synthesis of principles, fig. 5. The modern cat, the last animal, domesticated by man, descends from Felis Libica, a North African wildcat. Cats are prowlers, uncanny creatures of the night. Cruelty and play are one for them. They live by and for fear, practicing being scared or spooking humans by sudden rushings and ambushes. Cats dwell in the occult, that is, the hidden. In the Middle Ages, they were hunted and killed for their association with witches. Unfair? But, the cat really is in league with Chthonian nature, Christianity's mortal enemy. The black cat of Halloween is the lingering shadow of archaic night. Sleeping up to 20 of every 24 hours, cats reconstruct and inhabit the primitive night world. The cat is telepathic, or at least thinks that it is. Many people are unnerved by its cool stare. Compared to dogs, slavishly eager to please, cats are autocrats of naked self-interest. They are both amoral and immoral, consciously breaking rules. Their evil look at such times as no human projection. The cat may be the only animal who savors the perverse or reflects upon it. Thus the cat is an adept of Chthonian mysteries. But it has a hieratic duality. It is eye intense. The cat fuses the gorgon eye of appetite to the detached Apollonian eye of contemplation. The cat values invisibility, comically imagining itself undetectable as it slouches across a lawn, but it also fashionably loves to see and be seen. It is a spectator of life's drama, amused, condescending. It is a narcissist, always adjusting its appearance. When it is disheveled, its spirits fall. Cats have a sense of pictorial composition. They station themselves symmetrically on chairs, rugs, even a sheet of paper on the floor. Cats adhere to an Apollonian metric of mathematical space. Haughty, solitary, precise, they are arbiters of elegance, that principle I find natively Egyptian. 5. Cat goddess with one gold earring, late dynastic. Cats are poseurs. They have a sense of persona and become visibly embarrassed when reality punctures their dignity. Apes are more human but less beautiful. They posture but never pose. Hunkering, chattering, chest beating, buttock bearing, apes are bumptious vulgarians lurching up the evolutionary road. The cats, sophisticated personae are masks of an advanced theatricality. Priest and god of its own cult, the cat follows a code of ritual purity cleaning itself religiously, it makes pagan sacrifices to itself and may share its ceremonies with the elect. The day of a cat owner often begins with the discovery of a neat pile of mole guts or mashed mouse limbs on the porch, Darwinian mementos. The cat is the least Christian inhabitant of the average home. In Egypt the cat, in Greece the horse. The Greeks did not care for cats. They admired the horse and used it constantly in art and metaphor. The horse is an athlete, proud but serviceable. It accepts citizenship in a public system. The cat is a law unto itself. It has never 
lost its despotic air of oriental luxury and indolence. It was too feminine for the male-loving Greeks. I spoke of Egypt's invention of femininity, an aesthetic of social practice removed from nature's brutal female machinery, aristocratic Egyptian women's costume, an exquisite tunic of transparent pleated linen, must be called slinky, a word we still use for form-fitting evening gowns. Slinkiness is the nocturnal stealth of cats. The Egyptians admired sleekness, in greyhounds, jackals, and hawks. Sleekness is smooth Apollonian contour, but slinkiness is the sinuous craft of demonic darkness, which the cat carries into day. Cats have secret thoughts, a divided consciousness. No other animal is capable of ambivalence, those ambiguous cross-currents of feeling, as when a purring cat simultaneously buries its teeth, warningly in one's arm. The inner drama of a lounging cat is telegraphed by its ears, which swerve round toward a distant rustle as its eyes rest with false adoration on ours, and secondly by its tail, which flicks menacingly even while the cat dozes. Sometimes the cat pretends to have no relation to its own tail, which it schizophrenically attacks. The twitching, thumping tail is the Chthonian barometer of the cat's Apollonian world. It is the serpent in the garden, bumping and grinding with malice aforethought. The cat's ambivalent duality is dramatized in erratic mood swings, abrupt leaps from torpor to mania, by which it checks our presumption. Come no closer. I can never be known. Thus the Egyptian veneration of cats was neither silly nor childish. Through the cat, Egypt defined and refined its complex aesthetic. The cat was the symbol of that fusion of Chthonian and Apollonian which no other culture achieved. The West's eye intense pagan line begins in Egypt, as does the hard persona of art and politics. Cats are exemplars of both. The crocodile, also honored in Egypt, resembles the cat in its daily passage between two realms, hefting itself between water and earth. The spiky crocodile is the West's armored ego, sinister, hostile, and ever watchful. The cat is a time traveler from ancient Egypt. It returns whenever sorcery or style is in vogue. In the decadent aestheticism of Poe and Baudelaire, the cat regains its sphinx-like prestige and magnitude, with its taste for ritual and bloody spectacle. Conspiracy and exhibitionism, the cat is pure pagan pomp. Uniting nocturnal primitivism to Apollonian elegance of line, it became the living paradigm of Egyptian sensibility. The cat, fixing its swift, predatory energy in poses of Apollonian stasis, was the first to enact the frozen moment of perceptual stillness that is high art. Our second exhibit from Western art is the bust of Nefertiti. Figs. 6 and 7. How familiar it is, and yet how strange. Nefertiti is the opposite of the Venus of Willendorf. She is the triumph of Apollonian. Image over the humpiness and horror of Mother Earth. Everything fat, slack, and sleepy is gone. The western eye is open and alert. It has forced objects into their frozen frame. But the liberation of the eye has its price. Taut, still, and truncated. Nefertiti is western ego under glass. The radiant glamour of this supreme sexual persona comes to us from a palace prison, the overdeveloped brain. Western culture, moving up toward Apollonian sunlight, discards one burden only to stagger under another. 6. Nefertiti, copy, the bust, found by a German expedition at Amarna in 1912, dates from the reign of Akhenaten, 1375 to 57 BC. Queen Nefertiti, wife of the pharaoh, wears a wig crown peculiar to the 18th dynasty and seen elsewhere only on Akhenaten's formidable mother, Queen. T.I.Y. The bust is painted limestone with plaster additions. The eye is inset rock crystal. The ears and uraeus, the royal serpent, on the brow, are broken. Scholars have debated whether the piece is a studio model for court artists. The Nefertiti bust is one of the most popular artworks in the world. 
it is printed on scarves and molded in necklace pendants and coffee table miniatures. But never in my experience is the bust exactly reproduced. The copyist softens it, feminizes and humanizes it. The actual bust is intolerably severe. It is too uncanny an object for domestic display. Even art books lie. The bust is usually posed in profile or at an angle, so that the missing left pupil is hidden or shadowed. What happened to the eye? Perhaps it was unnecessary in a model and never inserted. But the eye was often chiseled out of statues and paintings of the dead. It was a way of making a hated rival a non-person and extinguishing his or her survival in the afterlife. Akhenaten's reign was divisive, his creation of a new capital, and efforts to crush the powerful priesthood, his establishment of monotheism and innovations in artistic style were nullified under his son-in-law, Tutankhamun, the short-lived boy king. Nefertiti may have lost her eye in the wreck of the 18th dynasty. 7. Nefertiti, ca. 1350 BC, as we have it. The bust of Nefertiti is artistically and ritualistically complete, exalted, harsh, and alien. It fuses the naturalism of the Amarna period with the hieratic formalism of Egyptian tradition. But, Amarna expressiveness ends in the grotesque. This is the least consoling of great artworks. Its popularity is based on misunderstanding and suppression of its unique features. The proper Response to the Nefertiti bust as fear. The queen is an android, a manufactured being. She is a new Gorgonian, a bodiless head of fright. She is paralyzed and paralyzing. Like enthroned Chephren, Nefertiti is suave, urbane. She gazes toward the far distance, seeing what is best for her people. But her eyes, with their cat like rim of coal, are cold. She is self divinized authority. Art shows Akhenaten, half feminine, his limbs shrunken and belly bulging, possibly from birth defect or disease. This portrait shows his queen half masculine, a vampire of political will. Her seductive force both lures in and warns away. She is Western personality barricaded behind its aching, icy line of Apollonian identity. Nefertiti's head is so massive it threatens to snap the neck like a stock. She is like a papyrus blossom swaying on its river reed. The head is swollen to the point of deformity. She seems futuristic, with the enlarged cerebrum foreseen as the destiny of our species. The crown is filled like a funnel with a rain of hierarchic energy, flooding the fragile brain pan and violently pushing the face forward like the prow of a ship. Nefertiti is like the winged victory of Samothrace garments plastered back by the wind of history. As cargo, Nefertiti carries her own excess of thought. She is weighed down by Apollonian wakefulness, a sun that never sets. Egypt invented the pillar, which Greece would refine. With her slim aristocratic neck, Nefertiti is a pillar, a caryatid. She bears the burden of state upon her head. Rafters of the Temple of the Sun. The golden brow band is a Ritual bridal, squeezing, constricting, limiting. Nefertiti presides from the Temenos of Power, a sacred precinct she can never leave. Venus of Willendorf is all body, Nefertiti all head. Her shoulders have been cut away by radical surgery. Early in its history, Egypt invented the bust, a portrait style still in use. It may have been a robust double, the ka that enters and exits through false doors. The shoulders of the Nefertiti bust have shriveled to become their own pedestal. No physical force remains. The queen's body is bound and invisible, like a mummy. Her face gleams with the newness of rebirth, tense with self-creation. She is a goddess as mother-father. The pregnancy of Venus of Willendorf is displaced upward and redefined. Willendorf as Chthonian belly magic, Nefertiti Apollonian head magic. Thinking makes it so. Nefertiti is a royal highness, propelling herself like a jet into sky cult. Forward thrust. Nefertiti leads with her chin. She has great bones. She is Egyptian stone architecture, just as 
Venus of Willendorf as earthen ovals, woman as quivering poached. Egg. Nefertiti as femaleness made mathematical, femaleness. Sublimized by becoming harder and more concrete. I said Egypt invented elegance, which is reduction, simplification. Condensation. Mother nature as addition and multiplication, but. Nefertiti as subtraction. Visually, she has been reduced to her essence. Her sleek contoured face is one step from the wizened. She is. Abbreviation. A symbol or pictogram. A pure idea of pagan. Pictorialism. One can never be too rich or too thin, decreed the. Duchess of Windsor. I said the idea of beauty is based on enormous. Exclusions. So much is excluded from the Nefertiti bust that we can. Feel its silhouette straining against the charged atmosphere, a combat. Of Apollonian line. The name Nefertiti means, the beautiful one. Cometh. Her haughty face is carved out of the chaos of nature. Beauty is a state of war. A frigid blank zone under siege. Nefertiti is ritualized western personality, a streamlined thing. She. Is forbiddingly clean. Her eyebrows are shaved and redrawn with male width and frown. She is as depilated as a priest. She has the face of a mannequin, static, posed, self-proffering. Her knowingness is both fashionable and hieratic. The modern mannequin of window or runway is an androgyne because she is femaleness impersonalized by masculine abstraction. If a studio model, the Nefertiti bust is as much a mannequin as the royal dummy of a London tailor shop. As queen and mannequin, Nefertiti is both exposed and enclosed, a face and a mask. She is naked yet armored, experienced yet ritually pure. She is sexually unapproachable because bodiless. Her torso is gone. Her full lips invite but remain firmly pressed together. Her perfection is for display, not for use. Akhenaten and his queen would greet their court from a balcony, the window of appearance. All art is a window of appearance. Nefertiti's face is the sun of consciousness, rising over a new horizon, the frame or mathematical grid of man's victory over nature. The idolatrous thingness of Western art is a theft of authority from Mother Nature. Nefertiti's mismatched eyes, deliberate or accidental, are a symbol of Egyptian duality. Like the cat, she sees in and sees out. She is. Frozen Apollonian poseur and Gorgonesque demonic seer. The Greek. Graii, three old divine sisters, had one eye that they passed from. Hand to hand. Fontainrose connects this to the double pupil of a. Lydian queen. What she had, it seems to me, was a removable eye of. Wondrous power. It was an eye that could penetrate the invisible. 38. Nefertiti, the half-blind mannequin, sees more by being less. Mutilation is mystic expansion. Modern copyists suppress the missing. Eye because it is fatal to popular canons of beauty. Maimed eyes seem. Mad or spectral. As in the veiled vulture's eye of Poe's tell-tale heart. Nefertiti is a mutant and visionary materialist. A thing that sees. In. Egypt, matter is made numinous by the first electricity of mind. In the Egyptian cult of seeing, Nefertiti is thought in flight from its origins. From Venus of Willendorf to Nefertiti. From body to face, touch to sight, love to judgment, nature to society. Nefertiti is like Athena, born from the brow of Zeus, a head-heavy armored goddess. She is beautiful but desexed. She is hieratic decorum and reserve, her head, literally a reservoir of containment and curtailment, like her stunted torso, her ponderous, ostentatious crown is the cold breeding ground, of Greek categorical thought, her tight brow band is stringency, rigor, channeled ideas, the miasmic cloud of mother nature has lifted, Nefertiti's imperious jutting face is the cutting edge of western, conceptualization and projection. In her profile, all roads lead to the eye. From the side, diagonals converge in peaking vectors of force. From the front, she rears up like a cobra head, woman as royal. Intimidator. She is the eye intense west, the overenlargement and grandiosity of head culture. The bust of Nefertiti is eye pleasing but 
oppressive. It looks forward to Bellini's androgynous Doge Loridan, to Neapolitan silver reliquary busts, to 50s fantasy drawings of smiling armless women in chic evening gowns. Authority, goodwill, aloofness, asceticism, epiphany as a totem of vibrating passivity. With her welcoming but uncanny smile, Nefertiti as Western personality in its ritual bonds, exquisite and artificial, she is mind-made image, forever caught in radiant Apollonian freeze frame. 3. Apollo and Dionysus. The Greek gods are sharp personalities, interacting in dramatic space. Their visualization was first achieved by blind Homer, in his epic arcs of cinematic light. Homer's conceptions were confirmed by Phidias, the great sculptor of high classic Athens, from which came the cold white monoliths of Roman art and architecture. In Egypt, sky cult and earth cult were harmonized, but in Greece, there is a split. Greek greatness is Apollonian. The gods live on a peak, touching the sky. Olympus and Parnassus are mountain shrines of creative power spurning the earth. In that swerve upward is the sublime conceptualism of Western intellect and art. Egypt gave Greece the pillar and monumental sculpture, which Greece turns from Pharaoh to Koros, from divine king to divine boy. Hidden in these gifts lay Egypt's Apollonianism, which Greek artists so splendidly develop. The orderly mathematic of the Doric temple is an orchestration of Egyptian ideas. Phidias brings person and building together on the Acropolis or High City, Athens' magic mountain. Egypt invented clarity of image, the essence of Apollonianism. From Old Kingdom pharaohs to Phidias is 2,000 years but one step. In the history of art, Greek sky cult is an Egyptian colonnade of stony things, the hard, harsh blocks of Western personality. In Judeo-Christianity man is made in God's image, but in Greek religion God is made in man's image. The Greek gods have a higher human beauty, their flesh incorruptible yet sensual. Greece, unlike Egypt, never worshipped beast gods. Greek sky cult kept nature in her place. The visibility of the Greek gods is intellectual, symbolizing mind's victory over matter. Art, a glorification of matter, wins its independence in the gods' perfection. We know the name of no artist. Before signed archaic pottery of 6th century Greece, the artist in Egypt was merely an anonymous artisan, which he became again in Rome and the Middle Ages. Judaism repressed art and the artist, reserving creativity for its fabricator god. The Greek gods, well made, but not making, float like golden solids in air. Jane Harrison calls the Olympians, objects dar won their brilliant clarity and glittering chastity of form are Apollonian. In psychology, philosophy, and art, classical Greek imagination sought, in Eduard Frankel's words, lambda o gos, ratio, the intelligible, determinate, mensurable, as opposed to the fantastic, vague, and shapeless, to the Apollonian, I said, is the line drawn against nature. For Harrison, the Olympian gods are patriarchal betrayers of earth cult and mother. Nature, the Chthonian is her test of authenticity and spiritual value. But I say there is neither person, thought, thing, nor art in the brutal. Chthonian. It was, ironically, the West's Apollonian line that produced. The matchless Jane Harrison. Nietzsche calls Apollo, the marvelous divine image of the Principium Individuationis, god of individuation and just boundaries. 3. The Apollonian borderline separates deems, districts, ideas, persons. Western individuation is Apollonian. The Western ego is finite, articulated, visible. Apollo is the integrity and unity of Western personality, a firm outline shape of sculptural definitiveness. Apollo lays down the law. W.K.C. Guthrie says, Apollo was first and foremost the patron of the legal or statutory aspect of religion. For Apollo links society and religion. He is fabricated. Form. He is exclusion and exclusiveness. I will argue that the Olympians as objects dar symbolize social order. 
Roger Hinks says, Olympian religion is essentially a religion of the successful, comfortable, and healthy ruling class. The downtrodden peasant, harassed by the necessities of keeping body and soul together in a naturally unfruitful land, crippled by debt and social injustice, asked something very different of his gods. The Olympians bore a discouraging resemblance to his oppressors. Five aristocracy is aboveness. The Olympians are authoritarian and repressive. What they repress is the monstrous gigantism of Chthonian nature, that murky night world from which society must be reclaimed day by day. Greek art transformed Apollo from the virile bearded god to a beautiful young man or a feeb. He was once a wolf god. Apollo. Lucios, the wolfish Apollo, gave his name to the academic lyceum. Literally, place of wolves. Apollo's wolfishness survives in his severity and austerity, his Doric plainness and rigor. The Dorians, who invaded Greece from the north in the 12th century BC, may have been blonde, recalled in Homer's red-haired Menelaus. I think, Apollonian light turned again into blondness, one of Europe's racist motifs, glamorized in Botticelli and the Apollonian fairy queen. Blondness is Apollo's wolfish coldness and conceptualism. It made its mark on our century in Hitler's homoerotic Aryanism and in the icy eye spear of black and white Apollonian cinema. By the early 5th century, Greek art purged both Chthonian and single sex elements. From the major Olympians, only the brothers Zeus and Poseidon retained their full beards and burly torsos. The aphibic androgyny of the high classic Apollo turned into effeminacy in Hellenistic art. Apollo's latent transsexualism is partly evident in his connection to his twin sister, Artemis. Mythological twins are normally male, as in battling brothers from Egyptian Set and Osiris to Lewis Carroll's Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Apollo and Artemis represent not conflict but consonance. They are mirror images, male and female, versions of one personality a motif not returning until the incestuous brother-sister pairs of romanticism. The fraternal androgynes Apollo and Artemis are, with Athena, the most militant of Olympians in the war against Chthonian nature. Jane Harrison resents their twinship, deriving their barren relation of sister and brother from the early hierarchy of great mother over son lover. Point six. Artemis thwarts the gross fecundities of earth cult. Euripides, Hippolytus, her celibate devotee, is destroyed by jealous Aphrodite, who unleashes the monsters of Chthonian nature. Walter Otto calls Apollo and Artemis the most sublime of the Greek gods. Distinguished by their purity and holiness, the root meaning of the name Phoebus. In both deities there is something mysterious and unapproachable, something that commands an odd distance. As archers they shoot unerringly and unseen from afar. 7. The coldness of Apollo and Artemis is so intense it burns like fire. Apollo's amours are late fables. At his most characteristic, as on the temple pediment at Olympia, he stands alone. Fig. 8. Artemis is pre-Christian chastity. Overlooked by those who stereotyped paganism as sexual license. Her Supposed infatuation with Endymion belongs to the moon goddess, Selene, with whom she was falsely identified in the Hellenistic era. Moon worship is Near Eastern, not Greek. Like her twin, Artemis is a beam of blinding Apollonian daylight. The Greeks popularly connected Artemis' name, which has no apparent Greek root, with Artamos, slaughterer, butcher. Early, Artemis was Potnia Theron the dread mistress of the beasts, as the Iliad calls her. Archaic art shows her standing between heraldic animals, which she strangles with each hand. She rules them and she slays them. A remnant of proto-Artemis survived in the Ephesian. Artemis, whose temple in Asia Minor was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, Fig. 9. It was to the great port of Ephesus that street. Paul traveled with Mary who died there. The Madonna is a spiritual correction of Ephesian Artemis, symbol of animal nature. A copy of 
the idol was brought to Rome to stand in the Temple of Diana on the Aventine Hill. Its mummiform torso is covered with bull testicles or breasts in canine profusion. Ephesian Artemis is the swarming hive of Mother Nature, that heavy apple tree foaming with fruit which I found, in human terms, so repellent. 8. Apollo and the Combat of Centaurs and Lapis. Detail, from the west pediment of the Temple of Zeus at Olympia, 465-457 BC. 9. Ephesian Artemis, Imperial Roman Statue of Hellenistic Design. The descent of Artemis the Huntress from the Great Mother accounts for the puzzling fact that she, a virgin, rules over childbirth, and is invoked by women in labor. The Greek Artemis substitutes androgynous twinship for the Asian Artemis androgynous fecundity. Hellenistic art gradually merged the faces and genders of brother and sister. The Greek Artemis is a sexual persona, a projected personality. The narrowest of the major Olympians, she is a condensation of their Apollonian character. She is rigidly visible. Artemis mystique of virginity is very Western. Indeed, her sexual absolutism makes her one of the most Western of personae, for which there is no counterpart in other cultures. Chastity is visibility in Artemis. Her superb authority as a female persona comes from her resistance to nature's sexual flux. Her cleanliness of contour is the bold line of Pagan pictorialism. Artemis is the Amazon of Olympus. Amazon legends were pre Homeric. Theseus, it was said, drove off an Amazon invasion from Athens, with the Areopagus the site of victory and the women's encampment afterward called the Amazonium. The Battle of Greeks and Amazons was one of the great themes of Greek art, as on the Western Metope of the Parthenon. The Amazonomachia, or Amazon, Contest symbolized the struggle of civilization against barbarism. It was used as a metaphor for the Persian Wars, rarely otherwise documented in surviving monuments. Perhaps there was malicious humor in portraying the effete Persians as masculine women. The Amazons may have been beardless Asian males with braided hair who, from a distance, appeared to be women. The Amazon homeland was Scythia. The Black Sea region of southern Russia later linked with sexually ambiguous shamans until the 5th century BC, when they donned the short tunic of runner and huntress. Amazons appeared in Greek art in Scythian trousers, boots, and Phrygian cap. Controversy continues about whether the Amazons were historical or mythical. Bodies of women in armor have been unearthed in Germany and Russia, but there is still no evidence of autonomous female military units. The Greeks derived the name Amazon from Amazos, breastless. The Amazon was said to cut or pinch off her right breast to draw the bowstring. This etymology may have been invented to explain a word which was in fact a maza, without barley. Bread, cognate with matza, unleavened bread. The persistent motif of the amputated breast may be connected to breast amputation in rites of the great goddesses of Asia Minor. One theory about Ephesian Artemis was that she was strung with garlands of sacrificed breasts. Amazons were the legendary founders of both the city and temple of Ephesus. Many have wondered why Greek art never shows the Amazon with breast cut off. My answer is that deformity or mutilation of any kind was contrary to the idealizing classical imagination and the hyper-developed Greek sense of form. True or false, the tale illustrates the Greek view of the Amazon as an androgyne. Breast amputation, as in Lady Macbeth's desire to unsex herself, is equivalent to male. Castration, the Amazon's torso is half male, half female. The same idea appears in depictions of the Amazon with one breast bared. The Great Greek sculptors competitively tackled the theme Dying Amazon, where the warrior lifts one arm above her chest wound. Virgil's Amazon Camilla is slain by a javelin beneath the exposed breast. The Amazonian motif recurs in Delacroix's Liberty leading the people, where a flag-waving citizeness with one breast bare leaps the barricades. 
Amazonian exposure of the breast paradoxically desexualizes. Greek epithets illustrate the Amazon's ferocity. She is called Megathumos, dauntless, fearless, Nisimash, war lustful, Anandros, living without men, Stigonor, man hating, Androdamus, man subduing, Creobatos, flesh devouring, Androdactos, Androctonos, Dianera, man murdering. Amazons are at eternal war with men. Their defeat prefigured the absolute power of husband over wife in classical Athens, where women had no civil rights. Greek art never shows the Amazon as a hulking gorgon. She gained grace and dramatic dignity through the Code of Aret, the Greek quest for honor and fame. The Amazon was later vulgarized by sex. Ovid makes her a woman of fanatical sexual refusal laid low by man's phallic sword. Pope uses the idea in The Rape of the Lock, where spiteful Amazons make a drawing. Room charge on a pack of foppish bow. The Amazon's sole moment of real distinction after Greek art is in Renaissance epic, in the woman warriors of Boyardo, Ariosto, Tasso, and Spencer. But as we shall see, the English Renaissance too subdued the Amazon to social frames of reference. The Amazon is woman in groups, a myth of female bonding. Artemis is the Amazonian will in solitary self-communing. She is pure, Apollonian ego, glinting with the hostile separatism of Western personae. She is assertion and aggression, followed by withdrawal and purification through self-sequestration. Artemis needs an Apollonian imagination like Spencer's to do her justice. Like the Amazon, she sank into erotic formula and lost her severity and coldness. Judeo-Christianity has nothing like her except Joan of Arc. Our sense of ancient Artemis sculptures comes from the Diana of Versailles, a Roman copy. Striding forward, bow in hand, the goddess glances over her shoulder as she draws an arrow from her quiver. She wears the huntress short chitin and buskins, acquired in 5th century. Greece. Artemis stalks through western space, piercing and dominating it. Postclassical art feminizes and pacifies Artemis. Kenneth Clark can lament the decline in nobility of a god while overlooking the same thing in his twin. Depictions of Apollo lost their feeling of dread, turning him into the complacent bore of classicism. Eight dread is the proper response to beings of hieratic purity. Major Western painters have been inhospitable to the Artemis idea. In Diana and Actaeon, for example, Titian makes the goddess an awkward, rump-heavy matron. Rembrandt's Diana is homely and middle-aged, breasts and belly sagging. Rembrandt's Bologna gives the Roman war goddess a stunted body and porky face. French Renaissance art has many Dianas, inspired by Diane de Poitiers, mistress of Henry II. Because of their residual Gothicism, these works of the Fontainebleau school are persuasively slim, small-breasted, and emotionally cold, but they are unmistakable conflations of Diana and Venus. Goujon's Marble Diana, of Ainet and even Boucher's later The Bath of Diana retain Artemis. Clarity of outline, but they are both too chic for the fierce goddess of the woods. The true Artemis is remote and intimidating, offering nothing for fantasy. As an independent female impulse, she seems to have triggered a persistent negativity among male artists, who turn her swift and sudden action into fleshy passivity. Louis XIV ordered the muscles of the classical Venus of Arles planed down to conform to an acceptable canon of femininity. Sexual reduction is also apparent in St. Godin's colossal gold Diana, which stood upon the turret of the old Madison Square Garden, 1891, and now commands the grand staircase of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. The goddess has a magnificent heroic bow, but as she draws back the string, no muscular tension ripples through her arms or empty upper back. There is no passion for the chase or feeling of dread in this nubile nymph. The true Artemis is taught in body and mind. Artemis is overshadowed by Clark's vegetable Aphrodite, woman, 
as opulent organic form. Fruitfulness is the metaphor of times of famine, physical or spiritual. The first completely nude female in monumental sculpture appears at the dawn of the Hellenistic era. Praxiteles Aphrodite of Nidus, ca. 350 BC. Greek art had been full of vigorous male nudes for 200 years. The buxom Nidian Aphrodite marks a shift from the homosexuality of classic Athens. It starts a tradition of female posture, transmitted to Botticelli's Venus, through the Roman Venus Pudica, modestly stooping, knees pressed. Together, we saw this in the Venus of Willendorf, where procreative woman is bound down by her own abundance, hormonal ropes of flab. I spoke of the knock knees of the wide-hipped woman that inhibit running. Because of their narrow hips, men can move their legs efficiently, like pistons. The best women runners have lean male bodies. Big-breasted, wide-hipped women excel at few sports. The intimacy between fat and fertility is demonstrated by menstruation. Halting in woman athletes whose body fat falls below a certain biological level. Artemis is a cancellation of the vegetable Aphrodite. She rejects anatomy as destiny. Rover and Ravener, she is the woman. Runner who is always first. Nefertiti reverses Venus of Willendorf by displacing energy into the head. Artemis, living in and for the body, streamlines the female form by her implacable male will. She is one of the Greeks' greatest Apollonian ideas, pitiless and frigid. Artemis exists alone. Her Amazonism is directed toward women as well as men. As with Apollo, her sexual duality is in herself. Completion. No one before the Roman poet pornographers attributed aberrant tastes to her. Busha illustrates the lesbian salaciousness in an episode from Ovid, Zeus as Artemis, wooing Callisto. But Artemis and Athena are incapable of lesbianism, since their mythic identity is predicated on militant chastity. This chastity is a metaphor for power, freedom, and audacity. It descends from the great mother's renewable virginity, signifying independence from males. The post-classical era has personified chastity in softer, more ingratiating forms. Modest maidens, silent nuns, or blushing children, like Dickens' Little Dorrit, Judeo-Christian chastity as devout self sacrifice, but the Greeks saw chastity as an armed goddess of brazen ego. An Orphic hymn calls Artemis Arsinomorph, masculine in form or look. I will use this adjective for Catherine Hepburn in the Philadelphia story, which is structured around a Diana myth. Hepburn is the only true Artemis in Western art after Spencer's Belphoebe, the female warrior who swerves from all touch. Artemis is velocity and splendor. She is woman imperiously eluding the world and definitions of men. The sole male she honors as her brother, her double. Like Athena, she is resolution and action. But in Athena, action takes place. In and for society, she is the helpmeet. Artemis is solitude and action. Joined. She is selfish, but she pushes selfhood to the limits of Western possibility. She inhabits a purely physical realm. Spengler says, Apollo and Athene have no souls. Nine Artemis is pre-Christian purity. Without spirituality, like Nefertiti, she is a visionary materialist. She is Western personality as thing, matter cleansed of the Chthonian. As a woman, Artemis has a heroic glamour. She has nerve, fire, arrogance, force. She belongs to the warlike age of Ares, preceding Christian charity. She is blood lust, bloody mindedness. Worldwide, she is the female persona of maximum aggression, expressed in the hunt by pursuit, speed, defiance, risk. Her Apollonian arrow is the Western eye and the Western will. Like an athlete, she is for victory and glory. Artemis is uncomplex. She has no contradictions because she has no inner life. Her Amazonism is in her polished armored ego. She is incapable of relaxation or relenting. As a character type, she is an arrested adolescent. Her figure is boyish, her breasts undeveloped. She cannot be psychologically, much less physically, 
invaded. Artemis is unfeminine because uninfluenced by the environment, which she surmounts. She is pristine. She never learns. In her blankness and coldness, she is a perfect selfhood, a sublime energy. Seeking parallels, one thinks of Greta Garbo, with her reclusiveness and frosty emptiness, but not of Marlene Dietrich, who has the stunning physical brilliance of Artemis but also an irony, gained from a worldly experience of which Artemis can know nothing. Artemis the runner, connecting only through her arrows of domination, is woman darting away into western epic space. She puts into divine perpetual motion the burden of woman's Chthonian body. In the revival of pagan culture from the Renaissance on, Apollo was hailed as the supreme creation of classical mythology. As patron of poetry he appealed to artists, and as a beautiful young man, he appealed to homosexuals. Athena has received far less attention, but she dominates the Odyssey, and she was the patron of classical Athens which she surveyed from two colossal statues on the Acropolis. Amazon goddesses, a brilliant pagan idea, have won no popularity contests in Christian times. Athena, I would argue, is Apollo's equal. She has no parallels or descendants, though she is the most cinematic of the Greek gods. Film has never reproduced her. She is massive yet mobile, overwhelming by both mental and physical force. She is icon laden, a power lifter over determined by duty. Fig. 10. Gilbert Murray says Athena is an ideal, an ideal and a mystery. The ideal of wisdom, of incessant labor, of almost terrifying purity. Ten Otto says the modern, and particularly the northerner, must accustom himself to the lightning clarity of her form gradually. Her brightness breaks into our foggy atmosphere with almost terrifying harshness. 11 Athena is a beam of hard white light, a cold pagan sunburst. She has a dangerous luminosity. Tugged by the hair, Homer's Achilles recognizes her. Immediately, so terrible was the brilliance of her eyes. 12 The Apollonian Olympians are eye gods, living, warning, and ruling by the aggressive western eye. Athena has a complex sexual duality, beginning with her bizarre birth. Hesiod says Zeus, warned that his pregnant first wife Métis will bear a son stronger than his father, swallows her whole. Athena then springs from Zeus' brow, her exit facilitated in some accounts by the hammer blow of Hephaestus or Prometheus. Métis' role was probably invented to explain the older legend of Athena's birth from the head of Zeus. Perhaps androgynous Athena is a collapsing of Métis into her male fetus. Athena is born of aggression. She must fight her way out. The hammer blow is her power too, like a fist pounding a table. We speak of being struck by a thought or, in 60s slang, of having a flash of insight. Athena is Zeus ponderously thinking, treading by dread giant steps of primitive induction. Zeus too is hermaphrodite, he has the power of self-insemination and procreation or conception, which in English as in Latin has a double meaning of pregnancy and comprehension. Egyptian Capera, the masturbatory first mover, is shown coiled in an Euroboros-like circle, feet touching head, from which leaps a tiny human figure. So perhaps Zeus too is a primal masturbator, loving himself as he would next love his sister Hera. Amazon Athena is a brazen spume of divine self-love. Gregory Zilborg compares Athena's birth to the ritual cuvade, where a father, after delivery of a baby, jealously takes to bed and is attended, as if he were in labor, citing schizophrenic fantasies of a baby issuing from head or penis. Zilborg concludes that the myths of Athena's and Dionysus' birth come from woman envy, male envy of female powers, which he thinks earlier and psychogenetically older and therefore more fundamental than Freud's penis envy. Point one three ten Athena Parthenos, the Varvakian statuette, Roman marble copy, first century A.D. of ivory and gold colossus by Phidias in the Parthenon, C.A. 
447 to 439 BC. Athena's sexual duality is also expressed in her masculine armor. The Athenians incorrectly understood her title Pallas to mean brandisher of weapons, Apollo, I wield or brandish. In the Iliad she vanquishes the god of war by knocking him down with a boulder. Zeus loans her his own arms, including the huge heavy spear and panic-spreading aegis, which she wears like a shawl, a goatskin, ringed with serpents. The aegis is a vestige of Chthonian violence. It may represent a storm cloud split by snaky thunderbolts. I see the Aegis as Olympian but not yet Apollonian. That is, it descends from earliest sky cult, when heaven was primitive, a cult, opaque rather than rational and transparent, when it was purple-black rather than blue-white, the sacred animal of the Acropolis, the great serpent of Erechtheus, legendary king of Athens, coils behind Athena's shield. Sometimes she is shown casting a snake like a spear. The serpent may be her male alter ego, a phallic projection. It clings to her images as a remnant of her early character as a Minoan vegetation goddess. Becoming Apollonian, Artemis throws off all sign of her Chthonian origins. Athena, on the other hand, bristles with barbaric badges, notably the gorgon's head on breast and shield. Freud says this, symbol of horror, makes her a woman who is unapproachable and repels all sexual desires, since she displays the terrifying genitals of the mother. Fourteen serene virginity symbolized by Chthonian ugliness. Milton resolves this incongruity in defining Minerva's snaky-headed gorgon shield as the goddess rigid looks of chaste austerity. Commas 447-50 a rigid look is phallic ocular aggression. In Athena's elaborate iconography, so unlike the emblematic simplicity of the other Olympians, resides her uncanniness, her sex. Surpassing power, scholarship has shown relatively little interest in her transvestite armor. There is universal acceptance of Martin Nielsen's theory that Athena was a pre-Hellenic deity who became palace goddess of the Mycenaean warlords. Hence she donned her armor as defender of the citadel. But etiology does not explain persistence. The armed Athena lingered on more than 500 years after the end of Mycenaean culture. As Thucydides notes, the Athenians were the first people to go about without weapons. C.J. Harrington describes two different versions of Athena worshipped on the Acropolis. The goddess of the Erechtheum was a peaceful fertility goddess, shown seated and unarmed, Athena Parthenos, the virgin. Goddess of the Parthenon, virgin temple, was a standing or striding warrior in battle armor. These presumably correspond to her incarnations as Athena Ergain, patron of handicrafts and weaving, and Athena Promachos, champion of the fighting line. She appeared as the latter in Phidias's two colossi, the ivory and gold statue inside the Parthenon and its outdoor companion, whose glinting helmet could be seen by ships at sea as far as Cape Sunium. Thus, far from the Mycenaeans permanently fixing Athena in their own martial image, her Mino and prototype remained available for metaphorical development until the High Classic period. We must explain why the armed Athena prevailed in Athens, for whom she meant far more than military might. As Harrington remarks, when we reach the age of Pericles and Phidias it will be she who is chosen to express the highest beliefs of that age. 15 Athens' mirror image was a solar androgyne, perfect in body, mind, and eye. Athena's sexual hybridism is already evident in Homer, who makes her descents a sexual masquerade. In the Iliad, Athena appears on earth four times as a male, once as a vulture, and six times in her own form. In the Odyssey, she appears eight times as a male, twice as a human girl, six times as herself. She is sometimes aged mentor or phoenix, sometimes a beautiful shepherd or sturdy spearman in arms. One of Homer's most magical motifs is this busy flying about of Athena energy. Only 
once does another deity take cross sexual form, when Iris appears to Priam as his son Polites. Hera never appears as a man, since she lacks the masculine component that would enable her to do so. Virgil adopts the transsexual motif somewhat mechanically. Juturna, Turna's sister, appears once as a warrior and twice as a charioteer. But this is because the Aeneid has absorbed and lavishly reimagined. Homer's Amazon theme in the glamorous and willful tragic heroines, Dido and Camilla. What does Athena's androgyny mean? Jane Harrison says, patriarchy turned, the local core of Athens, into, a sexless thing. Neither man nor woman, to the end she remains manufactured, unreal, and never convinces us. We cannot love a goddess who on principle forgets the earth from which she sprang. 16 Harrison acknowledges Athena's androgyny but finds it distasteful. The indignation in her long indictment comes from her mistaken belief in a Mediterranean matriarchy, overthrown by men. Athena is therefore a collaborator with the oppressor. She is sexually inauthentic because of her abandonment of the Chthonian, the analysis of which is the permanent distinction of Harrison's wonderful body of work. Harrison has influenced me heavily but my theory of the Chthonian is darker and less trusting. I see too much Wordsworth in her 19th century view of nature. I follow Sade and Coleridge. My refutation of Harrison's view begins with her assertion, the strange denaturalized birth of Athene from the brain of Zeus as a dark, desperate effort to make thought the basis of being in reality. 17 But Athena never did represent pure thought. Métis, the name of her supposed mother means counsel, wisdom, skill, cunning, craft. Even Sophia is first, cleverness, skill, cunning, shrewdness, and only secondly, scientific knowledge, wisdom, philosophy. Athena is techni, art, skill, rather than noose, mind. Thus her patronage of the crafts. Her special favorites are men of action, especially Odysseus, Homer's man of many wiles. The virtues she gives are listed by a suitor praising Penelope, the matchless gifts that she owes to Athene, her skill in fine handicraft, her excellent brain, and that genius she has for getting her way. 18. Both Odysseus and Penelope are tricksters and master strategists. Life, for him, is a performance art. He brings down Troy by a ruse, where brute force has failed. He can make a boat from scratch or carve a bed from a living tree. He escapes Cyclops' cave by improvising a cruel log tool and mimicking the Trojan horse by riding out under a ram. Homeric mind as ingenuity, practical intelligence. There is no rodden like deep thinking, no mathematical or philosophical speculation. That comes much later in history. Odysseus thinks with his hands. He is athlete, gambler, engineer. Athena rules. Technological man. The Greek heir to Egyptian constructionism. Here, I propose, is the answer to Athena's androgyny. She appears, in more disguises and crosses sexual borderlines more often than any other Greek god because she symbolizes the resourceful, adaptive mind. The ability to invent, plan, conspire, cope, and survive. The Mind as techni, pragmatic design, was hermaphroditic for the ancients, much as the psyche is hermaphroditic for Jung in an era. When selfhood expands to include the unconscious, Athena personifies only the waking ego, daylight energies, pre-modern, psychology externalized demonic powers that we locate in the soul. Thus the gorgon is on Athena's breast but not in her heart. Athena as the transsexual contriving mind exploits situation and opportunity, subduing circumstance to will and desire. Here for the first time we see the androgyne as a cultural symbol of mind. The Renaissance recasts the androgyne in alchemical terms to represent intuition and the spiritualization of matter. Romanticism uses the androgyne to symbolize imagination, the creative process, and poetry itself. All male Aries is the battle frenzy, a rabid half-animal state. But, androgynous Athena mentalizes war. Among her inventions are the 
war harness, the trumpet, and the Pyrrhic dance in armor. She is goddess of battle music and the battle shout. In a futurist manifesto, Marinetti speaks of an aesthetics of war. Athena turns war into an art form. Calculated resolute action is the historical crisscrossing of Western space. Harrison's association of Athena with pure thought belongs to the Hellenistic era, when the goddess increasingly personified sober, solitary wisdom. As presiding deity of the Odyssey, Athena is a projected displacement of the mercurial consciousness of K.G. Odysseus, the dexterous escape artist. The connection between Athena's adventurous transsexualism and the machinations of the subtle mind is demonstrated in a scene where she changes sex before our eyes. Waking on the foggy shore of Ithaca, the goal toward which he has struggled for ten years, Odysseus sees a young shepherd with a javelin, Athena in disguise. Odysseus spins a long spurious saga of woe. The bright eyed goddess smiled at Odysseus' tail and caressed him with her hand. Her appearance altered, and now she looked like a woman, tall, beautiful, and accomplished. And so, my stubborn friend, Odysseus the arch deceiver, with his craving for intrigue, does not propose even in his own country to drop his sharp practice and the lying tales that he loves from the bottom of his heart. But no more of this, we are both adepts in chicane, for in the world of men you have no rival as a statesman and orator, while I am preeminent among the gods for invention and resource. 19. Thus Homer's first scene after the hero achieves his nostos or homecoming takes ritualistic form. One of Odysseus' shrewd stratagems is enclosed within, like a set of heraldic parentheses. Athena male and Athena female. The dreamlike sex transformation is a masculine reenactment of the central false speech. Smiling with pleasure, Athena says in effect, what a marvelous liar you are. Lies are legal Bronze Age piracy. Here as at the Phaeacian banquet, Odysseus the storyteller stands proxy for Homer the bard. Homeric. Cinema. The sex change episode theatrically synchronizes word and image. The link between Athena's technical skills and Odysseus' lies is perfectly conveyed in our word, fabrication. Sexually mobile Athena, literally is the shifting, shifty powers of human intelligence. Sexual. Personae are the jumpy primal nerve chemistry of impulse and choice. To Harrison's complaint, then, that Athena has forgotten the earth from which she sprang, I reply that Athena is divorced from earth because she represents the man made as patron of the crafts and cultivated olive. She gives man control over capricious nature. For Harrison, Athena's virginity is sterile because unfertile in the Chthonian sense. But virginity is perfect autonomy. Jackson Knight says, the maidenhood of city goddesses seems to have been in some magical sympathy with the unbroken defense of a city. 20 Athena as patron of Athens is the wall that shuts the enemy out, the enemy. Nature as well as the enemy man. Her virginity is her stable. Apollonian self. The intractable will behind her hermaphrodite. Changes. She is fortitude and pressing forward, a job to do. She is the fanatical purposiveness of the West, limited but all achieving. Aphrodite and Hermes illustrate the gradual purgation of Chthonian elements from the Olympians. Neither became completely Apollonian, as I define it, but they provide models for two of my sexual personae. Aphrodite, a Near Eastern fertility goddess, was one of the last additions to the Olympian pantheon. She began as potent all-mother, and ended up in late antiquity as a sentimental literary convention, patron of love and beauty. In some places, her cult retained traces of her original bisexual character. Hesiod is the source of the story of her birth from sea foam splashed up by the fall of Uranus's mutilated genitals. Though this savage tale may be another fanciful etymology, Aphras, foam, froth, it suggests something sexually problematic in the goddess, for newborn Aphrodite is a transubstantiation of Uranus's virility. 
Athena bursts from a divine brain, Aphrodite from divine balls. The goddesses of mutant birth are to be victors over males in separate realms. On her native Cyprus, Aphrodite was worshipped as the Venus. Barbata, the bearded Venus. Her image wore female clothing but had a beard and male genitals. Ritual sacrifices were conducted by men and women in transvestite dress. Elsewhere, as the Venus Calva or Bald Venus, Aphrodite was shown with a man's bald head, like priests of Isis. Aristophanes calls her Aphroditus, a Cypriot male name. Aphrodite appeared in battle armor in Sparta, which may have borrowed the custom from Cythera. The Venus Armada or armed. Venus became a Renaissance convention, partly because of the appearance of Virgil's Venus as Diana. I adopt the names Venus, Barbata and Venus Calva, the bearded and bald Venus, for certain. Highly aggressive, corrosively verbal movie stars like Betty Davis and Elizabeth Taylor. Early Hermes was indistinguishable from the piles of stones and phallic monuments called Herms that marked Greek boundary lines. When he attains human shape, it is as a mature bearded man. Psychopompos, escorter of souls to the underworld. The two centuries, from archaic to Hellenistic art change him into a beautiful beardless youth, like Apollo. Masculine agrarian vigor becomes androgynous. Urbanity, late Hermes influences Roman Mercury, to whom Virgil gives blonde hair and graceful young limbs, an IV.559. The development from Hermes to Mercury is from crude earth-centered, monolith to earth-defying air swimmer from the Chthonian to the Apollonian. Late Hermes appears in Giambologna's sleek bronze of Mercury in flight, a logo of American florists. Our idea of the mercurial comes from the swiftness of wing-footed. Mercury. Hermes is patron of magic and theft. His epithets are crafty, deceiving, ingenious. Otto speaks of his nimbleness and subtle cunning, his wonderful deftness and mischievousness. 21. In real life, I observe, a volatile mingling of masculine and feminine accompanies this constellation of irrepressible, unscrupulous traits. Free movement among mood states automatically opens one to multiple sexual personae, though he has Hermes cunning, Odysseus. Persona is ruggedly masculine, like early Hermes. The sexual duality latent in Odysseus' strategic personae resides in his androgynous patron, Athena, Mercurius, Latin for the god, planet, and Quicksilver, is the allegorical hermaphrodite of medieval alchemy. I adopt the name Mercurius for a crazed, witty, restless, elusive, sexually ambiguous creature. Examples are Shakespeare's Rosalind and Ariel, Goethe's Mignon, Tolstoy's Natasha, and Patrick Dennis Ante. Main. Hermes carries either a magic herald staff or the caduceus, a winged rod wrapped by two serpents, a symbol of healing. The caduceus may have a bisexual meaning, like the Egyptian Uraeus, Cretan Labris or Double Axe, and our Thanksgiving Cornucopia, which is both a phallic bull's horn and an overflowing, abundant womb. The circular Euroboros is similarly bisexual. Newman calls it, the serpent, which at once bears, begets, and devours. An alchemic text, cited by Jung, says, the dragon slays itself, weds itself, impregnates itself. 22. Bisexuality, in symbol or persona, recreates the plenum of primitive. Cosmogony, Dionysus, Apollo's antagonist and rival, is not among Homer's Olympians, though he is the son of Zeus. The Apollonian, Olympians, I said, are eye gods. Dionysus represents obliteration of the Western eye, heir to the great mother of Chthonian nature. He is, with Osiris, the greatest of the dying gods of mystery religion. Out of his worship came two rituals of enormous impact on Western culture tragic drama and Christian liturgy. Dionysus' androgyny, like Athena's, begins in a sexually irregular birth. When his pregnant mother, Semele, demands her lover prove he is Zeus, she is burnt to a crisp. Zeus plucks his son from her womb. 
makes a slit in his own thigh, and sews up the fetus till it comes to term. In the Bacchae, Euripides imagines Zeus summoning Dionysus to enter this my male womb, 526-27. Zeus's artificial womb resembles Adonis' tusk-torn thigh, a symbol for the castration of the mother cults. Zeus's Dionysian pregnancy makes the symbolic equation of child with penis that Freud finds in the maternal psyche. The analogy is supported by a Greek pun on the words for grapevine and scrotum, she and she, honored at the Athenian Oscophoria, harvest festival of Dionysus the wine god. The Greeks inaccurately read Dionysus' double birth in his epithet, Dithyrambos, the name also of his ritual song, D plus Thura equals double door. The god is born through two doors, one female, one male. Jane. Harrison says of puberty rites of passage, with the savage, to be twice born as the rule, not the exception. And elsewhere, the birth from the male womb is to rid the child from the infection of its mother, to turn him from a woman thing into a man thing. 23 At the opening of the Odyssey, Telemachus, inspired by male-born Athena, searches for his father by turning against his mother. Jesus, too, publicly spurns his mother to be about his father's business. Male adulthood begins with the breaking of female chains. But Dionysus reverses loyalties. He remains the son of his mother, wearing her clothes and loitering with bands of women. Fig. 11. Dionysus' transvestism is more complete than Athena's. She adds male armor to a female tunic, but he retains nothing male except a beard. Archaic vases show him in a woman's tunic, saffron veil, and hairnet. His name Basarius comes from the Thracian Basara, a woman's fox skin mantle. He is called Pseudonor, the fake man. Ritual transvestism was fairly common in Greek cult. The procession of the Oscophoria was led by two boys dressed as girls. Performers of Dionysus' ritual dance, the Ithophalos, appeared in the costume of the opposite sex. In the Hybristica and Hysteria, Aphrodite's festival. At Argos, men wore women's veils and women wore male dress. In the festival of Hera on Samos, men wore women's robes and adorned themselves with bracelets, necklaces, and golden hairnets. On wedding nights at Cuz, the bridegroom wore women's robes. At Sparta, the bride, head shaved, wore men's garments and boots. At Argos, the bride donned a false beard. 11. Dionysus and Maenads. Attic red figured amphora by the Cleophrades painter, ca. 500 BC. Several Greek hero sagas have transvestite interludes. Supermasculine Hercules is enslaved by the Amazon Omphale, who makes him wear women's clothing and spin wool. The tale was reenacted in the Hercules cult at Cuz, where his priest wore female dress. Arriving in Athens, Young Theseus was mistaken for a girl and mocked by a crowd of laborers. Nothing changes in the construction. Trade. The hero responded by hurling a chariot over a rooftop. Achilles, the supreme Greek warrior, began his career in drag. The story of his exposure by Odysseus, who found him among the women. On Syros, may recall tribal initiations where a band of men invades the women's quarters to kidnap a boy into adult life. Polygnotus painted the transvestite Achilles in the Propylaea of the Acropolis, and Euripides devoted a lost play to the subject, the Scyrians. Ritual transvestism, then and now, is a drama of female dominance. There are religious meanings to all female impersonation. In nightclub or bedroom, a woman putting on men's clothes merely steals social power. But a man putting on women's clothes is searching for God. He memorializes his mother, whom he watched at the boudoir ritual of her mirror. Mothers and fathers are not in the same cosmic league. Fatherhood is short, motherhood long, for Earth is a mother of ever changing costume, green to brown and back. The Bible condemns transvestism as bag and baggage of the Asiatic mother cults. 
yet the pagan tradition survives in Rio de Janeiro at Carnival, in New Orleans at Mardi Gras, in Philadelphia on New Year's Day, and everywhere on Halloween. Halloween masquerade is apotropaic, mimicking the dead on their night of nights in order to drive off their ghosts. Ancient transvestism could be similarly propitiatory. What is sexually grotesque or criminal in our culture may have symbolic significance elsewhere. Fraser says of a tribal custom in North New Guinea, where the genitals of a murdered man were eaten by an old woman and the genitals of a murdered woman eaten by an old man. Perhaps the intention is to unsex and disarm the dangerous ghost. 24 In primitive life, sex is religion and vice. Versa. Christianity has never shut down the ritual theater of sex. Dionysus transvestism, then, symbolizes his radical identification with mothers. I connect this to his association with water, milk, blood, sap, honey, and wine. The Roman and Renaissance Bacchus is no more than a wine god, but Greek Dionysus rules what Plutarch calls the hygra physis, wet or liquid nature. Dionysus is, as Farnell puts it, the liquid principle in things. 25 Dionysian liquidity is the invisible sea of organic life flooding our cells and uniting us to plants and animals. Our bodies are Ferenczi's primeval ocean, surging and rippling. I interpret Plutarch's hygrophysis as not free-flowing but contained water, fluids which ooze, drip, or hang in tissues or fleshy sacs. The hygrophysis is the mature female body, which I declare a prison of gender. Female experience is submerged in the world of fluids dramatically demonstrated in menstruation, childbirth, and lactation. Edema, water retention, that female curse, is Dionysus. Lead in embrace. Male tumescence is an assertion of the separateness of objects. An erection is architectural, sky-pointing. Female tumescence, through blood or water, is slow, gravitational, amorphous. In the war for human identity, male tumescence is an instrument. Female tumescence and obstruction. The fatty female body is a sponge. At peak menstrual and natal moments, it is locked passively in place, suffering wave after wave of Dionysian power. There are male initiates into female experience. The white circus, clown, for example, is an androgyne of female fatness. In silhouette, he is pregnant, stumbling, tumbling, buffeted. He is a tumescence which cannot act but is only acted upon. The morbidly obese man, my next example, loses virility because he is paralyzed by passive engorgement. The fat man as hollow female vessel appears in Prince Hal's satire of Falstaff as that trunk of humors, that swollen parcel of dropsies, that huge bombard of sack, that stuffed cloak bag of guts. I hen I V2. IV.454-57. In Emblems, 1635, Francis Quarles expands these images to nature, rebuking the fat man, thy skin's a bladder, blown with watery tumors, thy flesh a trembling bog, a quagmire, full of humors, I.XC.4. Bog and quagmire are my Chthonian swamp, that dank primal brew of earth and water that I identify with. The female body, fatness as fluidity, the Dionysian master principle. Carl Stern diagnoses as a caricature of femininity, the self thwarting of neurotic men, whose attitude toward life was one of hoarding and retentiveness, with a tendency to unproductive accumulation, a kind of unending pregnancy of material inflation which never came to creativeness or birth. He calls this syndrome accumulation without. Issue. 26. It is a diseased male pregnancy, a stagnant fatness of mind. Rather than body, it may be an occupational hazard of academe, typified by the disappointed mythographer Casobon of George. Eliot's Middlemarch. Dionysus female Chthonian swamp is inhabited by silent, swarming invertebrates. I propose that the taboo attached to women is justified and that the infamous uncleanness of menstruation is 
due not to blood but to uterine jellies in that blood. The primal swamp is choked with menstrual albumin, the lukewarm matrix of nature, teeming with algae and bacteria. We have a food that symbolizes this swamp. Raw clams on the half shell. Twenty years ago, I noticed the strong emotions roused by this delicacy, to which few are indifferent. Common reactions range from ecstasy to revulsion. Why? The clam is a microcosm of the female hygra physis. It is as aesthetically and psychologically disturbing as menstrual albumin. The primitive shapelessness of raw clams offers sensuous access to some archaic swamp experience. Botticelli's Venus coasts to shore on the half shell. Sexual love is a deep sea diving into the timeless and elemental. G. Wilson Knight says, Life rose from the sea. Our bodies are three parts water and our minds compacted of salty lusts. 27 Woman's body reeks of the sea. Ferency says, The genital secretion of the female among the higher mammals and in man possesses a distinctly fishy odor, odor of herring brine. According to the description of all physiologists, this odor of the vagina comes from the same substance, trimethylamine, as the decomposition of fish gives rise to 28 raw clams, I am convinced, have a latently cunnilingual wool character that many find repugnant. Eating a clam, fresh killed, barely dead, is a barbarous, amorous plunging into Mother Nature's cold salt sea. Scatology and graffiti in their perennial folk wisdom, rudely, acknowledge woman's marine character. Slang calls female genitals, the bearded clam. Body t-shirts and bumper stickers link fish. Consumption with virility. Ivy League students recently traded the following reposts, scratched in different hands on the wall of a library study stall. Women smell like fish. Men smell like shit. Do women like to smell fish? Do fish smell like women? Do fish like to smell women? Dionysus, god of fluids, rules a murky no man's land of matter. Half turned to liquid. Newman notes the linguistic connection in German between mutter, mother, motor, bog, moor, fen, marsh, marsh, and mere, ocean. Point two nine A Chthonian miasma hangs over woman like the polluted cloud raining pestilence on Oedipus Thebes. The miasma is woman's procreative fate, linking her to the primeval. Artemis is woman on the run, breaking out of her cloud into Apollonian sunlight. Artemis' radiance is a militant self-hardening, a refusal of monarchy. Dionysus, endorsing woman, also keeps her in the Chthonian swamp. Sartre speaks of the mucoid or slimy, la visco a substance in between two states, a moist and feminine. Sucking, a liquid seen in a nightmare, 30 Sartre's slime is Dionysus. Swamp, the fleshy muck of the generative matrix. There is no vision, because there are no eyes. Apollo's solar torch is put out. The heart of creation is blind. In nature's female womb world, there are no objects, and no art. Dionysus is the all-embracing totality of mother cult. Nothing disgusts him, since he contains everything that is disgust as an Apollonian response, an aesthetic judgment. Disgust always indicates some misalignment toward or swerving away from the maternal. Heisman speaks of the humid horror of woman's unclean body. Point three one. I will argue that 19th century aestheticism, a vision of a Glittering crystalline world is a flight from the Chthonian swamp into which nature loving Wordsworth inadvertently led Romanticism. Aestheticism insists on the Apollonian line, separating objects from each other and from nature. Disgust as Apollonian fear at a melting borderline. Ernest Jones says Hamlet's denunciation of his mother shows that almost physical disgust, which is so characteristic a manifestation of intensely Repressed, sexual feeling. 32 Yes, Hamlet. Struggles against the lure of Oedipal incest. But we all commit incest. With the nature mother, Hamlet rails against the reachy kisses of the bloat king. 3. IV.183-85. A bloated male is ma pregnant. P. 
paralyzed clown, or it is a ripe corpse in a garden, the thrifty baked meat of the royal wedding table. Hamlet, as all sons of all mothers, is bloated with this too too solid flesh. His first soliloquy is a strange chain of associations with a hidden Chthonian logic. It moves from suicidal self disgust to thoughts of the world as an unweeded garden overgrown by things rank and gross in nature, and ends in lurid visualization of his mother's sex life amid rumpled, incestuous sheets, sweaty soiled rags, both swaddlings and shroud, mother. Nature's bindings of birth and death, I. E.129-59. The play is filled with bad smells, the stench is from an unavenged corpse but also from the female prima materia the humid base of organic life, which Hamlet resists in decadent revulsion. Another female closet, another swamp of sex and filth, Jonathan Swift's odd poem, The Lady's Dressing Room. Another male as lover, hater, voyeur, forcing his way into the squalid womb world from which we came. It is slippery with refuse, poison, and magic. Ointments. Swift rejects his protagonist's disgust, should I the queen of love refuse, because she rose from stinking ooze? Venus skims into town on a sewer. Swift confirms my identification of shellfish and swamp. The hardy poet will eat the clam, while his protagonist gags with Sartre's nausea. Swift's boudoir mire may come from Milton's Comus, where a virgin is stuck to her enchanted chair, smeared with gums of glutinous heat. These are piney Dionysian resins, fishy female jellies, the dead weight of medusan paralysis. Sex locks us in place. The virgin is released from the mucoid swamp by a water nymph from under, the glassy cool, translucent wave, an Apollonian realm of purity, clarity, and vision. Milton's chastity is clad in complete steel, a quivered nymph with arrows keen, like Spencer's Amazon's point three three chastity is always a triumph of Apollo over Dionysus. It is the sanctity of the object reclaimed from the dank, clingy liquidity of Chthonian nature. Scylla or Charybdis, woman's lubricious lubrications are the easy road to Lear's hell, where both sexes are lost. The Dionysian was trivialized by 60s polemicists, who turned it into play and protest, pot on the picket line. Sex in the romper room. Benign regression. But the great god Dionysus is the barbarism and brutality of Mother Nature, comparing the Orphic to Olympian strains. In Greek religion, Gilbert Murray says, These things are gods or forms of God. Not fabulous immortal men, but things which are things utterly non human and non moral, which bring man bliss or tear his life to shreds without a break in their own serenity. 34. Dionysus liberates by destroying. He is not pleasure but pleasure. Pain. The tormenting bondage of our life in the body. For each gift he exacts a price. Dionysian orgy ended in mutilation and dismemberment. The maenad's frenzy was bathed in blood. True. Dionysian dance is a rupturing extremity of torsion. The harsh. Percussive accents of Stravinsky, Martha Graham, and rock music are cosmic concussions upon the human, volleys of pure force. Dionysian. Nature is cataclysmic. Our bodies are pagan temples, heathen. Holdouts against Judeo Christian soul or mind. A modern, overumbiber, kneeling, moaning, and compulsively vomiting, is said to be worshipping at the porcelain god. When the body's Chthonian, Spasms take over, we are invaded by Dionysus. The uterine. Contractions of menstruation and childbirth are Dionysus' fist. Clenching in our bowels. Birth as expulsion. A rocky cascade of spasms. Kicking us out in a river of blood. We are skin drums which nature. Beats. Invitation to Dionysian dance is a binding contract of. Enslavement to nature. The violent principle of Dionysian cult is sparigmos, which in. Greek means, a rending, tearing, mangling, and secondly, a convulsion, spasm, the body of the god, or a human or animal. Substitute, 
is torn to pieces, which are eaten or scattered like seed. Omophagy, ritual eating of raw flesh, is the assimilation and internalization of Godhead. Ancient mystery religion was posited on the worshippers' imitation of the god. Cannibalism was impersonation, a primitive theater. You are what you eat. The body, parts of dismembered Osiris, scattered across the earth, were collected by Isis, who founded a shrine at each site. Before his arrest, Jesus tears the Passover bread for his disciples. Take, eat, this is my body. Mount 26 to 26. At every Christian service, wafers and wine are changed into Christ's body and blood, consumed by the worshiper. In Catholicism, this is not symbolic but literal. Transubstantiation is cannibalism. Dionysian sparigmos was an ecstasy of sexual excitation and superhuman strength. Try disjoining a grocery chicken with your bare hands, much less a living goat or heifer. The scattering of sparigmos inseminated the earth, hence swallowing the god's parts, was an act of physical love. There may be an element of homophagy in all oral sex, a mystic ritual, reverent and sadistic. Nature lives by sparigmos, no literary abstraction. She is forever tearing apart in order to remake. A witness of a recent air crash, where 131 died when a wind shear slapped the plane to the ground, told reporters, it was like arms and legs separated and burning. Accidents and disasters are a religious spectacle. The sensationalizing media give us the grotesque truth about reality. Meditating on Apollo and Dionysus, Plutarch says dismemberment is a metaphor for Dionysus' metamorphosis into winds and water, earth and stars, and into the generations of plants and animals. 35. Dionysus, like Proteus, shifts through all forms of being, high to low. Human, animal, plant, mineral, none has special status. All are equalized and sacralized in the continuum of natural energy. Dionysus, leveling the great chain of being, respects no hierarchy. Plutarch says, riddles and fabulous tales about Dionysus construct destructions and disappearances, followed by returns to life and regenerations. Mystery religions offered initiates eternal life. Promise of resurrection was and is a major reason for Christianity's spread. Olympian cult had no such lure. The visible separatism of the sharp-edged Apollonian gods applied also to their relations with worshippers. Jane Harrison says of the birth of tragedy in Dionysian ritual, Athene and Zeus and Poseidon have no drama because no one, in his wildest moments, believed he could become and be Athene, or Zeus or Poseidon. 36 Mystery Religions Impersonation and Theatricality Linger in Christian Liturgy, where celebrant and laity replay the Last Supper and blood sacrifice of the crucifixion. The imitation of Christ suffuses prayer and ritual, as in the 14. Stations of the cross or the stigmata, Christ's bleeding wounds, miraculously appearing on hands and feet of the devout. Our word, enthusiasm comes from Dionysian enthusiasmos, a wild state of holy inspiration. The devotee was entheos, full of the God. Man and God were fused. Fraser says, every dead Egyptian was identified with Osiris and bore his name. 37 Mystery Religion as a Communion, a Union of Human and Divine, Surging Through the World with All Conquering Force. Mystery Religion as a Vibration, a Tremor or Tembler, Reducing the Visible to the Tangible, a Brute Laying on of Hands. The Apollonian and Dionysian, two great Western principles, govern sexual personae in life and art. My theory is this Dionysus is identification. Apollo objectification. Dionysus is the empathic, the sympathetic emotion transporting us into other people, other places, other times. Apollo is the hard, cold separatism of Western personality and categorical thought. Dionysus is energy, ecstasy, hysteria, promiscuity, emotionalism, heedless indiscriminateness of idea or practice. Apollo is obsessiveness, 
voyeurism, idolatry, fascism, frigidity and aggression of the eye, petrifaction of objects, human, imagination rolls through the world seeking cathexis, here, there, everywhere, it invests itself in perishable things of flesh, silk, marble, and metal, materializations of desire, words themselves the West, makes into objects, complete harmony as impossible, our brains are, split, and brain is split from body, the quarrel between Apollo and Dionysus is the quarrel between the higher cortex and the older, limbic and reptilian brains. Art reflects on and resolves the eternal, human dilemma of order versus energy. In the West, Apollo and Dionysus strive for victory. Apollo makes the boundary lines that are civilization but that lead to convention, constraint, oppression. Dionysus is energy unbound, mad, callous, destructive, wasteful. Apollo is law, history, tradition, the dignity and safety of custom in form. Dionysus is the new, exhilarating but rude, sweeping all away to begin again. Apollo is a tyrant, Dionysus a vandal. Every excess breeds its counter-reaction. So Western culture swings from point to point on its complex cycle, pouring forth its lavish tributes of art word, and deed. We have littered the world with grandiose achievements. Our story is vast, lurid, and unending. Now to translate these principles into psychology and politics. Plutarch calls Apollo the one, denying the many and abjuring. Multiplicity. 38 The Apollonian is aristocratic, monarchist, and reactionary, volatile, mobile Dionysus as H.O.I. Poloi, the many. He is rabble and rubble, both democratic mob rule and the slurry of uncountable objects rumbling through nature. Harrison says, Apollo, is the principle of simplicity, unity and purity, Dionysus of manifold. Change and metamorphosis. 39 Greek artists, says Plutarch, a tribute to Apollo, uniformity, orderliness, and unadulterated seriousness, but to Dionysus, variability, playfulness, wantonness, and frenzy. Dionysus is a masker and improviser. He is demonic energy and plural identity. Dodd states, he is Lusios, the liberator, the god, who by very simple means, or by other means not so simple, enables you for a short time to stop being yourself, and thereby set you free. The aim of his cult was ecstasy, which could mean anything from taking you out of yourself to a profound alteration of personality. 40. Ecstasy. Standing outside of, is trance-like self-removal, schizoid or shamanistic. Dionysus' amorality cuts both ways. He is god of theater, masked balls, and free love, but also of anarchy, gang rape, and mass murder. Playfulness and criminality are first cousins, flouting the norm. Frosty Apollo has a sculptural coherence and clarity. The Apollonian, one, strict, rigid, and contained, is Western personality. As work of art, haughty and elegant, Dionysian sparigmos and Dionysian liquidity are analogous. Sparigmos denies the identity of objects. It is nature grinding down and dissolving matter to energy. Ernst Cassirer speaks of the instability, and, law of metamorphosis, of the mythical world, which is, at a much more fluid and fluctuating stage than our theoretical world of things and properties. 41 Dionysian fluidity as the plenum of the dank female swamp. Dionysian metamorphoses are the scintillations of nature's high-energy perpetual motion machine. Sparigmos and metamorphosis, sex and violence flood our dream life where objects and persons flicker and merge. Dreams are Dionysian. Magic in the sensory inflammation of sleep. Sleep is a cavern to which we nightly descend, our bed a musty burrow of primeval hibernation. There we go into trance, drooling and twitching. Dionysus is our body's automatic reflexes and involuntary functions. The serpentine peristalsis of the archaic. Apollo freezes. Dionysus. Dissolves. Apollo says, stop. Dionysus says, move. Apollo binds.
together and battens down against the storm of nature. G. Wilson Knight remarks, the Apollonian is the created ideal. Forms of visionary beauty that can be seen, sight rather than sound. Intellectually clear to us. 42 We contemplate the Apollonian from an aesthetic distance. In Dionysian identification, space is collapsed. The I cannot maintain point of view. Dionysus can't see the forest for the trees. The wet dream of Dionysian liquidity takes the hard edges off. Things, objects, and ideas are fuzzy, misty. That mistiness, Johnny. Mathis sings of in love. Dionysian empathy as Dionysian dissolution. Sparigmos as sharing, breaking bread or body together. Dionysian. Identification as fellow feeling, extended or enlarged identity. It. Passed into Christianity, which tried to separate Dionysian love from. Dionysian nature. But as I said, there is no agape or caritas without. Eros. The continuum of empathy and emotion leads to sex. Failure to. Realize that was the Christian error. The continuum of sex leads to sadomasochism, failure to realize that was the error of the Dionysian. 60s. Dionysus expands identity but crushes individuals. There is no liberal dignity of the person in the Dionysian. The god gives latitude, but no civil rights. In nature we are convicted without appeal. 4. Pagan beauty. The competing Apollonian and Dionysian elements in Greek culture remained unresolved. Egypt alone was able to synthesize sunlit clarity of form with demonic earth cult. It honored both the eye and the labyrinth of biology. Egyptian state religion, with its mystic obscurantism yet soaring clear geometries, unified the classes in one system of belief. In Greece there may have been a split, with aristocrats following Olympian sky cult, while farmers, nominally Olympian, cautiously continued to honor primeval spirits of the soil. Fifth century Athenian culture was supremely Apollonian. Indeed, classic style is always a defeat of Dionysus by Apollo. It is form rescued from Mother Earth's oceanic dissolutions. High classic moments, as at the Renaissance, are short. The artist speaks for his nation and is buoyed by a rush of collective confidence. This was the Shakespeare of the Elizabethan 1590s or the Michelangelo of the David and creation of man. But politics spiral out of control. David turns into Goliath. The idealist on the throne is followed by the cynic. Out of the morass of Byzantine court politics came the Jacobean Shakespeare of Hamlet and the problem plays in the mannerist Michelangelo of the stormy Last Judgment and Medici. Chapel nudes. High classic art is simple, serene, balanced. Late phase. Art is accomplished but anxious. Composition is crowded or overwrought. Color is lurid. The Hellenistic Laocoon shows the theatrical perversity of late style. Heroic male athleticism strained and bursting, strangled by serpents. Beautiful and grotesque can join. Late phase art defiles high classic form with Mother Nature's sex and Violence. Dionysus, bound down by Apollo, always escapes and returns with a vengeance. The movement from Dionysus to Apollo and back is illustrated in two landmarks of Greek drama, Aeschylus Orestia, 458 BC, and Euripides Bacchae, 407 BC, which stand at either end of classical Athens. From Aeschylus' generation, exhilarated by its defeat of the Persian invaders, came the formal perfection of classic art and architecture, the beauty and freedom of male sculpture, the grand, yet humanistic proportions of the Parthenon. The Orestia proclaims Apollo's triumph over Chthonian nature. Fifty years later, after Athens' decline and fall, Euripides answers each of Aeschylus' Apollonian assertions. The Bacchae is a point-by-point -point refutation of the Orestia. The Apollonian house that Athens built is demolished by a wave of Chthonian superpower. Dionysus, the invader from the east, succeeds where the Persians failed. Sky cult topples back into the earth cult. Aeschylus makes the ancient legend of the house of Atreus a metaphor for the birth of civilization out of barbarism. 
For him, history is progress. In this respect, he is the first liberal. Unfortunately, for women, the ideal of Athenian democracy celebrated by the Orestia requires a defeat of female power. Modern readers may not catch the chutzpah in Aeschylus' local boosterism, his steering of a Homeric saga toward his hometown. A mere hamlet in the Iliad is like an American poet making the Knights of the Round Table emigrate to New York. But Aeschylus was right. The coming decades were to be a peak moment in world history, a burst of creativity. Accompanied by institutionalized misogyny, women played no part in Athenian high culture. They could not vote, attend the theater, or walk in the Stoa talking philosophy. But the male orientation of classical Athens was inseparable from its genius. Athens became great, not despite but because of its misogyny. Male homosexuality played a similar catalytic role in Renaissance Florence and Elizabethan London. At such moments, male bonding enjoys an amorous intensity of self-assurance, a transient conviction of victory over mothers and nature. For 2,500 years, Western culture has fed itself on the enormous achievements of homosexual hybris, small bands of men, attaining visionary heights in a few concentrated years of exaltation and defiance. The Orestia recapitulates history moving from nature to society, from chaos to order, from emotion to reason, from revenge to justice, from female to male, father kills daughter, wife kills husband, son, kills mother, who is guilty, who innocent. The competing claims, weighed by an Athenian tribunal, produce a tie vote. It is broken by Athena, the warrior Androgyne, who unexpectedly endorses male rule on the grounds that she is motherless, born from her father alone. Athens' patron is the armored woman, a female hard body, without Chthonian interiority. Athena seals up the womb space of mother. Nature. She closes the Orestia in two senses, just as Clytemnestra opens it. Athena is the Apollonian answer to the problem of woman. Dogging every man. The first words of male-willed Clytemnestra evoke the ancient power of fertile, mother night, ag. 265. She stands for female, writes, the priority of mother over son and wife over husband. Unlike, Homer, Aeschylus makes Aegisthus a gigolo, lesser consort of a goddess queen. The Furies, Clytemnestra's hellhound avengers, are demonic spirits of earth cult, black as their mother night. They are ugly. They offend the eye. The Furies are snake-crowned hags, eyes, dripping pus. Apollo and his priestess cannot stand to look at them. He banishes them to their home of, beheadings, torn out eyes, cut, throats, castration, mutilation, stoning, and impalement, Eum, 186. 90. The Furies come from the realm of Dionysian Sparigmos or ritual. Dismemberment. The Chthonian annihilates form and obliterates the eye. The Furies complain of lack of respect from the Olympian. Whelps, young gods wet behind the ears. History stirs from nature's grasp. Apollo, the solar eye, has broken free of Mother Night. The Orestia shows that society is a defense against nature. Everything intelligible, institutions, objects, persons, ideas, is the result of Apollonian clarification, adjudication, and action. Western. Politics, science, psychology, and art are creations of arrogant Apollo. Through every century, winning or losing, Western mind has struggled to keep nature at bay. The Orestia's sexist transition from matriarchy to patriarchy records the rebellion every imagination must make against nature. Without that rebellion, we as a species are condemned to regression or stasis. Even rebelling, we cannot get far but all vying with fate as godlike. The Orestia's sexism was the first shock wave of Greek. Conceptualism, art and architecture had near to hand the Egyptian. Formalism of stone column and sculpture, which had been slowly developing through the archaic era. Philosophy suddenly emerged. From pre-Socratic physics, Aeschylus' Apollonian trilogy inaugurated the golden age of classicism.
Greek tragedy as a conceptual cage in which Dionysus, founder of theater, is caught. A play as an anxiety. Formation freezing his barbaric protean energy. At the end of the Orestia the Furies, cleansed of the Chthonian, become Eumenides, kindly ones, Athens' benevolent guardians. Greek tragedy as an Apollonian prayer, stifling nature's amoral appetite. It works only while society coheres. When the center does not hold, tragedy disintegrates. Dionysus is the mist slipping through society's cracks. After 431 BC, Athens was humiliated by plague, the failed Sicilian expedition, and defeat by Sparta in the Peloponnesian War. Idealism and sense of mission were gone. Apollonian clarity and perfection were no longer possible. Euripides Bacchae, emerging from the cities, self doubt and self criticism, satirically reverses the Orestia. Chthonian nature, which Aeschylus defeats, rebounds with terrible force. Dionysus makes landfall at Thebes, site of Sophocles' greatest play. Euripides rewrites his precursor's central statements. Tiresias, who in Sophocles warns Oedipus to seek Apollonian illumination, now warns Pentheus the other way. Again, Tiresias is the sexual track along which the protagonist moves to destruction. Oedipus. 24 hour transformation from hypermasculine hero to maimed sufferer is echoed by Pentheus' transformation from strutting young buck to drag queen to shredded corpse. The Orestia begins with a signal fire bouncing from summit to summit, Troy to Argos. Clytemnestra's device to learn of Troy's fall, it is the flame of rage passing from that war to this. It is the murderous chain of causality the bloodline of three generations of the house of Atreus, like the red carpet trod by Agamemnon, the stream of his own blood. The flare is also the poetic flame passing from Homer to Aeschylus, a cultural shift of genres from epic to tragedy. The third play of the Orestia opens by mirroring the first transmission over time. Apollo's priestess, the Pythoness, recites Delphi's ownership. From Mother Earth to Apollo, Earth cult to Sky cult, prefiguring the Olympians' neutralization of the Furies. Aeschylus' brilliant movements, lofty, systematic, and historical, are parodied by the Bacchae. Greece again catches fire from Asia, but for apocalypse, not evolution. History moves backwards, civilization relapsing into nature. Dionysus leads barbarian hordes of marauders. Thebes is first, with all of Greece ahead. Tiresias prophecies, flouting Aeschylus, Pythoness, that Dionysus will leap the crags at Delphi. The Bacchae is a demolition derby, a catastrophe saga, and all fall down. Dionysus, the invader as plague, fire, and flood, the titan of nature unbound. The Orestia is Freudian psychodrama. Orestes, young ego, is swamped by the id of the Furies, until superego Apollo puts them in their place. Aeschylus makes an analogy between society and personality. The Bacchae disfigures society's Apollonian constructions. Dionysus is nature's raw sex and violence. He is drugs, drink, dance. The dance of death, my generation of the sixties may be the first since antiquity to have had so direct an experience of Dionysus. The Bacchae is our story, a panorama of intoxication, delusion, and self destruction. Rock music is the naked power of Dionysus as Bromios, the Thunderer. In the Bacchae, Apollonian sky cult and political authority are bankrupt. Society is in its late or decadent phase. The ruling hierarchy consists of the senile and the adolescent. Pentheus is, like Homer's callow suitors, a lost generation of pampered dandies, unseasoned by war and adventure. Heir rather than founder, he is bully and braggart. Thebes is a moral vacuum into which Dionysus surges. He is a return of the repressed, the id of Aeschylus' furies. Bursting from bondage, chronicling the birth of a religion out of the collapse of the old. The Bacchae strangely prefigures the New Testament. 400 years before Christ. Euripides depicts the conflict between armed 
authority and a popular cult. A long-haired nonconformist, claiming to be the son of God by a human woman, arrives at the capital city. With a mob of scruffy disciples, outlandish provincials, are the palms of Jesus' march on Jerusalem a version of Dionysian Thirsi, potent. Pine wands? The demigod is arrested, interrogated, mocked, imprisoned. He offers no resistance, mildly yielding to his persecutors. His followers, like Saint Peter, escape when their chains magically fall off. A ritual victim, symbolizing the god, is lofted onto a tree, then slaughtered and his body torn to bits. An earthquake levels the royal palace, like the earthquake during Jesus' crucifixion. That tears the temple veil, symbol of the old order. Both gods are beloved of women and expand their rights. The play identifies transvestite Dionysus with the mother goddesses Cybele and Demeter. He avenges his mother's defamation by maddening her sister Agave into infanticide. Agave, cavorting on stage with her bloody trophy, cradles the severed head of her son Pentheus in a grisly mock pieta. Against her will, she mimes murderous mother nature. Euripides shows what is excluded from the supposed universality of Athenian tragedy. Dionysus' eerie smile, playful and cruel, gives the lie to tragedy's high seriousness. The salacious voyeurism into which Dionysus lures Pentheus may be Euripides' comment on the moral evasions of theater, the perverse voyeurism of the audience, the residue of untransformed barbarism in tragedy's deaths and disasters. The Bacchae's messenger speeches are crammed with grotesque and miraculous detail. Wild maenads, girt with writhing snakes, give suck to wolves and gazelles. Water, wine, and milk pour from the soil. Women tear cattle to bits with bare hands. Snakes lick splattered blood from cheeks, dismembering Pentheus, the maenads. Play ball with his arms, feet, and ribs. Agave, foaming at the mouth, impales his head on her wand. In these savage, sportive speeches we look directly into demonic fantasy, the hellish nightscape of dream, and creative imagination, shapeshifting Dionysus, who is bull, snake, lion, dissolves the Apollonian borderlines between objects and beings. He is ample, indiscriminate, all-engulfing. The Bacchae deconstructs Western personality. Pentheus, brought on stage in parts on a stretcher, has gone to pieces. He is shattered. He has lost his head. We speak of falling apart, having a breakdown, getting on top of things, getting it all together. Only in the West is there such conviction of the Apollonian unity of personality, hierarchically tidy and task-oriented, turning Pentheus from a warrior calling for his armor to a drag queen primping with her. Hem. Dionysus melts the West's armored ego in moral and sexual ambivalence. The Bacchae returns drama to its severe ritual origins. What Aeschylus seized for Apollo, Euripides returns, bloodstained, too. Dionysus. Tragedy springs from the clash between Apollo and Dionysus. Apollonian order, harmony, and light make a clear space in nature. Where the individual voice can be heard, Apollo is a lawgiver. Dionysus is beyond the law. Tragedy fades to melodrama when the individual becomes greater than the state. Lyric, invented earlier by the Greeks, is the genre of private experience. When lyric invades tragedy, a public mode, tragedy is over. Tragedy makes sightlines, a mathematic of social space. Greek theater formalizes the eye relations of group or polis. It captures and distances Dionysus, binding down nature to be looked at and therefore cleansed. The extreme visibility of the elegant Parthenon, poised on the crest of the Acropolis, hovers above the ritual visibilities of the theater of Dionysus, carved from the cliffside below. The Parthenon and the Orestia were born simultaneously as Apollonian ideas, to see and to conquer by seeing. The rites of Dionysus, as depicted in the Bacchae, were participatory and free form, to the point of chaos. The conversion of Bacchanal into liturgy happened at Athens. The Greek drive for Apollonian 
conceptualization made program and structure out of the spring. Fertility Festival of Dionysus. Greek theater was an exercise of the eye. The audience, sitting and looking, was strengthening the cultural suppression of Chthonian nature. It was intensifying eye and mind in their war with the body. Apollo is the western eye victorious. Dionysus, I noted, is visceral and spasmodic. He is eating and feeling. Sparigmos is nature, chewing, reducing objects to the soupy primeval swamp. On the temple pediment at Olympia, Apollo flings out his arm to quell the roiling centaurs, a wedding party broken into riot and rape. This fascist gesture is also made by the Apollo Belvedere, following his arrow with his eye. Apollo's outstretched arm is the horizon line of sky cult. It is the piercing sightline of the aggressive western eye, the straight line invented by Egypt as a correction of Mother Nature's sexy curves. At Olympia, the Apollonian straight arm suppresses the tacky tumult of Chthonian nature. Apollo is superego grandly subduing the libidinous id, as in the Orestia. The centaurs are man's animal impulses, controlled by social form. Half horse, they symbolize. Dionysian metamorphosis. Dionysus charges matter with motion and energy. Objects are alive. And people are bestial. Apollo freezes the living into objects of art or contemplation. Apollonian objectification is fascist but sublime. Enlarging human power against the tyranny of nature. Apollo's western eye gives us identity by making us visible. His outstretched arm reappears in Renaissance court ritual. Preserved in classical ballet, extension of the arm, needed to escort a woman in a hoop. Skirt, is activation of the upper body. It is literally courtly, that is, it creates a visible, hierarchic social space, the artistic arena in which ballet still moves. The Caucasian line of the dancer's body is Apollo's hard incised edge. His outflung arm represents head and upper body rebelling against Chthonian pelvicism. Remember the hip, heavy Venus of Willendorf's shriveled arms. Dionysus, with his Maenadic night rites, is the body as internal womb space, tunneled for eating and procreating. Apollo, haughty, severe, and judgmental, makes the plane of the eye by which we rise above our murky bodies. Apollonian form was derived from Egypt but perfected in Greece. Coleridge says, the Greeks idolized the finite, while Northern Europeans have a tendency to the infinite. One Spengler similarly identifies the modern Faustian soul with pure and limitless space. Following Nietzsche, he calls the Apollonian the principle of visible limits and applies it to the Greek city-state. All that lay beyond the visual range of this political atom was alien. The Greek statue, the Empirical visible body symbolizes classical reality. The material, the optically definite, the comprehensible, the immediately present. 2. The Greeks were, in my phrase, visionary materialists. They saw things and persons hard and glittery, radiant with Apollonian glamour. We know the Maenadic Dionysus mainly through the impressionistic medium of archaic vase painting. He appears in statue form only when he loses his beard and female garb and turns a phoebic Olympian, in the 5th century and after. High classic Athenian culture, is based on Apollonian definitiveness and externality. The whole, tendency of Greek philosophy after Plato, remarks Gilbert Murray, was away from the outer world towards the world of the soul. 3. The shift of Greek thought from outer to inner parallels the shift in art from the male to the female nude, from homosexual to heterosexual. Taste, Spengler says of Greek society, what was far away, invisible, was ipso facto, not there, for I cited Karen Horney's observation that a woman cannot see her own genitals. The Greek worldview was predicated on the model of absolute outwardness of male sex organs. Athenian culture flourished in externalities, the open air of the agora and the nudity of the palestra. There are no female nudes in major 5th century art because female sexuality was imaginatively, not 
there, buried like the Furies turned humanities, to the old complaint, that the Greeks gave their statues the genitals of little boys, one could reply that the male nude offers the whole body as a projected genital. The modestly stooping Nidian Aphrodite marks the turn toward spiritual and sexual internality. It is the end of Apollo. Kalokagathia, the beautiful and, or as, the good, was implicit in the Greek worldview from the start. Apollonian idealization of form was already present in Homer, while the visual arts were still groping toward a style. Homer's cinematic pictorialism put armored Western personality on the literary map. Jane Harrison suggestively refers, without elaboration, to the Homeric horror of formlessness. Five I find this horror in the Iliad's epic battle between Achilles and the river. Scamander, a strange episode which oscillates surreally between terror and comedy. The river is in a fluid half state of identity, a personification dilating and contracting at will. It thinks and speaks, like a demigod, then diffuses into the immensity of natural force. Beyond human scale, Greek archaic art tucks sprightly river or wind. Gods into the corner of temple pediments. They are gleeful twisty creatures, a man's face and torso ending in a blue corkscrew. Homer's Scamander is good-natured but easily provoked. It protests its defilement with blood and gore by ravening Achilles. There is a long test of wills. Weapons are useless against the foaming cataracts and black wall of water. Achilles is buried in a mighty billow, the earth swept from beneath his feet. Point six. The episode passes in nightmare. Slow motion. Human size, human strength are not enough. Achilles survives only because Hephaestus intervenes, scalding the river with fire and turning it to steam. It is a war of the elements. Only nature can fight nature. The scene switches to Olympus, where the gods are. In a rumpus, Ares, Athena, Aphrodite, Artemis, and Hera fling insults and cuff each other about, while Zeus laughs in delight. This book of the Iliad is an allegorical tableau in which formlessness opposes form. It recapitulates the birth of object and person out of the capricious flux of nature. Identity is imperiled but fights its way to visibility and freedom. The Olympian gods, with their radiant specificity, culminate the evolution of form. Sharp words, sharp blows. The gods are hard. They wear the body armor of Apollonian contour. Fright turns to laughter. The war of man and nature ends in the charm of sky cult. Homer brings form out of the flood of Chthonian darkness. The moral principle of Greek paganism, I propose, was reverence. For the integrity of the human form, about to bestow immortality upon her favorite, Tydeus, Athena was repulsed by his brutish death. In his last agony, he broke open the skull of his enemy, Melanippus, and devoured his brains. Apollonianism is unity and purity of form. Through her many disguises, Athena has a pristine persona, an untouched Apollonian cell of self to which she always returns. Dionysus, on the other hand, is truly protean, the sum of his tumbling roles. In Homer, Athena may zestfully zip about, but in Athens she stands still. The two colossi of the Acropolis showed her in regal Apollonian stasis. Even her hand, perch of a winged victory, rested on a pedestal. High classic figures have a serene equilibrium of face and posture. Their Apollonian contour keeps personality in and nature out. Euripides, shrewd charter of Greek decline, shows Homer's. Chthonian River in New Flood. Like the Bacchae, Medea uses Greek legend to symbolize the fall of Apollonian Athens. Within a year of its production, the city was ravaged by a plague that put the ugliness, vulgarity, and passivity of the human body on public display. Thus, ended, I say, Athens' Apollonian idealizations. A phoebic male beauty had an Achilles heel, where the hand of Mother Nature grips us. An amazing passage in Medea prophetically depicts profanation of the human form by repressed forces beneath and beyond Greek culture. For in Medea, 
spurned by Jason, sends poisoned wedding gifts to his bride, daughter of the King of Corinth. The death of princess and king is one of the most horrifying scenes in literature. A messenger describes the girl receiving and donning the fancy robes and diadem. She smugly pats her hair, smiling in the mirror. She parades through her chambers, looking herself up and down. Suddenly, she trembles and staggers. A double plague assailed her. The golden diadem on her head emitted a strange flow of devouring fire, while the fine robes were eating up the poor girl's white flesh. All aflame, she jumps from her seat and flees, shaking her head and hair this way and that, trying to throw off the crown. But the golden band held firmly, and after she had shaken her hair more violently, the fire began to blaze twice as fiercely. Overcome by the agony she falls on the ground, and none but her father could have recognized her. The position of her eyes could not be distinguished, nor the beauty of her face. The blood, clotted, with fire, dripped from the crown of her head, and the flesh melted from her bones, like resin from a pine tree, as the poisons ate their unseen way. It was a fearful sight. All were afraid to touch the corpse, taught by what had happened to her. The king rushes in, weeping and lamenting. He throws himself on his daughter's body, embracing and kissing her. When he tries to stand up, he stuck to the fine robes, like ivy to a laurel bush. His struggles were horrible. He would try to free a leg, but the girl's body stuck to his, and if he pulled violently, he tore his shrunken flesh off his bones. At last his life went out. Doomed, he gave up. The ghost, side by side lie the two bodies, daughter and old. Father.7. We listen to the messenger's eloquent formal speech with a stunned combination of admiration and physical revulsion. It is a demonic aria, a flight of decadent imagination. The princess is simply a cipher. Nameless, she never appears in the play. But Euripides has particularized her execution with terrible and uncanny detail, threatening our sympathy for his plaintive protagonist. Medea, gifted, niece of the sorceress Circe, is a vehicle of Chthonian disorder. She is a metamorphosist who can change gold to dross, joy to horror. The scene prefigures the transition in Greek art from high classicism to Hellenistic style, father tangled with daughter as like. Laocoon dying with his strangled sons. The Apollonian borders of the body are burst through. The passage's emotional power comes from the brutal contrast between the princess's smirking vanity and the sudden melting of her features beyond recognition. Holocaust and Apocalypse. She stands at ground zero, incinerated by a distant invader. Primping princess as sister to Primping Pentheus, self intoxicated in the electric moment before lightning strikes. Mirror. Crown. Palace. The princess is Apollonian selfhood and social. Hierarchy. For the feminist Euripides, looking backward at Phidian. Athens as Aeschylus looked forward. Greek sexual personae are. Shallow and conventional. Fatuous Jason, like the segregated. Athenian audience, makes rigid definitions of male and female. The. Close horse princess falls victim to Chthonian overflow. The Apollonian Principium Individuationis of father and daughter are abolished, tossing her flaming head. The princess is goaded into a maenadic dance of death. Her flesh melts like resin from a pine tree. She runs with Dionysian fluids. The princess dies by the sedition of her own body, upon which her father is crucified, like Pentheus on the fir tree. Flesh torn in sparagmos, they lie scorched by ecstasy and annihilation. Euripides makes two planes of reality collide. Into the world of glittering Apollonian appearances springs a form dissolving fountain of Chthonian force, erupting from primeval chaos. The intelligible momentarily loses to the irrational, manifested as a fiery lava flow cruelly generated by the human body itself. The king, trapped by his tar baby daughter, turns into the gummy log of Hamlet Sr., a 
crusted corpse in a garden. Euripides destroys the Orestias. Psychodrama. When the princess as young ego is swamped by id, no. Apollo rides to the rescue. The Chthonian triumphs in Medea, as in the later Bacchae. The two plays are symmetrical. Citizenship is denied to a sexually ambiguous, magic working alien, who vengefully debases and liquidates society's arrogant hierarchs. Euripides savors the sexually grotesque king and blinded princess, cleave together in a parody of union, a reply to Sophocles' incest. Drama Male willed Medea, who slaughters her children, dismembers her brother, and dupes Peleus' daughters into killing their father, spreads perversion like a plague. As a Scythian witch, she can violate the unconscious of her victims. In this tour de force of sadomasochistic description, Euripides shows Greek culture in mental and physical breakdown. Spengler says, Soul, for the real Hellene, was in last analysis the form of his body. Eight, the princess's meltdown of face and flesh dissolves what neurologists call the proprioceptive sense, by which we know ourselves in the concrete world. Personality is palpable and visible. An Apollonian self projection. Zevide Barbu says of schizophrenics, the disintegration of the self seems to be related to the deterioration of the perception of form. 9 In Medea. Body image disintegrates as society self destructs. Form is created by the Apollonian eye. King Creon's lament over his mutilated daughter is therefore an elegy for Athenian high classicism. The Athenian cult of beauty had a supreme theme, the beautiful boy. Euripides, the first decadent artist, substitutes a bloody moon for the golden Apollonian sun. Medea is Athens' worst nightmare about women. She is nature's revenge. Euripides' dark answer to the beautiful boy. Though the homosexuality of Greek high culture has been perfectly obvious since Winkleman, the facts have been suppressed or magnified. Depending on period and point of view, late 19th century aestheticism, for example, was full of heady effusions about Greek love, yet Harvard's green and red lobe library translations of classical literature, published early this century, are heavily censored. The pendulum has now swung toward realism. In Greek, homosexuality, 1978, K.J. Dover wittily reconstructs from the evidence of base painting the actual mechanics of sexual practice. But, I depart from sociological rationales for Greek love. For me, aesthetics, are primary. The Athenian turn away from women toward boys was a brilliant act of conceptualization, unjust and ultimately self-thwarting. It was nevertheless a crucial movement in the formation of Western culture and identity. The Greek beautiful boy, as I remarked earlier, is one of the West's great sexual personae. Like Artemis, he has no exact equivalent in other cultures. His cult returns whenever Apollonianism rebounds, as in Italian Renaissance art. The beautiful boy is an androgyne, luminously masculine and feminine. He has male muscle structure but a dewy girlishness. In Greece he inhabited the world of hard, masculine action. His body was on view striving nude in the palestra. Greek athletics, like Greek law, were theater, a public agon. They imposed mathematics on nature. How fast, how far, how strong. The beautiful boy was the focus of Apollonian space. All eyes were on him. His broad-shouldered, narrow-waisted body was a masterwork of Apollonian articulation. Every muscle group edged and contoured. There was even a ropey new muscle, looping the hips and genitals. Classic Athens found the fatty female body unbeautiful, because it was not a visible instrument of action. The beautiful boy is Adonis, the great mother's son lover, now removed from nature and cleansed. Of the Chthonian, like Athena, he is reborn through males and clad in the Apollonian armor of his own hard body. Major Greek art begins in the late 7th century BC with the archaic Koros, youth, a more than life-size nude statue of a victorious athlete, Fig. 12.
he is monumental human assertion. Imagined in Apollonian stillness, he stands like Pharaoh, fists clenched and one foot forward. But Greek artists wanted their work to breathe and move. What was unchanged for thousands of years in Egypt leaps to life in a single century. The muscles curve and swell. The heavy wig-like hair curls and tufts. The smiling Koros is the first fully freestanding sculpture in art. Strict Egyptian symmetry was preserved until the early classic Critios boy, who looks one way while shifting his weight to the opposite leg, fig. 13. In the broken record of Greek artifacts, the Critios boy is the last Koros. He is not a type, but a real boy, serious and regal. His smooth, shapely body has a white sensuality. The archaic Koros was always Calipigian, the large buttocks more stressed and valued than the face. But the buttocks of the Critios boy have a feminine refinement, as erotic as breasts in Venetian painting. The contraposto flexes one buttock and relaxes the other. The artist imagines them as apple and pear, glowing and compact. 12. New York Koros, ca. 600 BC. For 300 years, Greek art is filled with beautiful boys, in stone and bronze. We know the name of none of them. The old-fashioned generic term, Apollo, had a certain wisdom, for the solitary, self-supporting Koros was an Apollonian idea, a liberation of the eye. His nudity was polemical. The archaic core, maiden, was always clothed and utilitarian, one hand proffering a votive plate. The Koros stands heroically bare in Apollonian externality and visibility. Unlike two-dimensional pharaonic sculptures, he invites the strolling spectator to admire him in the round. He is not king or god, but human youth, divinity and stardom fall upon the beautiful boy. Epiphany is secularized and personality ritualized. The Koros records the first cult of personality in Western history. It is an icon of the worship of beauty, a hierarchism self-generated rather than dynastic. The Koros bore strange fruit. From its bold clarity and unity of design came all major Greek sculpture, by the 4th century female. As well as male, Hellenic art spread throughout the Eastern Mediterranean as Hellenistic art. From that grew medieval Byzantine art in Greece, Turkey, and Italy, with its dour mosaic icons of Christ, Virgin, and Saint, Fig. 14. The Italian Renaissance begins in the Byzantine style. Thus there is a direct artistic line from archaic Greek Koroi to the standing saints of Italian altarpieces and the stained glass windows of Gothic cathedrals. Homoerotic iconicism goes full circle in the popular Italian theme, Saint Sebastian, a beautiful seminude youth pierced by phallic arrows, fig. 15. Those arrows are Glances of the aggressive western eye, solar shafts of Apollo the archer, the Greek Koros, inheriting Egypt's cold Apollonian eye, created the great western fusion of sex, power, and personality. 13. The Critios boy, ca. 480 BC. 14. Byzantine saints, 1138 to 1148. 15. Sandro Botticelli, Saint Sebastian. 1474. In Greece the beautiful boy was always beardless, frozen in time. At manhood, he became a lover of boys himself. The Greek boy, like the Christian saint, was a martyr, victim of nature's tyranny. His beauty could not last and so was caught full flower by Apollonian. Sculpture. There are hundreds of pots, shards, and graffiti hailing so. And so Kalos the beautiful, flirtatious public praise of males by males. Dover demonstrates the criteria governing depiction of male genitalia, opposite to ours. A small thin penis was fashionable, a large penis vulgar and animalistic. Even brawny Hercules was shown with boys' genitals. Therefore, despite its political patriarchy, Athens cannot be considered horrid word, a philocracy. On the contrary, the Greek penis was edited down from an exclamation point to a dash. 
the beautiful boy was desired but not desiring. He occupied a presexual or suprasexual dimension, the Greek aesthetic ideal. In convention, his adult admirer could seek orgasm, while he remained unaroused. The beautiful boy was an adolescent, hovering between a female past and male future. J. H. Van den Berg claims the 18th century invented adolescence. Point one zero. It is true children once passed more directly into adult responsibilities than they do now. In Catholicism, for example, seven is the dawn of moral consciousness. After one's first communion, it's hell or high water. Brooding identity crises were indeed the romantic creations of Rousseau and Goethe. But Van den Berg is wrong to make adolescence entirely modern. The Greeks saw it and formalized it in art. Greek pederasty honored the erotic magnetism of male adolescence in a way that today brings the police to the door. Children are more conscious and perverse than parents like to think. I agree with Bruce Benderson that children can and do choose. The adolescent male, one step over puberty, is dreamy and removed, oscillating between vigor and languor. He is a girl boy, masculinity shimmering and blurred, as if seen through a cloudy fragment of ancient glass. J. Z. Eglinton cites images of youthful bloom in Greek poetry. The adolescent in bloom is a synthesis of male and female beauties. 11. The slightly older Ephebos gained in gravity but retained a half-feminine glamour. We see it in the Pedimental Apollo, the Delphic Charioteer, the Bronze Apollo at Chatsworth, the white Lekathos Eritrean warrior seated before a gravestone. These youths have a distinctly ancient Greek face, high, brow, strong straight nose, girlishly fleshy cheeks, full petulant mouth, and short upper lip. It is the face of Elvis Presley, Lord Byron, and Bronzina's glossy mannerist blue boy. Freud saw the androgyny, in the Greek adolescent, among the Greeks, where the most manly men were found among inverts, it is quite obvious that it was not the masculine character of the boy which kindled the love of man, it was his physical resemblance to woman as well as his feminine psychic qualities, such as shyness, demureness, and the need of instruction and help. Twelve certain boys, especially blondes, seem to carry adolescent beauty into adulthood. They form an enduring class of homosexual taste that I call the Billy Bud Topos, fresh, active, and aphebic. The beautiful boy is the Greek angel, a celestial visitor from the Apollonian realm. His purity is inadvertently revealed in Joseph Campbell's negative critique of 5th century Athens. Everything that we read of it has a wonderful adolescent atmosphere of opalescent, timeless skies, untouched by the vulgar seriousness of a heterosexual commitment to mere life. The art, too, of the lovely standing nude, for all its grace and charm, is finally neuter, like the voice of a singing boy. Campbell quotes Heinrich Zimmer's praise of the heterosexual flavor and yogic awareness of Hindu sculpture, Greek. Art was derived from experiences of the eye, Hindu from those of the circulation of the blood. 13 Campbell's neuter is a blank, a moral, nothing, but the beautiful boy's androgyny is visionary and exalted. Let us take Campbell's own example, the voice of a singing boy. In a seraphim recording of Foray's Requiem that substitutes the king's college choir for the usual women, the treble parts are taken by boys. From 8 to 13, Alec Robertson's review seeks a tonality of emotion for which our only language is religious. Boys' voices add an unforgettable radiance and serenity to their part, impossible to sopranos. However good, the soloist singing has an ethereal beauty that no words can describe. 14. The rosy English or Austrian Choir boy, disciplined, reserved, and heart stoppingly beautiful, is a symbol of spiritual and sexual illumination, fused in the idealizing Greek manner. We see the same thing in Botticelli's exquisite long haired boy angels. These days, especially in America, boy love is not 
only scandalous and criminal but somehow in bad taste. On the evening news, one sees handcuffed teachers, priests, or Boy Scout leaders hustled into police vans. Therapists call them maladjusted, emotionally immature, but beauty has its own laws, inconsistent with Christian morality. As a woman, I feel free to protest that men today are pilloried for something that was rational and honorable in Greece. At the height of civilization, the Greek beautiful boy was a living idol of the Apollonian eye. As a sexual persona, the Koros represents that tense relation between I and object that I saw in Nefertiti and that was absent in the Venus of Willendorf, with her easy, forgiving, spongy female amplitude. Zimmer correctly opposes heterosexual Hindu circulation of the blood to Greek aesthetics of the eye. The beautiful boy is a rebuke to Mother Nature, an escape from the labyrinth of the body, with its murky womb and bowels. Woman is the Dionysian miasma, the world of fluids, the Chthonian swamp of generation. Athens, says Campbell, was untouched by the vulgar seriousness of a heterosexual commitment to mere life. Yes, mere life is indeed rejected by the idealizing Apollonian mode. It is the divine human privilege to make ideas greater than nature. We are born into the indignities of the body, with its relentless inner movements pushing us moment by moment toward death. Greek Apollonianism, freezing the human form into absolute male externality, is a triumph of mind over matter. Apollo Slaying the python at Delphi, the navel of the world, halts the flood of time, for the coiled serpent we carry in our abdomen is the eternal wave motion of female fluidity. Every beautiful boy is an Icarus seeking the Apollonian sun. He escapes the labyrinth only to fall into nature's sea of dissolution. Cults of beauty have been persistently homosexual from antiquity to today's hair salons and houses of couture. Professional beautification of women by homosexual men is a systematic reconceptualizing of the brute facts of female nature. As at the 19th century fan de siècle, the esthete is always male, never female. There is no lesbian parallel to Greek worship of the adolescent. The great Sappho may have fallen in love with girls, but to all evidence she internalized rather than externalized her passions. Her most famous poem invents the hostile distance between sexual personae that will have so long a history in Western love poetry. Gazing across a room at her beloved sitting with a man, she suffers a physical convulsion of jealousy, humiliation, and helpless resignation. This separation is not the aesthetic distance of Apollonian Athens but a desert of emotional deprivation. It is a gap that can be closed, as Aphrodite laughingly promises Sappho in another poem. Lascivious delectation of the eye is conspicuously missing in female eroticism. Visionary idealism is a male art form. The lesbian esthete does not exist, but if there were one, she would have learned from the perverse male mind. The eye intense pursuit of beauty is an Apollonian correction of life in our mother born bodies. The beautiful boy, suspended in time, is physicality without physiology. He does not eat, drink, or reproduce. Dionysus is deeply immersed in time, rhythm, music, dance, drunkenness, gluttony, orgy. The beautiful boy as angel floats above the turmoil of nature. Angels, in Judaism too, defy Chthonian femaleness. This is why the angel though sexless, is always a youthful male. Eastern religion does not have our angels of incorporeal purity, for two reasons. A. Messenger, angelos, or mediator between the divine and human is unnecessary, since the two realms are coexistent. Second, Eastern femaleness is symbolically equivalent to and harmonious with maleness, though this has never improved real women's social status. The pink-cheeked beautiful boy is emotional vernality, spring only. He is a partial statement about reality. He is exclusive, a product of aristocratic taste. He flees the superfluity of matter, the womb of female nature devouring and spewing out creatures. 
Dionysus, we, noted, is, the many, all-inclusive and ever-changing. Life's totality is, summer and winter, floridity and devastation. The Great Mother is, both seasons in her benevolent and malevolent halves. If the beautiful, boy is pink and white, she is the red and purple of her labial maw. The beautiful boy represents a hopeless attempt to separate imagination from death and decay. He is form seceding from form, making natura naturata dreaming itself free of natura naturans. As an epiphany, I created. He binds up the many into a transient vision of the one, like art itself. Besides the Critios boy, the preeminent examples of this persona are the bronze Benevento boy of the Louvre, Fig. 16, the Antinous, sculptures commissioned by the Emperor Hadrian, Fig. 17, Donatello's David, and Thomas Mann's Tadzio in Death in Venice. The Apollonian is a mode of silence, suppressing rhythm to focus the eye. The beautiful boy, sexually self-complete, is sealed in silence, behind a wall of aristocratic disdain. The adolescent dreaminess of the Antinous sculptures is not true inwardness but a melancholy premonition of death. Antinous drowned, like Icarus. The beautiful boy dreams but neither thinks nor feels. His eyes fix on nothing. His face is a pale oval upon which nothing is written. A real person could not remain at this stage without decadence and mummification. The beautiful boy is cruel in his indifference, remoteness, and serene self. Containment. We rarely see these things in a girl, but when we do, as in the magnificent portrait photographs of the young Virginia Woolf, we sense catatonia and autism, narcissistic beauty in a post-adolescent, like Hitchcock's Marnie, may mean malice and ruthlessness, a psychopathic amorality. There is danger in beauty. The beautiful boy has flowing or richly textured hyacinthine hair. The only luxuriance in this chastity. Long male hair, sometimes. Wrapped round the head, was an aristocratic fashion in Athens. Antinous thick hair is crisply layered, as in Van Dyck's Silky Princes. Or 70s rock stars. In its artful negligence and allure, the hair. Traps the beholder's eye. It is a nimbus, a pre-Christian halo scintillating with fiery flakes of stars. The beautiful boy, glittering with charisma, is matter transformed, penetrated by Apollonian light. Greek visionary materialism makes hard crystal of our gross fleshiness. The beautiful boy is without motive force or deed. Hence, he is not a hero. Because of his emotional detachment, he is not a heroine. He occupies an ideal space between male and female, effect an affect, like the Olympians, he is an object dar, which also affects, without acting or being acted upon. The beautiful boy is the product, of chance or destiny, a sport thrown up by the universe. He is, I, suggested, a secular saint. Light makes beautiful boys incandescent. Divinity swoops down to ennoble them, like the eagle falling upon. Ganymede, who is kidnapped to Olympus, unlike the pack of female lovers like Leda whom Zeus casually abandons as types of the generative mother. 16. The Benevento boy, Roman copy from the Augustan period, 1st century BC, of a Greek work of the 5th century BC found at Herculaneum. Remnants of two sprays of wild olive, the victor's crown at Olympia, acquired by Count Tyskevich in the 1860s from a Naples dealer, who had bought it in nearby Benevento. 17. Antinous, Hadrianic Roman sculpture in the Greek style, 2nd century AD Museo. Nazionale, Naples, in the Phaedrus, Plato sets forth Greek homosexuality's ritualization. Of the eye, Socrates says the man who gazes upon, a godlike, countenance or physical form, a copy of, true beauty, is overcome by a shudder of awe, an unusual fever and perspiration, beholding it, he reverences it as he would a god, and if he were not afraid of being accounted stark mad, he would offer sacrifice to the beloved as to a holy image of divinity. Fifteen beauty is the first step of a ladder. 
leading to God, writing in the 4th century about memories of the 5th. Plato is already postclassical. He is suspicious of art, which he banishes from his ideal republic. Visionary materialism has failed. In the Phaedrus, however, we still see the aesthetic distance vibrating. Between Greek personae, Plato has Sappho's fever, but it is cooled by the dominating and dominated Western eye. In Greece, beauty was sacred and ugliness or deformity hateful. When Odysseus bludgeons, Thersites, a lame, hunchback commoner, Homer's heroes laugh. Christ's ministry to the lepers was unthinkable in Greek terms. In the Greek cult of beauty, there was mystical elevation and hierarchical submission, but significantly without moral obligation. The Greek principle of domination by the beautiful person as work of art is implicit in Western culture, rising to view at charged historical moments. I see it in Dante and Beatrice and in Petrarch and Laura. There must be distance, of space or time. The eye elects a narcissistic personality as galvanizing object and formalizes the relation in art. The artist imposes a hieratic sexual character on the beloved, making himself the receptor, or more feminine receptacle, of the beloved's mana. The structure is sadomasochistic. Western sexual personae are hostile with dramatic tension. Naturalistically, Beatrice's expansion into a gigantic heavenly body is grandiose and even absurd, but she achieves her preeminence through the poets, sexually hierarchizing Western imagination. The aesthetic distance between personae is like a vacuum between poles, discharging electric tension by a bolt of lightning. Little is known of the real Beatrice and Laura, but I think they resembled the beautiful boy of homosexual tradition. They were dreamy, remote, autistic, lost in a world of androgynous self-completion. Beatrice, after all, was barely eight when Dante fell in love with her in her crimson dress. Laura's impenetrability inspired the fire and ice metaphor of Petrarch's sonnets, which revolutionized European poetry. Fire and ice is Western alchemy. It is the chills and fever of Sappho's and Plato's uncanny love experience, agonized ambivalence of body and mind, was Sappho's contribution to poetry, imitated by Catullus and transmitted to us through folk ballads and pop torch songs. Western love, Denis de Rougemont shows, is unhappy or death-ridden. In Dante and Petrarch, self-frustrating love is not neurotic but ritualistic. And conceptualizing, the West makes art and thought out of the cold. Manipulation of our hard sexual personae. Domination by the beautiful personality is central to Romanticism, specifically in its dark Coleridgean line passing through Poe and Baudelaire to Wilde. The pre Raphaelite Dante Gabriel Rossetti, imitating his namesake, invented his own Beatrice, the sickly Elizabeth Siddle, who obsessively appears throughout his work. That Siddle, like Beatrice and Laura, was a female version of the beautiful boy is suggested by the speed with which her face turned into the face of beautiful young men in the paintings of Rossetti's disciple, Edward Byrne Jones. The beautiful boy's narcissistic remoteness and latent autism became somnambulism in Rossetti's pensive muse. Antinous, Beatrice, Laura, and Elizabeth Siddle passed with ease into art because in their cool, untouchable impersonality they already had the abstract removal of an object d'art. Transcendence of sexual identity as the key. The bungling brooder, John Hinckley, infatuated with the boyish Jodie Foster replicates Dante's submission to distant Beatrice. Dante's love was just as preposterous, but he made poetry out of it. The untalented literalist, failing to recognize the aggression already inherent in the Western eye, picks up a gun instead of a pen. The sexual ambiguity of Jodie Foster's on-screen persona supports my point about Beatrice, the absence of moral obligation in this sexual Religiosity explains the amorality of aestheticism. Oscar Wilde believed the beautiful person has absolute rights to commit any act. Beauty replaces morality as the divine order. As Cocteau said, following Wilde, 
The privileges of beauty are enormous. The beautiful boy, the object of all eyes, looks downward or away, or keeps his eyes in soft focus because he does not recognize the reality of other persons or things. By making the glamorous, Alcibiades burst drunk into the symposium, ending the intellectual debate. Plato is commenting in retrospect on the political damage done to Athens by its fascination with beauty. Spoil. Captivating. Alcibiades was to betray his city and end in exile and disgrace. When the beautiful boy leaves the realm of contemplation for the realm of action, the result is chaos and crime. Wilde's Alcibiades, Dorian Gray, makes a science of corruption, refusing to accept the early death that preserved the beauty of Adonis and Antinous. Dorian compacts with a fellow art object, his portrait, projecting human mutability onto it. The aphibic Dorian is serene and heartless, the beautiful boy as destroyer. In Death in Venice, man's homage to Wilde, the beautiful boy does not even have to act to destroy his blinding Apollonian. Light is a radiation disintegrating the moral world. The beautiful boy is the representational paradigm of high classic Athens. He is pure Apollonian objectification, a public sex object. His lucid contour and hardness originate in Egypt's monumental architectonics and in Homer's gleaming Olympian sky cult. The Apollonian beautiful boy dramatizes the special horror of dissolved form to Phidian Athens, with its passionate vision of the sunlit human figure. Unity of image and unity of personality were the Athenian norm, satirized by Euripides in his Chthonian dismemberments, symbol of fragmentation and multiplicity. The androgynous beautiful boy has an androgynous sponsor, the male, born Urania and Aphrodite, whom Plato identifies with homosexual love, while the archaic Koros is vigorously masculine, the early and high. Classic beautiful boy perfectly harmonizes masculine and feminine, with the Hellenistic tilt toward women, prefigured by Euripides, the beautiful boy slides toward the feminine, a symptom of decadence. Praxiteles registers this shift in his Aphebic Hermes, ca. 350 BC, which misaligns the elegance of classic contraposto. Hermes awkwardly leans away from the engaged leg rather than toward it curving his hips in a peculiar swish. His arm, supporting infant. Dionysus, rests heavily on a stump. Farnell says of the Praxiteline. Langer, even the gods are becoming fatigued. 16 Kenneth Clark. Finds in high classic Greek art a perfect, physical balance of strength. And grace. 17 in the Hellenistic beautiful boy. Grace drains strength. Rhys Carpenter sees Praxiteles Nidian Aphrodite as a sexual degeneration of Polycleitus's canonical 5th century Dory Forest, a languid devitalization of the male victor athlete into an equivalent feminine canon. 18 Hausa says of the Hermes and Lysippus's apoxiominos, they give the impression of being dancers rather than athletes. 19 Jane Harrison denounces Praxiteles Hermes on the Grounds that as Corotrophus, boy rearer, he, usurps the function of the mother, the man doing woman's work has all the inherent futility and something of the ugly dissonance of the man, masquerading in woman's clothes. 20 again, Harrison recognizes sexual duality but finds it repugnant. Clark points out that wherever Contraposto appears in world art, it shows Greek influence, even in India to which it was carried by Alexander. Originally a male motif, it entered female iconography to become a vivid symbol of desire. 21 What seems overlooked is that Contraposto was erotic. From the start, in the dignified exhibitionism of the early classic, Koros, Hellenistic Aphebes use a more extreme hipshot pose, ripe, with sexual solicitation. It is the street stance of harlot and drag. Queen, ancient or modern. Male contraposto with hand on hip, as in Donatello's David, is provocative and epicene. Portraits of Dionysus illustrate the sensual feminization of male personae in Greek art. The archaic transvestite Dionysus fuses a 
bearded adult man with a sexually mature woman. In the 5th century, he loses his beard and becomes indistinguishable from the Aphebic Apollo of the Parthenon frieze. The Hellenistic Dionysus is a voluptuously appealing beautiful boy, a 3rd century head at Thassos, could be mistaken for a woman, a movie queen, with thick shoulder length hair and expectant parted lips. Scholars have generally been repelled by these beautiful objects, with their overt homoeroticism. Even Marie Docourt, in her excellent study, Hermaphrodite, attacks the effeminacy of the Hellenistic Dionysus, which pandered to Greek homosexual desire. Point two two, but it was the Hellenistic Dionysus and Apollo who were the androgynous models for the exquisite Antinous sculptures. The long, decentralized Hellenistic era was like our own time. Lively, anxious, and sensationalistic. Hellenistic art teams with sex and violence. High classic Greek art honors ideal youth, while Hellenistic art is full of babies, brutes, and drunks. Athenian eroticism is pornographic in kitchen and tavern pottery but sublime in restrained in major sculpture. Hellenistic sculpture, on the other, hand, likes large-scale wrestling and rapine, massacre, pugilism, and priapism. Hellenistic sex is in such free flow that the gender of shattered statues can be doubtful. Misidentifications have been common. Dover speaks of the change in homosexual taste in Athens from the 5th century, which glorified athletic physiques, to the 4th, when softer, passive minions came into vogue. It is in the 4th century that the hermaphrodite first appears in classical art. The plush creature with female breasts manages to expose its male genitals, either by a slipping cloak or a tunic boldly raised in ritual. Exhibitionism. The sleeping hermaphrodite influenced later art, like 18th century reclining female nudes. From one side, the drowsy figure displays ambiguously smooth buttocks and the half swell of a breast. From the other, female breast and male genitals pop out clear. As day, I found the Villa Borghese copy prudently pushed against the wall to discourage inspection. The decorative popularity of hermaphrodites is paradoxical, for everywhere in antiquity the birth of a real hermaphrodite was greeted with horror. This condition, hypospadius, may be examined ad stuporum in the hundreds of Photographs of Hugh Hampton Young's pioneering text, Genital Abnormalities, Hermaphroditism, and Related Adrenal Diseases, 1937. Since a hermaphrodite birth was a bad omen presaging war, disaster, or pestilence, the infant was usually destroyed or left to die by exposure. As late as Paracelsus, hermaphroditic children were thought monstrous signs of secret sins in the parents. 23 The analyst Diodorus Siculus, in the Roman era, records a case where an Arabian girl's tumor burst open to reveal male genitals. She then changed her name, donned men's clothes, and joined the Calvary. Point two four. The source of the hermaphrodite legend is unknown. It may be a vestige of the sexual duality of early fertility deities of Asia Minor. Later stories improvised upon the name to claim he, she was the child of Hermes and Aphrodite. Ovid started a mythographic muddle with his version in the Metamorphoses, possibly based on a lost Alexandrian romance. The amorous nymph Salmasus traps the beautiful boy, Hermaphroditus, in her forest pool, entwining him with her arms and legs, until the gods grant her prayer to unite them into one being, like Plato's primeval androgynes. The tale may have begun as a folk legend about a cursed pool sapping the virility of men who bathed in it. Greek androgyny evolved from Chthonian to Apollonian and back. Vitalistic energy to godlike charisma to loss of manhood. I do not agree with the disparagement of the later androgyne by Jane Harrison and Marie Delcourt. Effeminate men have suffered a bad press the world over. I accept decadence as a complex historical mode. In late phases, maleness is always in retreat. Women have, ironically, enjoyed a greater symbolic, if not practical, freedom. Thus, it 
is that male and not female homosexuality has usually been harshly punished by law. A debater in Lucian declares, far better that a woman, in the madness of her lust, should usurp the nature of man, than that man's noble nature should be so degraded as to play the woman. 25 Similarly today, lesbian interludes are a staple of heterosexual pornography. Ever since man emerged from the dominance of nature, masculinity has been the most fragile and problematic of psychic states. Greek culture has come to us mainly through Rome. Greek Apollonianism appealed to the highly ritualistic Romans, with their solemn formalism of religion, law, and politics. Rome returned Apollonianism to its Egyptian roots. Like Egypt, Rome was centered on a cult of the state. Hierarchy and history were the means of national identity. The Apollonian is always reactionary. For its own propaganda, Rome made Greek-style monolithic, gracious human, scale yielded to officialism, governmental overstatement. Koros became colossus, columns swelled and towered. Rome imitated not the plain, vigorous Doric pillar of the Parthenon nor the sleek, elegant. Ionic pillar of the Erechtheum and Propylaea, but the gigantic, frilly Corinthian pillar of the Temple of Zeus on the plain below the Acropolis. Our cold white federal architecture is Roman. Banks and government buildings are vast temples of state, tombs, and fortresses. No Greek temple looks like a tomb. Rome rediscovered the hieratic, Egyptian funeralism latent in Greek Apollonian style. The Greeks were not interested in the dead, but Egypt and Rome defined themselves by death rituals of preparation or commemoration. Roman ancestors were eternal male presences. Their portraits, the imagines, first wax death masks and then stone busts, were kept in a household shrine and paraded at funerals. Roman identity was condensed into discrete units of personality carried down the linear track of dynasty and history. Clan, tribalism, still so strong in Italian. Culture, framed ethics and society. Sculptural Western personae began in Egypt but were given their definitive stamp by Apollonian Rome. Rome made the roster of Western selves, names engraved in stone. Rome inherited Greek style in the Hellenicization of the Mediterranean world in the centuries before Christ. But the Roman Mind was neither speculative nor idealist. A Greek temple is solid. Rare marble. A Roman temple is usually brick faced with marble. Economy and practicality outweigh abstract aesthetics. The pedimental Parthenon sculptures are finely carved front and back, even though tiny crimps of drapery would be hidden from the ground. But the back of a Roman statue in a niche could be left relatively rough. Egyptian and Greek Apollonianism was a metaphysic of the eye, an aristocratic aestheticism making spiritual order of the visible and concrete. The Romans, except for Hellenophiles like Hadrian, were not aesthetes. Rome took the eroticism and dreamy obliqueness out of Greek iconic sculpture. The great prima porta statue of Augustus, for example, is Koros turned suave, sober diplomat. Law and custom became sacred ends in themselves. The Roman persona was a public construction. It had severity, weight, density. The Greeks were peripatetic, walking and talking. Argument was mobile and improvisatory. But the Romans were declamatory, oratorical. They took stage and held it. The Roman persona was the stable prow of an ancient ship of state. Indeed, a uh, Rostrum, is a ship's prow, the trophy hung speaker's platform of the forum. Roman personality was equivalent to Greek epic, a repository of racial history. The group was paramount, the hero legends of early Rome, Marcus Curtius, Musius Sivola, Horatius Cocles, Lucius Brutus, teach self-sacrifice to state. The Roman legion, much larger than the Greek phalanx, was an extrapolation of Rome's political will. Fortitude, resolution, victory. Rome began in combat against its Italic neighbors and finally reduced the known world to servitude. Its 
growth was a martial clash of identities, celebrated in the lavish. Triumph, another procession mining the linearity of history. Roman art was documentary, while Greek art treated contemporary history as allegory. Gisela Richter remarks, We have not a single representation of the battles of Thermopylae or Salamis, of the Peloponnesian War, of the Great Plague, of the Sicilian Expedition. How different the Romans or the Egyptians and Assyrians with their endless friezes recording their triumphs over their enemies. 26 Roman Art used facts to magnify reality. Greek art transformed reality by avoiding facts. Roman architecture was equally pragmatic, excelling in brilliant engineering, colossal public works like baths, aqueducts, and a far-flung network of paved roads, so sturdy they are still in use. Greek Apollonianism was a sublime projection, mind-made radiant matter, but Roman Apollonianism was a power play, a proclamation of national grandeur. The hard Roman persona ultimately descended from pharaonic self-conceptualization, the old kingdom's foursquare, enthronements, state and self were monuments carved by Apollonian. Borderline. What of Apollo's rival? Roman Bacchus is not Dionysus' peer. He is merely a rowdy wine god, a tippler and mirthmaker. Dionysus was so strong in Greece because of the dominance of Apollonian. Conceptualism. The combat between Apollo and Dionysus, never resolved, produced the rich diversity of Greek culture. Dionysus was unnecessary in Rome because of the ancient Chthonianism of Italian religion. Buying Greek prestige wholesale, the Romans identified their gods willy-nilly with the Olympians, an imperfect matchup in the case of rough Diana. The Manes, the deified dead, occupied a sepulchral Chthonian realm. Ancestor worship is also ancestor fear. Roman memoriousness was part celebration part propitiation. At the Parentalia in February, the family dead were honored for a week. At the Lemuria in May, wandering ghosts were driven out of the family house. The dead pressed upon the dutiful consciousness of the living. To this day, relatives in my mother's village near Rome visit the cemetery every Sunday to lay flowers on the graves. It is a kind of picnic. I remember childhood feelings of chill and awe at the candle, kept burning by my grandmother before a photograph of her dead daughter Lenora, the small, round yellow flame flickering in the darkened room. A sense of the mystic and uncanny has pervaded Italian culture for thousands of years, a pagan hieraticism flowering again in Catholicism, with its polychrome statues of martyred saints its holy elbows and jawbones sealed in altar stones, and its mummified corpses on illuminated display. In a chapel in Naples, I recently counted 112 gold and glass caskets of musty saints' bones, stacked as a transparent wall from floor to ceiling. In another church, I found a painting of the public disemboweling of a patient saint, his intestines being methodically wound up on a large machine like a pasta roller nailed like schools of fish to church walls are hundreds of tiny silver ears, noses, hearts, breasts, legs, feet, and other body parts, votive offerings by parishioners seeking a cure, old-style Italian, Catholicism, now shunned by middle-class wasp-aspiring descendants of immigrants, was full of the Chthonian poetry of paganism. The Italian imagination is darkly archaic. It hears the voices of the dead, and identifies the passions and torments of the body with the slumbering spirits of Mother Earth. A ritual fragment survives from a southern Italian mystery cult. I have entered into the lap of the Queen of the Underworld. I believe I understand this with every atavistic fiber of my being, its pagan conflation of longing, lust, fright, ecstasy, resignation, and repose. It is the demonic sublime. If there is an Apollonian Dionysian dialectic in Rome, it is in the tension between individual and group. This is the theme of the first four books of Virgil's Aeneid, symbolized by red and gold. Carnal red is emotion, sex, life in the body here and now. Imperial gold is the 
Roman future, harsh and glorious. Dutiful Aeneas must harden and limit himself. He carries ancestors and posterity on his back. Apollonian gold wins over Dionysian red, flaming up in Dido's funeral. Pyre, in Homer as in Virgil, woman is an obstacle to the heroic quest. The epic journey must free itself from female chains and delays. The Trojan women burn the ships, and Dido makes Aeneas her consort. Half of Aeneas' destiny, says the opening of the poem, is to find the true wife Lavinia, his passage into Italian bloodlines. But Lavinia, no, Penelope, shrinks as the poem goes on. Virgil oddly gives his imaginative sympathies to Amazon enemies of Rome. Carthage, founded by a Phoenician queen, is a transplant of Near East autocracy and goddess cult. Woman is in mythic ascendancy. Venus, appearing as Diana to her son Aeneas, says her huntresses quiver in high red. Boots are the Carthaginian female style. Aeneas inspects murals of the Trojan War in the rising temple of savage Juno. When he comes to Penthesilea Ferns, Dido enters the poem. She is the Amazon of the first half of the Aeneid, just as Camilla is the Amazon of the second. Aeneas falls under her sway, and the male will is stymied. He builds her city instead of his own. Venus armed as Aeneas' lesson. Carthage is both the pleasure, principle and the orient from which he uproots himself. East yields to west, Asia to Europe. The Italian tribes think Aeneas effeminate. Turnus calls him a half-man, let me foul in the dust that hair. Crimped with curling tongs and oiled with myrrh. Dido's suitor, Iarbas calls him, this second Paris, wearing a Phrygian bonnet to tie. Up his chin and cover his oily hair, and attended by a train of she. Men. 27 Aeneas must purify his masculinity, creating the simplicity. And gravity of Roman personality. The Vulcan warrior Camilla, apparently Virgil's invention, is a new burst of female furor that must be quelled for Rome to be born. The Aeneid is remarkably attracted to the glamorous androgynes, Dido and Camilla, who steal the thunder of pallid Lavinia. The poem follows its hero through a war of sexual personae. Female deviance, losing to decorous femininity, takes the poetry with it. The twin viragos win in defeat. Virgil writes at the borderline between republic and empire. In under a century, Rome accelerated in size and ambition. The new cosmopolitan sexual personae broke with tradition. There was a shift from Apollonian unity and narrowness to Dionysian pluralism. Uncontrolled and eventually decadent, granting universal citizenship. Rome brought civilization to the world but diluted itself. Eight. Hundred years intervene between Homer and Virgil. When Virgil picks up the epic genre, it no longer obeys poetic command. Epic plot, the male trajectory of history, is the weakest thing in the Aeneid. Homer's great rhetorical rhythms are missing. The Iliad and Odyssey were all day performance art, recited to live audiences by a professional bard of athletic stamina. The Aeneid is closet drama. Virgil was melancholic, reclusive, possibly homosexual. His nickname, Parthenias, the maidenly man, is a pun on Virgil, Virgo and Parthenope, a poetic name for Naples, near which his villa was located. Virgil, unlike Homer, knew urban coteries of aristocratic refinement, a court milieu of febril worldliness. This experience affects the Aeneid in unsuspected ways. Its sexual personae have undergone the same transformation as its epic gifts. Homer's heroes exchange iron cauldrons and tripods, functional wear of high bronze. Age value. Virgil's gifts are objects dark, gold and silver and studded. With jewels, Alexandrian museum consciousness has come into being. Virgil's detachment and connoisseurship, so damaging to epics male. Pyrotechnics intensify the erotic aura around persons and things. There is an intricate psychological meshing between poet and poem. Not present in Homer, Virgil is involved with Dido. Her obsession, suffering, and passion of love-hate are the grandest things in 
literature since Euripides' Medea, Virgil's identification with her as as palpable as Flaubert's with Madame Bovary or Tolstoy's with Anna Karenina, the suicide of a male-willed heroine, in all three cases, may be a rite of exorcism, objectifying and terminating a male artist's spiritual transsexualism, falling on Aeneas' sword, Dido cries, sick, sick iu vat ire sub umbras, thus, thus is it pleasing to go beneath the shades. The liquid Latin is thrillingly, hypnotically autoerotic, like honey and dark wine, the shadowy tongue tapping in our mouth is as private and phallic as the fetishistic sword. Little else in the Aeneid approaches the brilliance of the Carthaginian books. The poet probably knew it, as he ordered the unfinished poem burned after his death, like self-immolating Dido. Virgil is a decadent poet, a virtuoso of destruction. His fall of Troy is a cinematic apocalypse, flames filling the night sky as violation in profanation swirl below. His characteristic imagery is sinuous, writhing, blistering, phosphorescent. The only translation that captures the Aeneid's uncanny demonism is by W. F. Jackson Knight. In prose, in this poem, Roman ritualism falls to forces of the irrational, so long kept in check. Virgil, an admirer of Augustus, shows the costs of political destiny. Most recently, the suicide of another Oriental queen, Cleopatra, Dido's model. Epic plot in the Aeneid as failed self-containment, a male scheme to bridal transsexual. Reverie. Virgil's relation to his own poem is perverse. At a historical crisis in sexual personae, he turns to Epic to stop it and stop himself. Spencer reproduces this conservative but deeply conflicted strategy in The Fairy Queen. Sexual personae are vampires on plot in the Aeneid, a phenomenon I find in Coleridge's Christabel and Call. Psychoiconicism. The Roman Republic made the persona, Greek theaters, wooden mask, a legal entity, sharp contoured in the Apollonian way. The Roman decadence, ingenious in pleasures and cruelties, was a reaction against and satiric commentary on the austerity of Republican personae, a profanation of ancestor cult. Republic II. Empire was like high classic to Hellenistic, unity to multiplicity. Roman religion's Chthonian reverence turned into Dionysian orgy, now removed from fertile nature. Maenadism was un-Roman. There was no Asiatic wildness in Roman cult, with its priestly hierarchy, as in Egypt but not Greece. There was program, formula, decorum, even in the honoring of omen-filled nature. The Roman priest was an interpreter who kept his wits about him. He did not go into trance. Like the Delphic oracle, true Greek orgy meant mystic loss of self. But in imperial Roman orgy, persona continued. The Roman decadent kept the observing. Apollonian eye awake during Dionysian revel. More Alexandrian connoisseurship. Here applied to the fashionable self. I plus orgy equals decadence, salaciousness, lewdness, lasciviousness, such. Interesting hyperstates are produced by a superimposition of mind on erotic action. The West has pioneered in this charred crimson territory. Without strong personality of the Western kind, serious decadence is impossible. Sin is a form of cinema, seen from a distance. The Romans, pragmatically adapting Greek ideas, made engineering out of eroticism too. The air of Greek theater was not Roman theater but Roman sex. The Roman decadence has never been matched in scale because other places and times have lacked the great mass of classical forms to corrupt. Rome made demonic music of gluttony and lust from the Dionysian body. The Maenadism absent from Roman cult became imperial ecstasy, mechanized greed. Roman literature's sexual personae are in hectic perpetual motion. Greek aristocratic athleticism split in two in Rome, vulgar gladiatorship by ruffians and slaves, and leisure class sexual adventurism, a sporting life then as now. As the Republic ends, Catullus records the jazzy promiscuity of Rome's chic set. Patrician, women loitering on dark streets, 
giving themselves to common passers-by. Half-clad men molested by their mothers and sisters. Effeminate soft as a rabbit and languid as a limp penis. A sodomite, waking with battered buttocks and red lips like snow, mouth. Rimmed with last night's pasty spoils. The strolling poet, finding a boy and girl copulating, falls upon the boy from behind, piercing in. Driving him to his task. Public sex, it is fair to say, is decadent. Oh, those happy pagan days, romping in green meadows, one still encounters this sentimental notion, half-baked Keats. It is quite wrong. Catullus, like Baudelaire, savors imagery of squalor and filth. His moral assumptions remain those of Republican Rome, which he jovially pollutes with degeneration and disease. His poetry is a torch, lit descent into a gloomy underworld, where we survey the contamination and collapse of Roman personae. Men and women are suddenly free, but freedom is a flood of superfluous energy, a vicious circle of agitation, quest, satiation, exhaustion, ennui. Moral codes are always obstructive, relative, and man-made. Yet they have been of enormous profit to civilization. They are civilization. Without them, we are invaded by the chaotic barbarism of sex, nature's tyranny, turning day into night and love into obsession and lust. Catullus, an admirer of Sappho, turns her emotional ambivalence into sadomasochism. Her chills and fever become his, Odi at amo, I hate and I love, her beloved maidens, fresh as orange flowers, become his cynical lesbia, adulterous and dominatrix, vampiristically, draining the strength of all. The urban femme fatale dons the primitive mask of mother nature. Lesbia, the well-born Clodia, introduces to Rome a depraved sexual persona that had been current, according to a grieved comment of the Old Testament, for a thousand years in Babylon. Female receptivity becomes a sinkhole of vice, the vagina a collector of pestilence to poison Roman nobility and bring it to an end. Catullus is a cartographer of sexual personae. His lament for the dying god Attis, Carmen 63, is an extraordinary improvisation on gender. Castrating himself for Cybele, Attis enters a sexual twilight zone. Grammatically, the poem refers to him as feminine. I a woman, I a man, I a youth, I a boy, in this litany of haunting memory, Attis floats through a shamanistically expanded present, tense of gender, all things and nothing. Like imperial Rome, he has been pitched into an ecstatic free fall of personae. Suspension of sexual conventions brings melancholy, not joy. He is artistically detached from ordinary life but feels sterile. Addis is the poet, himself, mutating through gender in a strange, new, manic world. Ovid, born forty years later, is the first psychoanalyst of sex. His masterpiece is aptly called Metamorphosis. As Rome changes, Ovid plunders Greek and Roman legend for magic transformations, man and god to animal and plant, male to female and back. Identity is liquid. Nature is under Dionysian spell. Apollo's contours do not hold. The world becomes a projected psyche, played upon by amoral vagaries of sexual desire. Ovid's encyclopedic attentiveness to erotic perversity will not recur until Spencer's fairy queen, directly influenced by him. His successors are Sade, Balzac, Proust, Kraft, Ebbing, and Freud. The Metamorphosis is a handbook of sexual problematics. There is Iphis, a girl raised as a boy who falls in love with another girl and is relieved of her suffering by being changed into a man. Orcanius, once the girl Cenus, who rejects marriage and is raped by Neptune. As compensation, she is changed into a man invulnerable to wounds. Martial and sexual, according to the Homeric scholiast, Canius set up his spear as a phallic totem in the marketplace, prayed in sacrifice to it, and commanded people hail it as a god, angering Zeus. In Virgil's underworld, Aeneas sees Canius as a woman, the 
morphological ghost of her femaleness reasserting itself. Ovid's complications of violation and fetishism are theory, not titillation. The theme is our double nature, his term for the centaurs who smother impenetrable canius after a horrifying orgy of maenadic pulverizations. Like Freud, Ovid constructs hypothetical models of narcissism and the will to power. His point of view comes from his position between eras. Sexual persona, in flux, allow him to bring cool Apollonian study to bear upon roiling Dionysian process. In his lesser works, Ovid lightens Catullus' bitter sex war into parlor politics. In The Art of Love, he says the seducer must be shrewd and changeable as Proteus. This is the Roman Dionysus, metamorphic. Greek nature reduced to erotic opportunism. Sex change as a foxy. Game. The wise adulteress, counsels Ovid, transsexualizes her letters. Turning, he, to, she. The empire diverted Roman conceptual energy. Into sex. So specialized as Marshall's sexual vocabulary that it. Influenced modern medical terminology. Latin an exact but narrow language, became startlingly precise about sexual activity. The Latinist Fred Nichols tells me that a verb in Marshall, used in poetry for the first time by Catullus, describes the fluttering movement of the buttocks of the passive partner in sodomy. There were, in fact, two forms of this verb, one for males and another for females. Classical Athens, exalting masculine athleticism, had no conspicuous sexual sadomasochists and street transvestites. The Roman Empire, on the other hand, if we believe the satirists, was overrun by epicene creatures. Ovid warns women to beware of elegant men with coiffures, sleek with liquid nard, they may be out to steal your dress. What can a woman do when her lover is smoother than she? and may have more boyfriends, 28 Osinus tells. A sodomist with depilated anus and buttocks, you are a woman. Behind, a man in front, girlish boys and long-haired male prostitutes, appear in Horace, Petronius, and Marshall. Gaius Julius Phaedrus, blames homosexuals of both sexes on drunken Prometheus, who, attached the wrong genitalia to human figures he was molding. Lesbianism infrequent in Greek literature, makes a splash in Rome. Marshall and Horace record real-life tribads, Balba, Felinus, and Folia. Of Arminum, with her, masculine libidinousness. There are lesbian, innuendos about the all-woman rights of the Bona Dea, crashed by Publius Clodius in drag. Lucian's debater condemns lesbian acts as androgynous passions, and calls dildos, infamous instruments of Lust, an unholy imitation of a fruitless union. 29 Rome's sexual disorientation was great theater, but it led to the collapse of paganism. Pursuit of pleasure belongs on the party circuit, not in the centers of power. Today, too, one might like playfulness and spontaneity in a friend, lover, or star, but one wants a different character in people with professional or political authority. The more regular, unimaginative, and boring the daily lives of presidents, surgeons, and airline pilots, the better for us, thank you very much. Hierarchic, ministry should be ascetic and focused. It does not profit from identity crises, the province of art. Rome had a genius for organization. Its administrative structure was absorbed by the Catholic Church, which turned an esoteric Palestinian sect into a world religion, Roman imperial bureaucracy, an extension of republican legalism, was a superb machine, rolling over other nations. With brutal force, 2,000 years later, we are still feeling the consequences of its destruction of Judea and dispersion of the fractious Jews, who refused to become Roman. We know from Hollywood movies what that machine sounded like, it's thunderous. Relentless marching drums pushing Roman destiny across the world and through history. But when the masters of the machine turned to idleness and frivolity, Roman moral force vanished. The Roman analysts give us the riveting gossip. Sodomy was 
reported of the emperors Tiberius, Nero, Galba, Otho, Commodus, Trajan, and Elagabalus. Even Julius Caesar was rumored to be bisexual. Hadrian fell in love with the beautiful Antinous, deified him after his death, and spread his image everywhere. Caligula had a taste for extravagant robes and women's clothes. He dressed his wife, Caesonia, in armor and paraded her before the troops. He loved impersonations, appearing in wig and costume as singer, dancer, charioteer, gladiator, virgin huntress, wife. He posed as all the male and female gods. As Jupiter, he seduced many women, including his sisters. Cassius Dio Tartley remarks, he was eager to appear to be anything rather than a human being and an emperor. 30. Nero chose the roles of bard, athlete, and charioteer. He dressed as a tragedian to watch Rome burn. On stage he played heroes and heroines, gods and goddesses. He pretended to be a runaway slave, a blind man, a madman, a pregnant woman, a woman in labor. He wore the mask of his wife Papaya Sabina, who had died, it was said, after he kicked her in her pregnant belly. Nero was a clever architect of sexual spectacle. He built riverbank brothels and installed patrician women to solicit him from doorways, tying young male and female victims to stakes. He draped himself in animal skins and leapt out from a den to attack their genitals. Nero devised two homosexual parodies of marriage. He castrated the boy Spurus, who resembled dead Papaya, dressed him in women's clothes, and married him before the court, treating him afterward as wife and empress. In the second male marriage, with a youth whom Tacitus calls Pythagoras, and Suetonius Doriforus, sex roles were reversed. The emperor was bride. On the wedding night, reports Suetonius, he imitated the screams and moans of a girl being deflowered. 31. Commodus gave his mother's name to a concubine, making his sex life an Oedipal drama. He appeared as Mercury and transvestite. Hercules. He was called Amazonius, because he dressed his concubine, Marcia as an Amazon and wanted to appear as an Amazon himself in the arena. Elagabalus, Caracalla's cousin, brought the sexually freakish customs of Asia Minor to Imperial Rome. He scandalized the army with his silks, jewelry, and dancing. His short reign was giddy, with plays, pageants, and parlor games. Lampridius says, he got himself up as a confectioner, a perfumer, a cook, a shopkeeper, or a procurer, and he even practiced all these occupations in his own house continually. 32. Elagabalus's lordly ease of access to plebeian roles with social mobility in reverse. Like Nero, he practiced class transvestism. David Reisman's phrase for the modern blue jeans. Fad.33. Elagabalus's life passion was his longing for womanhood. Wearing a wig, he prostituted himself in real Roman brothels. Cassius Dio reports. He set aside a room in the palace and there committed his indecencies, always standing nude at the door of the room, as the harlots do, and shaking the curtain which hung from gold rings, while in a soft and melting voice he solicited the passers. By there were, of course, men who had been specially instructed to play their part. He would collect money from his patrons and give himself airs over his gains. He would also dispute with his associates in this shameful occupation, claiming that he had more lovers than they and took in more money, miming an adulteress caught in the act and beaten by her husband. The emperor cherished black eyes as a souvenir. He summoned to court a man notorious for enormous genitals and greeted him with a ravishing feminine pose, saying, Call me not lord, for I am a lady. He impersonated the great mother in a lion-drawn chariot and publicly posed as the Venus Pudica, dropping to his knees with buttocks thrust before a male partner. Finally, Elagabalus's transvestite fantasies led to a desire to change sex. He had to be dissuaded from castrating himself, reluctantly accepting circumcision as a compromise. 
Dio says. He asked the physicians to contrive a woman's vagina in his body by means of an incision, promising them large sums for doing so. 34 Science, which only recently perfected. This operation is clearly laggard upon the sexual imagination. Absolute power is a door into dreaming. The Roman emperors made living theater of their turbulent world. There was no gap between wish and realization. Fantasy leapt into instant visibility. Roman imperial mask, charades, inquisition, horseplay. The emperors made sexual persona an artistic medium, plastic as clay. Nero, setting live Christians afire for a night banquet, played with reality. Roman copies of Greek statues are a bit dull and coarse. So, too with Rome's sexual literalization of Greek drama. The emperors, acting to provoke, torture, or arouse, removed the poetry and philosophy from theater. The vomitoria of Roman villas are troughs for vomiting the last six courses before starting on the next. Vomitoria is also the name for the exits of Roman amphitheaters, through which the mob poured. Imperial Rome, heir to sprawling Hellenistic culture, suffered from too muchness, the hallmark of decadence. Too much mind, too much body, too many people, too many facts. The mind of the king is a perverse mirror of the time. Having no cinema, Nero made his own. In Athens, the beautiful boy was an idealized object de quite. In Rome, persons were stage machinery, mannequins, decor. The lives of the wastrel emperors demonstrate the inadequacy of our modern myth of personal freedom. Here were men who were free and who were sickened by that freedom. Sexual liberation, our deceitful mirage, ends in lassitude and inertness. An emperor's day was androgyny in action, but was he happier than his republican ancestors, with their rigid sex roles? Repression makes meaning and purpose. The more moral an emperor, the less he was drawn to theater. Dio says of Trajan's empress, when Platina, his wife, first entered the palace, she turned round so as to face the stairway and the populace, and said, I enter here such a person as I wish to be when I depart. And she conducted herself during the entire reign in such manner as to incur no censure. 35 With old Roman integrity, Platina rejects random metamorphosis of personality. The moral man has one persona firmly fixed in the great chain of being. Plato dismisses myths about the gods changing shape, is not the best always least liable to change or alteration by an external cause. Every god is as perfect and as good as possible, and remains in his own form without variation forever. 36 Virtue and divinity are unitary, homogeneous. Apollonian. Thus the Empress Platina resists the self-division of worldly experience. Multiplicity of persona is anarchic. Hermes is a thief. Hence the neoclassic 18th century unlike the Renaissance, rejects the androgyne. Pope assails Epicene Lord Hervé, whom he casts as Nero's catamite Spurus, for defying the great chain of being. Spurus refuses to confine himself to one social or sexual role, transgressing the borders of male and female, mammal and reptile, even animal and mineral. Point three seven for Pope, a man knows his own place and his own face. There are no masks. Theatrical self-transformation, a seductive principle of our time, can never be reconciled with morality. From antiquity on, professional theater has been under a moral cloud. Autocrat, artist, actor. Freedom of persona is magical but destabilizing. An emperor's appearance on stage was shocking, since actors were déclassé, barred. From Roman citizenship, St. Augustine denounces the voluptuous madness of stage plays, and, the foul plague spot, of the theater. Point three eight. Tertullian complains of theater's immorality and its frequenting by prostitutes, who even took to the stage to advertise themselves. The first English actresses, in the late 17th century, were notorious for promiscuity. In 1969, the New York Social Register still dropped 
the name of a man who married a movie star. The Puritans, who managed to close the theaters for 18 years, equated fiction with deceit. They were right. Art remains an avenue of escape from morality. Actors live in illusion. They are skittish shamans, drenched in being. Crafty fabricators of mood and gesture, they slip along the edges of convention. Actor and artist are the first to register historical change. They write the sibylline leaves of Western sexual personae. Roman decadence was the final skirmish between the Apollonian and Dionysian elements in pagan culture. The strength and vigor of the Roman Republic came from its synthesis of an Apollonian cult of the state with archaic Chthonian ritualism. Major early Roman gods were male, with subordinate fertility goddesses. Although worship of the Great Mother had been introduced in 204 BC and had always been an option of the aristocracy, her popularity during the empire was a significant departure from Rome's first principles. She came from the eastern Mediterranean, where nature is less hospitable and more absolute. Was this turn toward female divinity a cultural advance or retreat? Then and now, worship of the Great Mother in an urban era is decadent. Imperial Romans no longer lived in and by the cycle of nature. The Great Mother went from fertile life force to sadomasochistic sexual persona. She was the ultimate dominatrix. In late Rome, men were passive to history. Decadence as the juxtaposition of primitivism with sophistication, a circling back of history on itself. The Roman Great Mother, with her multiple names, and symbols, was heavy with the past. Her pregnancy was curatorial. Another Alexandrian museum. The Great Mother was the focus of new anxieties and spiritual longings that would not be satisfied until the consolidation of Christianity. The Church Fathers recognized the Great Mother as the enemy of Christ. Saint Augustine, writing at a turning point in Western culture, ca. 415 AD, calls the rites of Cybele, obscene, shameful, filthy, the mad and abominable revelry of effeminates and mutilated men. If these are sacred rites, what is sacrilege? If this is purification, what is pollution? The Great Mother has surpassed all her sons, not in greatness of deity, but of crime. Cybele is a monster, imposing a deformity of cruelty on her castrated priests. Even Jupiter sinned less. He, with all his seductions of women, only disgraced heaven with one Ganymede. She, with so many avowed and public effeminates, has both defiled the earth and outraged heaven. 39 The Great Mother, like Rome herself, is the whore of Babylon. Christianity could not tolerate the pagan integration of sex, cruelty, and divinity. It thrust Chthonian nature into the nether realm to be infested by medieval witches. Demonism became demonism, a conspiracy against God. Love, tenderness, pity became the new. Virtues, soft qualities of the Palestinian martyr. The pagan veneration of force had turned politics into a bloodbath. Late Rome oscillated between fatigue and brutality, flagellation and castration in the mother cults was a sacrificial symbol of human dependency on nature. In the empire, however, whipping got kinky, and castrates went professional. Packs of them, in wigs, makeup, and garish female dress, roamed the towns and highways clinking cymbals and begging for alms. Apuleius describes them, squeaking for delight in their splintering harsh womanish voices. Forty eunuchs had a high profile in the empire. Church leaders despised them. Christian strictness about Sex roles dates from this period of crass, flamboyant personae. The Great Mother's castrate devotees, turning ritual orgy into street carnival, put the effeminate or homosexual male into permanent ill repute. When woman resurfaces in the Christian pantheon, she will be the mild virgin without animal taint. Banished by Augustine, the Great Mother disappears for over a thousand years, but she returns in all her glory in Romanticism, that historical wave of the archetypal 
though it destroyed the outward forms of paganism, Christianity has never interrupted the pagan continuity of sexual personae, latent, in our language, ideas, and images. Christianity inherited Judaism's suspicion of image making, but in its centuries of expansion, it began to use pictures as a didactic tool. The earliest Christians were an illiterate underclass. Christian pictures were first rudimentary. Scrawls, a new cave art in Roman catacombs, then they sailed upward into Byzantine domes, where they copied Greek iconic posture and hard edged Apollonian style. Christian saints are reborn pagan. Personae. Martin Luther correctly diagnosed a loss of Aboriginal Christianity in the Italian Church. The Romanism in Catholicism is splendidly, enduringly pagan, spilling out in Renaissance, Counter Reformation, and beyond. Paganism is pictorialism plus the will to power. It is ritualism, grandiosity, colossalism, sensationalism. All theater is pagan showiness, the brazen pomp of sexual personae. Judaism's campaign to make divinity invisible has never fully succeeded. Images are always eluding moral control, creating the brilliant Western art. Tradition. Idolatry is fascism of the eye. The Western eye will be served, with or without the consent of conscience. Images are archaic. Projection. Earlier than words and morals. Greco-Roman personality is itself a visual image, shapely and concrete. The sexual and psychological deficiencies of Judeo-Christianity have become blatant. In our own time, popular culture is the new Babylon, into which so much art and intellect now flow. It is our imperial sex theater, supreme temple of the Western eye. We live in the age of idols. The pagan past, never dead flames again in our mystic hierarchies of stardom. 5. Renaissance form. Italian art. The Renaissance, a rebirth of pagan image and form, was an explosion of sexual personae. Recent scholarship has followed a Christianizing tendency, smoothing the rough edges off the Renaissance and giving it an anachronistic moral tone. Specialists have slowly redefined Renaissance humanism in their own image patient and prudent, yet the disciples of saintly Raphael could plot the murder of a rival artist in the street. The sudden intellectual and geographical expansion of culture inaugurated three centuries of psychological turbulence. Renaissance style was spectacle and display, a pagan ostentation. The Renaissance liberated the Western eye, repressed by the Christian Middle Ages. In that eye, sex and Aggression are amorally fused, the great chain of being, a master principle of Western culture. From classical antiquity to the Enlightenment, sees the universe as hierarchical, mineral, plant, animal, man, angel, god. The Renaissance was politically unstable, Shakespeare's Ulysses grounds, politics in the great chain of being. Disrespect for authority is like misaligned planets causing earthquake and storm, Troilus and Cressida, I.I.E.83-126. to 126. From the tension between sexual personae and public, order came an abundance of Renaissance literature and art. Celebrations of the beauty and necessity of order are a reflex of the nearness of disorder. The medieval great chain of being suffered a climactic trauma. The Black Death of 1348 a bubonic plague that killed up to 40% of Europe's population. Boccaccio decries the breakdown of law and government, the desertion of child by parent and husband by wife. A well-born woman who fell ill was nursed by a male servant, nor did she have any scruples about showing him every part of her body as freely as she would have displayed it to a woman, and this explains why those women who recovered were possibly less chaste in the period that followed. One the Black Death weakened social controls. It had a polar effect, pushing some toward debauchery and others, like the flagellants, toward religiosity. The Athenian plague, I argued, brought high classicism to an end. The Black Death worked in reverse, giving birth to the Renaissance by destroying the Middle Ages.
Philip Ziegler says, Modern man was forged in the crucible of the Black Death. To Christianity's failure to protect the good damaged church authority and opened the way for the Reformation. I think the grossness and squalor of plague broke the Christian taboo on display of the body. Pagan nudity reappeared, in its anguished Hellenistic form of torture, massacre, and decay. By reducing persons to bodies, the plague put personality into a purely physical or secular dimension. I begin Renaissance art with the shock of the Black Death. Public ugliness and exhibitionism unmoralized the body and prepared it for its idealization in painting and sculpture. Boccaccia's Plague Framed Decameron, the first work of Renaissance literature, is an epic of cultural disintegration and renewal. At the Renaissance, says Jacob Burkhart, there was an awakening of personality. Three Renaissance art teams with personalities arrogant, seductive, vivacious. Italy restores the pagan theatricality of Western identity. There is a craze for cosmetics, hairstyles, costumes. What would have been vanity and sybaritism in the Middle Ages becomes the public language of personae. Architecture takes vivid hue. The white marble of the Florentine Duomo, completed in the early Renaissance, is crossed with red and green hallucinatory vibrations in the Italian sun. This burst of multiple color is like coming to Virgil after Caesar and Cicero. The Aeneid's new artistic palette, rose, violet, purple, signals the manic proliferation of imperial personae, so too in the Renaissance, as in the psychedelic 60s. Colors and personae are in dynamic relation. By the late Renaissance, architecture dissolves in color or is buried under ornamentation. Bernini uses 20 colored marbles for the Cornaro chapel. In that outbreak of pagan sex and violence which is the Bernini Baroque, the liberated eye finally drifts into a sea of sensual excitation. The Renaissance infatuation with sexual personae is reflected in Castiglione's Book of the Courtier, 1528, which had enormous influence all over Europe. It is a program for theatricality. The man, with a talent, says Castiglione, should, adroitly seek the occasion for displaying it. For social life is a stage and each man a dramatist. Castiglione set high standards of taste for dress and deportment. The courtier is an artifact, a work of self-sculpture. He is also an androgyne. He has a special sweetness, a grace, and beauty. Two of his primary qualities, sprezzatura and disinvoltura, nonchalance, and ease, are hermaphroditizing. That is, by making speech and movement seem effortless, they disguise or efface masculine action. Woman is central to the book of the courtier. The dialogue takes place in the apartments of the Duchess of Mantua while the Duke sleeps and woman literally has the last word. The Castiglione woman is purely feminine. Castiglione opposes the double-sexed Petrarchan model of womanhood, with its proud, killing cold. The courtiers, sweetness and grace seep into him from contact with women. Male, education is Castiglione's theme as much as Plato's, but woman has now captured the symbolic high ground of spiritual value. In Castiglione, all women are diatemas. The courtier quests for a sexual persona perfectly balancing masculine and feminine. Castiglione warns against a effeminacy, excessive feminization. The courtier's face should have something manly about it. I would have our courtier's face be such, not so soft and feminine as many attempt to have who not only curl their hair and pluck their eyebrows, but preen themselves in all those ways that the most wanton and dissolute women in the world adopt, and in walking, in posture, and in every act, appear so tender and languid that their limbs seem to be on the verge of falling apart, and utter their words so limply that it seems they are about to expire on the spot, and the more they find themselves in the company of men of rank, the more they make a show of such manners. These since nature did not make them, women as they clearly wish to appear and be, should be treated 
not as good women, but as public harlots, and driven not only from the courts of great lords but from the society of all noble men. Point five. Is this merely an attack on open homosexuality? Castiglione implies that effeminacy is somehow inspired by the presence of authority. Figures. The issue is the moral welfare of court and sovereign. We come now to history's most repellent androgyne, completely overlooked by feminist promoters of androgyny. I call it the court. Hermaphrodite. Renaissance high culture was organized around the courts of duke and king, upon whom artists and intellectuals depended for patronage. Art was a tool of competitive display, by which a ruler maintained his prestige. Power always generates sycophancy. Enid Wellsford says, the blasphemous flattering of princes, which was such a disagreeable characteristic of Renaissance literature and reveling, was not a mere fashion of speech but a sign that the state was being regarded as an end in itself. 6. A prince, 1. Step from God. Reproduced the great chain of being in his court. Hierarchy. Flattery was secular prayer. Worship of the sacred order. But the insincere flatterer was leech and opportunist, a polluter of language. In Castiglione's detestation of the type, we see the moral dangers of Renaissance theatricality. The court hermaphrodite appears wherever there is wealth, power, and fame. He is in governments, corporations, university, departments, and the book and art world. We know the professional, sycophant from the Hollywood flack or yes man. He is the celebrity, hairdresser, the boudoir confidant and lounge lizard, the glossy escort. Ava Gardner said of an unctuous gossip columnist, he's either at your feet or at your throat. Flattery and malice come from the same forked tongue. The sycophant is an androgyne because of his pliability and servility. He is a deformation of Castiglione's courtier. Self-sculpture becomes slavish plasticity to the ruler's whim and will. Identity is self-evacuated. The flatterer opens himself like a glove to the royal hand. Castiglione's male, harlots, are, or seem to be, homosexual because sycophancy is political sodomy. We call a flatterer a brown nose, an ass liquor, sucking up, groveling, supine. His shameless self-abasement is unmanly, elevating bum overhead. Lloyd George said Lord Derby was a cushion who always bore the impress of the last man who sat on him. Like Milton's fawning, Satan, the smooth flatterer crawls on his belly, twisting and turning. With changing circumstance, he is purely reactive, a parody of femininity, each word and deed a cloying mime of the ruler's desire. This phenomenon may be a perversion of male bonding, a social spectacle of dominance and submission. Shakespeare's Richard II is rebuked by his lords for the thousand flatterers who sway his judgment. 2. I.100. Flattery poisoning the court world of Hamlet is one cause of the hero's chronic nausea. Polonius and the young courtier Osric agree like annoying echoes, with each of the exasperated Hamlet's nonsensical assertions. The court hermaphrodite has no gender because he has no real self or moral substance. Most painful to Hamlet is the betrayal of his childhood friends, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, who turn spy for the king. Hamlet calls Rosencrantz a sponge that soaks up the king's countenance, his rewards, his authorities, IV. E.12-21. Goethe's Wilhelm Meister rejects a proposal to combine the two men into one. There ought to be at least a dozen of them, for they are society itself. Seven Shakespeare's dramatic doubling of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern as the court hermaphrodite sterilely cloning itself. Inseparable and indistinguishable, they hover in floating passivity. Pope's ambitious dunces dive into London sewage. Sycophancy was a foul byproduct of Renaissance secularism. John Donne alludes to painted courtiers and strange hermaphrodites, epithalamian made at Lincoln as in a in Ben Jonson's Volpone. The parasite, Mosca is cunning household sycophant to a nobleman whose entourage includes a eunuch, castrone, and a hermaphrodite, androgyna.
pleased with Mosca's services. Volpone cries, my witty mischief. Let me embrace thee. Oh that I could now, transform thee to a Venus, versus I. Flattery as sexual subordination. Hierarchy is conceptualized eroticism, which is why, as homely Henry Kissinger said, power is the ultimate aphrodisiac. The Renaissance court aesthetic is still thriving in the 18th century, when Pope denounces Lord Hervé as a cynical court hermaphrodite and Mirabeau calls Marie Antoinette the only man at court. Two cinema court hermaphrodites are Catherine Hepburn's Nervy, Epicene, Secretary Gerald in Woman of the Year and the odious eunuch, Photinus, Pharaoh's Lord Chamberlain in the Elizabeth Taylor, Cleopatra. Renaissance hierarchies are dramatized in the noisy climax of Benvenuto Cellini's autobiography, 1562. The artist is one of the great sexual personae of the Renaissance, a culture hero and worker of marvels. Before this, sculptor and painter, as manual laborers, were always inferior to the poet. Everywhere except Greece, they were simply artisans, like today's carpenter and plumber. Cellini's bronze. Perseus is forged in a Wagnerian storm of Western will. The artist attacks by earth, air, water, and fire. He piles on wood, brick, iron, copper. He digs a pit. He hauls ropes. He shapes his hero out of clay and wax. He exerts superhuman energies until he is struck down by fever. Cellini takes to bed in ritual cuvade, while Perseus strains to be born. The metal curdles and must be resurrected from the dead. Finally, the shouting, cursing artist, transfigured by creative ecstasy, defeats all obstacles and brings Perseus into the world in an explosion. A tremendous flash of flame, like a thunderbolt. Cellini has made miracles, triumphing by a godlike blend of male and female. Power point 8. Now Perseus is placed in Florence's public square, Fig. 18. At its unveiling, the crowd sends up a shout of boundless enthusiasm. Dozens of sonnets are nailed up, panegyrics by university scholars. The Duke sits for hours hidden in a palace window, listening to citizens acclaim the statue. This thrilling episode demonstrates the potential for collectivity at certain privileged moments in history. The Renaissance made public art uniting the social classes in a common emotion, a figure on a platform, the mingling of nobles, intellectuals, plebeians. One thinks of the broad audience of Shakespeare's Globe Theater. It is impossible to imagine a modern artwork provoking a shout from a socially mixed crowd. Our sole equivalent is cinema, as at the Atlanta premiere of Gone with the Wind, Cellini illustrates the National differences in Renaissance form. In Italy, the object d'ar, in England, drama. 18. Benvenuto Cellini, Perseus with the head of Medusa, ca. 1550. Whether Cellini lies or exaggerates is irrelevant. His autobiography, dictated to a scribe, is compulsively Western in its hierarchical vision. Little in the East corresponds to this epiphanic theatricality of the art object, this concentration of affect upon a single point, the apex of a perceptual pyramid. The Perseus is an Apollonian idol of the aggressive Western eye. It is partly Cellini's victorious superself and partly a homoerotic glamorization of the beautiful boy, a Greco. Roman theme revived in the Renaissance. Western personality is raised on a pedestal, in Florence or in Nuremberg. Lenny Riefenstahl did for Hitler what the neoclassic David did for Napoleon. Personality is ritualized by the fascism of the Western eye. Cellini, by divine force of genius, raises his Perseus to a summit presided over by an invisible godlike duke. Agon and revelation. Western religion, art, and politics use the same dramaturgy of form because they are all emanations of cold hierarchical mind. Perseus was Cellini's answer to the heroic marble David made by Michelangelo 40 years earlier for the same public square. Both statues descend from Donatello's bronze David, the first beautiful 
nude and the first truly freestanding sculpture since the fall of Rome. Blatantly homosexual in inspiration, it shows David standing, victorious over the severed head of Goliath, which he tramples. Underfoot, Fig. 19. The story of David and Goliath, like that of Judith, and Holofernes, would become a political symbol of Florentine. Resistance to tyranny. Donatello's David is astonishingly young, even younger than the Critios boy. David's contraposto is languorously Hellenistic. The hand on hip and cocked knee create an air of sexual solicitation. From the side, one is struck by the peachy buttocks, bony shoulder blades, and petulantly protruding boy belly. The combination of child's physique with female body language is perverse and pederastic. Michelangelo is to adopt this erotic formula for his more athletic nudes, where it becomes overtly sadomasochistic. For H. W. Jansen, Donatello's David is strangely androgynous. Le beau garçon sans merci, conscious only of his own sensuous beauty. There may be a connection to Beccadelli's poetry collection. Hermaphroditus.9 David has long feminine locks of hair, tangled with ribbons, and a splendidly raffish wreathed hat, a version of the traveler's hat of Hermes Psychopompos. But here is no traveler's cloak, only exquisitely etched leather buskins. A pornographic trope, the half-dressed is more erotic than the totally nude. The feathery wing of Goliath's helmet, like an escaping thought, climbs ticklishly up the inside of David's thigh, pointing toward the genitals. Roman Pudi often display their genitals or mischievously urinate, a motif adopted for Renaissance fountains. Donatello poeticizes the ostentatio genitalium, a pagan showing. The hoary head of a monster conquered is a familiar iconographic detail, but here it vomits a wreath like flood of blood ringing the statue. The stream is the giants and the artists. Own desire. David, plunging his massive sword to the center, has stolen the adult penis, as he has stolen hearts. The gushing blood, wing-topped, is a carnal cloud. Zeus as a maimed eagle bearing up. Ganymede. 19. Donatello. David, ca. 1430-32. I think Donatello's David, even more than the ancient Venus Pudica, was the true model for Botticelli's Venus. David, fusing Venus and Mars, skims into view on a swirl of the dreaming artist's fantasy, half spasmodic release, half rising sigh. The David shimmery, slithery, bronze as a frozen wet dream, an Apollonian petrifaction. It is also a portrait of the artist, whose oppressed face appears like a signature at the bottom, another homoerotic motif borrowed by Michelangelo. The armed boy bursts like Athena from the artist's imprisoned brain. The glamorous Apollonianism of Italian Renaissance art begins with Donatello, who frees sculpture from its medieval subordination to architecture, from his St. George, 1417, stepping from its niche, to David, stone knight to bronze Koros, medieval armor as the pagan exoskeleton of Western personality, hard, shiny, absolutist, it is a product of that radiant Apollonian thing making which passes from Egypt to Greece and Rome and resurfaces in the high Middle Ages as military design. The bronze David as St. George's suit of armor turned inside out. David's brazen nudity is the impermeability of Western personality. His compact frame is supercondensed by the aggressive Western eye. He is personality as sex and power. The beautiful boy is homosexuality's greatest contribution to Western culture. Unchristian and anti-Christian, he is an iconic formalization of the relation between the eye and reality. Repeated in a thousand forms in Italian painting and sculpture, he is the ultimate symbol of Renaissance art. He is Saint Sebastian, the Christian Adonis pierced by arrows, or a phoebic Saint Michael, whom the Renaissance took out of his Byzantine tunic and clad in silver armor. The Northern European Renaissance has few beautiful boys and no Apollonian grandeur. Figures, portraits accepted, rarely fill the pictorial plane. They are modest, 
fluttery, and to my Mediterranean. I dry and insipid. They allow space to press upon them. Italian art makes personality and gesture florid and theatrical, in the fascist, Apollonian manner. Donatello's David stands on its own because it has rejected Northern Gothicism for Southern paganism. Its hardness and domination of space come from the artist's rediscovery of the authentically Western will, inflexible and amoral. Art has rearmed itself with the pagan glorification of matter. Donatello's hues are always sexually ambiguous. His marble, clothed David, 1409, has a graceful, feminine hand and girlishly delicate face with a small, pretty mouth. The statue was apparently based on an Etruscan goddess in the Medici collection. Point one zero. The unfinished marble David in Washington has fleshy cheeks in classic Greek style. The bust of a youth in Florence has a sensitive face and sweet smile and a provocatively swelling throat and breast. With longer hair, he could pass as a woman. In his harrowing late period, Donatello abandons his ephebic dreams and banishes pagan eroticism. From his art, the emaciated wooden John the Baptist and Mary Magdalene are withered by guilt and atonement. David's glossy, Apollonian surface is scored and slashed, the flesh already bored by worms. Such self-laceration is typical of Mediterranean Catholicism, with the ecstatic mortifications of its pagan heritage. The morally and sexually ambiguous smile of Donatello's David has a long subsequent history. It goes directly to Michelangelo's victory. After passing through Verrocchio to Leonardo, where it ends up on the Mona Lisa, finally, we see it on Bernini's androgynous angel, impishly piercing Saint Teresa. David's smile is dreamy and solipsistic. He is the beautiful boy as destroyer, triumphing over his admirers. He is Western armored ego as sex object, freestanding because separatist. Despite his beguiling insouciance, David's Apollonian hardness, mental and material, is evident when we compare him to Caravaggio's beautiful boys. Here, by the richness of oil paint, the Dionysian mouth intrudes on the Apollonian eye. Caravaggio's cardinal metaphor of fruit is written all over his street urchins inviting nudity. Subtly, despite ourselves, we salivate. In high classic, dignity, Donatello's David, unlike Caravaggio's bolder boys, does not meet our eyes. His sword keeps us at a distance. He has true, Apollonian iconicism. While entranced by his eroticism, we look up to him and leave him in his temenos of sacred beauty. Like Nefertiti, he is a hierarch of the Western eye. In my history of sexual personae, Botticelli is Donatello's heir. I see Donatello's androgynous David in every face in Botticelli. It is the same elaboration of a single face into a whole universe of sexual ambiguity and muted color tones that happens from Rossetti to Burne Jones. Botticelli turns Gothic's wavy slimness and height into sophisticated Apollonian linearity. He shares with Palaiuolo and Montegna the sharp Byzantine outline that, thanks to Donatello, survived Masaccio's new shadowed contours. Palaiuolo's anatomies are busy and strained, but Botticelli's, in his best work, have a high classic unity and repose. Even in the segmented Primavera, personality is in the foreground, literally and figuratively. Botticelli thinks in terms of sexual personae swelling with innate authority. I spoke of the descent of Byzantine icons, with their sharp edges in static frontality, from the Greek Koros. Botticelli resurrects the paganism in the Byzantine line. Inspired by Donatello's freestanding, David, he restores Apollonian iconicism to the painted figure. Botticelli's clarity of outline is the same armoring of Western personality we first saw in the enthroned pharaoh Chephren. The hardness of the Botticellian body is, I venture, a subliminally homosexual motif, like the closing off of female internality in Greek sculpture. It will become the panzerift or glazed armoring of mannerist figures in Pontormo and Bronzino. By deduction, therefore, 
Mannerist hardness is the ultimate result of Donatello's momentous step from marble to bronze, from stone armor to armed nudity. In The Birth of Venus, Botticelli reimagines a Chthonian goddess as Apollonian personality, fig. 20. She scuds to shore on a metallic scallop shell, the heraldic shield of woman's marine origins. On her face is the pensive smile of Donatello's dreamy David, and around her winds, as a heavy rope of strawberry blonde hair, the ruddy wish. Stream of Donatello's bleeding Goliath. The Birth of Venus, 13. Feet wide, is a pagan altarpiece. The goddess's monumentality and proud separatism come from sculpture. In this cultic epiphany, Venus dominates the eye, as she dominates the picture plane. She rises from the starburst shell, a trumpeting petrifaction of her splashing foam, to stand in Apollonian sunlight. She is sex and love washed clean of mystery and danger. The freshest of breezes skips across the scene, a dewy spume blown from the lips of a libidinous zephyr into a handmaiden's billowing cloak. The shallow composition is Byzantine, as is the sharpness of line. Botticelli's Venus is Kenneth Clark's crystalline Aphrodite. She is a springtime goddess, showered with flowers of mathematical articulation. There is no Chthonian tangle or brooding pregnancy in this nature. Every tendril and herb has a fine Apollonian identity. The sea itself has no murky depth. Botticelli's revised Venus is an Apollonian idea. Female secrecy and entrapment are abolished in her frank, yet decorous nudity, her perfect visibility. An air blown or aerated womanliness. Raphael takes this from Botticelli for his genial Galatea. I find it again in the modern Galatea. The Life magazine pinup of Rita Hayworth. 20. Sandro Botticelli. The Birth of Venus, 1485. The Birth of Venus is Botticelli's cinematic resolution of the unsettling sexual complexities of his Primavera, another large, imposing painting. Fig. 21. The Primavera is a black egg cracked, open by the birth of Venus. The transfer of tapestry design into paint in the Primavera produces a sinister claustrophobia unacknowledged by scholarship because of its enclosed space and atomized placement of figures. I classify the painting as decadent, the last gasp of Gothicism. The umbrella pine is Botticelli's favorite symbol of contracted omnipotent nature overhanging human thought. In the Primavera, the dark grove is an emanation of spring's bulging womb. At the picture's exact center, why do we not rejoice with the promise of fertility? We seem to be in elegy, not pastoral. The spindly trunks, ashy leaves, and metallic fruit belong to Dante. There is a sunless sky. We cannot reach. The trees are a spiritual stockade. The figures are separated by invisible barriers. Each is locked in an allegorical cell, oblivious to the others. Even the three dancing graces avert their eyes. Mercury turns his back on the whole scene, in superb indifference. He will pluck his own fruit, and of his own kind. This beautiful boy is Donatello's David two years later. Puberty is fleshing him out. His hat, like his attitude, is haughtier and more warlike like the grace's impenetrable female circle androgynous mercury is narcissistic and self-complete 21 sandro botticelli primavera 1478 across the way flora casts petals from her brimming self fecundated lap what of her strange face framed by cropped male hair after years of puzzling over my uffizi copy i realized botticelli has joined two faces together as in the dream sequence of Bergman's persona. One half belongs to a female aristocrat, cool, chaste, and self-possessed. The other belongs to a coarse gutter waif, roguish and lewd. Love for sale. Botticelli has condensed the extremes of sex and cast in an unsettling fusion of Renaissance personae. Flora, as much as Mercury, makes love to herself. The energies of the Primavera are boxed or, to use a term from English poetry, embowered. The zephyr, 
so freely blowing in the birth of Venus is caught in the trees here, his wings tangled and his stopped cheeks bursting. His impure thoughts dribble in leafy syllables from the lips of an anxious nymph. The allegory of the primavera, however it may be worked out, cannot explain away the picture's chilling atmospherics, its decadent precision of bleakness and elegance. Botticelli's pictures have mood. This was something new in the history of painting. I say it came from the sexual aura of Donatello's. David, the Apollonian corona which warns us away. Hausa speaks of Botticelli's effeminate melancholy. Eleven eroticized melancholy is everywhere in Botticelli, in angels, madonnas, saints, boys, nymphs. It is extruded as subtle tints of rose, sepia, gray, pale blue. Similar color values in Piero della Francesca do not have the same perverse effect. Why? Because Botticelli, unlike Piero, is a poet of sexual personae. Botticelli's personalities have a fixity and dreamy apartness. They offer themselves to the eye and yet rebuff our intimacy. Within their nervous carved lines, they have a heaviness or density of consciousness. Their dispassionate faces are like the barred backdrop of the primavera, a cultivated closure. Donatello and Botticelli's rediscovery of the Apollonian iconicism in Western personality comes to them as a homosexual conceptualization, as in Greek high classicism. The Apollonian borderline, I said, is a turning away and a shutting out. The sharp Botticellian line is part of the self definition of Renaissance personality its withdrawal from medieval Christianity and its reorientation in secular space. Botticelli's unity of tone is produced by his figures awakened yet entranced eyes. His personae, unreachable, contemplative, hover in a dream vision. They have the materiality of pagan pictorialism. Their pale smooth flesh glitters with the aristocracy of Apollonian beauty, an artistic dynasty founded in Egypt. This theatrical compounding of sexual personae with moody ambiance, sober and ascetic in Botticelli, is reproduced and darkened. By Leonardo da Vinci, Botticelli's subtle atmospherics are so transparent they are easy to miss. But in Leonardo a thundercloud of chiaroscuro is gathering. Leonardo, who melts the Apollonian line in shadow, is linked to Botticelli by the motif of an obsessively repeated face, used for both sexes. Leonardo and Michelangelo, solitary and depressive, created the persona of the artist as spiritual quester, as much a man of ideas as any philosopher. For both men, art, science, and construction were intellectual substitutes for sex, not sublimation but undisguised aggression, a hostile domination of nature. Their celibacy and ill temper were correlated, rational responses to our outrageous extension in these tyrannous bodies, branded with gender by Mother Nature. Leonardo dissected and anatomized the body to remove its female mysteries, unstringing muscles, detaching bones, even opening a womb to draw the huddled fetus. In his inventions, from flying machines to engines of war, the laws of dynamics were captured by the mathematical male mind. Michelangelo by titanic masculine athleticism, tried to hammer matter into servitude. After the breakup of the ordered medieval cosmos, both men turned anxiety into megalomania, a fanatical expansion of the will. But Leonardo painted little. Even his finished works had a self-destruct quotient, like the Last Supper, with its experimental technique, which made the paint almost immediately begin to peel off the refectory wall. 22. Leonardo da Vinci, Mona Lisa, 1503. Leonardo's Mona Lisa is the premier sexual persona of Western art. Fig. 22. She is the Renaissance Nefertiti, eternally watching. She is unnervingly placid. The most beautiful woman, making herself a perfect stillness, will always turn Gorgon. I spoke of the Mona Lisa as Leonardo's apotropion his household charm of warding off. She is an ambassador from primeval times, when earth was a desert, inhospitable to man. 
She presides over a landscape of raw rock and water. The distant river's snaky meander is the elusiveness of her cold, demonic heart. Her figure is a stable female delta, a perceptual pyramid topped with the mystic eye. But the background is deceptive and incoherent. The mismatched horizon lines, which one rarely notices at first, are subliminally disorienting. They are the unbalanced scales of an archetypal world without law or justice. Mona Lisa's famous smile is a thin mouth receding into shadow. Her expression, like her puffy eyes, is hooded. The egg-like head with its enormous, plucked brow seems to pillow on the abundant, self-embraced Italian bosom. What is Mona Lisa thinking? Nothing, of course. Her Blankness is her menace and our fear. She is Zeus, Leda, and Egg, rolled into one, another hermaphrodite deity pleasuring herself in mere being. Walter Pater is to call her a vampire, coasting through history on her secret tasks. Despite many satires, the Mona Lisa will remain the world's most famous painting. Supreme Western works of art, like Oedipus Rex and Hamlet, preserve their indeterminacy. Through all interpretation, they are morally ungraspable. Even the Venus de Milo gained everything by losing her arms. Mona Lisa looks through us and passively accepts our admiration as her due. Some say she is pregnant. If so, she radiates the solipsism of woman gloating over her own creation. The picture combines fleshy amplitude, emotional obliqueness, and earthly devastation. Leonardo has drawn. Mother Nature from Life, 23, Leonardo da Vinci, Virgin and Child with Saint Anne, 1508-10. In his major female paintings, Leonardo recloses the bright open space of the birth of Venus, the temporary reprieve Botticelli's Apollonian metric won against the entanglements of procreative nature. Leonardo's sfumato, or smokiness, is a Chthonian leakage, a spreading miasma. The Madonna of the Rocks, 1483-90, is backed by a looming cavern and a forest of ancient stalagmites, brute ziggurats, or phallic totems. The women of the Virgin and Child with Saint Anne totter at the edge of a stony cliff, harsh and barren, fig. 23. In the distance is a ghostly moonscape, like blasted Gothic cathedrals. These Peaceful scenes of mother and child have a Chthonian undertow, threatening to suck us back to Earth cult. Mona Lisa's ambiguous smile is a hieroglyph symbolizing the link between Leonardo's sexual personae and their enshrouding atmosphere, a strange light which is their own stormy inner weather. The same smile appears on Leda and both women of the Virgin with Saint Anne and even on two male figures, Saint John the Baptist and its twin Bacchus where smile and pointing finger turn seductive and depraved. So Leonardo's smile is androgynous, a sexual hex sign. It is beginning to bud on the lips of the gesturing angel of the Madonna of the Rocks, a male so feminine that students seeing the picture for the first time insist he is a woman. Freud traces the mysterious smile to Leonardo's buried memory of the lost biological mother preceding his adoptive mother, the two women of the Virgin with Saint Anne. Freud connects the painting to Leonardo's childhood dream of a bird of prey, the hermaphroditic Egyptian vulture goddess, Mutt. Meyer Shapiro rejects Freud's reasoning and claims the source of the Leonardo smile is in his master. Verrocchio, the grouping of the two women was traditional, says Shapiro their oddly close ages signifying the theological idealization of Anne as the double of her daughter Mary. Twelve but there is nothing sinister or disturbing in the gentle Verrocchio. I trace the smile all the way back through Botticelli to Donatello and find it amoral, solipsistic, and gender crossing from the start. Leonardo injected Verrocchio with his own perversity, one of his earliest works is the androgynous angel he painted as an apprentice in Verrocchio's Baptism of Christ, 1472. Freud rightly senses uncanniness in Leonardo's doubling of Saint Anne and the Virgin. Mary seems not so much sitting on Anne's lap as slipping off it. 
the figures are like photographic superimpositions. Two images seen simultaneously, eerie and hallucinatory. Yes, the women are doubles, just like Demeter and Persephone. Both Farnell and Fraser comment on Greek depictions of divine mother and daughter as twin sisters, their identity of substance, symbolizing the stages of vegetable growth. Point one three in Leonardo's charcoal cartoon. 1499, and finished panel, St. Anne's magnetic attentiveness to her. Companion seems menacingly or lasciviously intense. Anne's blocky, fist of a gesture in the cartoon turns into a mannish, piratical hand on. Hip in the painting, love in Leonardo is never normal. His mystic, doubling of Anne and Mary, their uncertain spatial placement and ambiguous smiles, and the bleached landscape give the painting an archetypal power found nowhere else in Renaissance art except in Michelangelo. Saint Anne and the Virgin are joined in autocratic nature. Rule. These divine twin sisters are one archaic personality that has parthenogenetically cloned itself. Life is an endless series of self replicating females. Leonardo reverses Genesis. So it is maleness, in the chubby infant Jesus, that is successive and subordinate to femaleness. But as the grotesque landscape shows, this is no celebration of female power. Like Michelangelo, Leonardo finds the condition of male servitude intolerable, and rightly so. I give the name, allegorical repletion, to the doubling of the Virgin. With Saint Anne, the term describes a redundant proliferation of homologous identities in a matrix of sexual ambiguity. Allegorical. Repletion is present in the Hymen episode ending Shakespeare's as you like it, in the incestuous mirroring of characters and family. Names of Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights, and in two surreal Rossetti. Paintings, Astarte Syriaca and the Bower Meadow, which contain ominously multiple versions of a single melancholy female face. Leonardo's suffocating doubling of figures in the Virgin with Saint Anne is another version of Mona Lisa's stolid, self-contained hermaphroditism. We now know what a pregnant Mona Lisa carries within her, her fetal twin. The theme of Leonardo's two paintings is the same, the male eye and psyche flooded by female power. Leonardo's neatest composition is The Last Supper, 1495-98. Is there a connection between the all male Passover party and the regular, rational mathematical design of the room, with its perspective lines converging behind Christ's head? Male space makes sense in Leonardo, but female space is crowded, murky, eccentric, destabilizing. Leonardo's paintings may be so few in number because the journey from idea to rectangular picture plane was beset with female demons science and engineering, then as now, are Apollonian havens from the vertigo of gender. Both Leonardo and Michelangelo are commonly classified as homosexual, but whatever sex they may have had was surely rare and anomalous. The monastic strain runs deep in the Italian temper. Freud observes that it is emotional attraction, not physical activity, which proves sexual orientation. In their private lives, Leonardo and Michelangelo were evidently interested only in male beauty. Of course, they had no real private lives apart from art and intellect. They were half-mad visionaries, as misanthropic as hermit saints. Their ritualistic cultism was a natural flowering of Mediterranean. Paganism, extremism, militancy, and hieraticism are always near at hand for the Italian Catholic. Leonardo and Michelangelo's Homosexuality was part of their angry quest for autonomy of imagination, against everyone and everything, parents, teachers, friends, rivals, society, nature, religion, God. The Western dynamic of conflict and combat is crystal clear in them. They have no Christian charity or generosity, only pagan hunger to conquer, surpass, subdue. By force, we too are their subjects. Their dominance demands our submission. The two geniuses of the High Renaissance remake art by making art aggressive. Homosexuality in Leonardo and Michelangelo.
was intellectual as well as erotic, in the Western way. It was a resistance to the grossest of human dependencies, our enslavement by nature. Why was Michelangelo so productive as an artist and Leonardo so frustrated? Michelangelo's total output was staggering, a virtuosity in sculpture, painting, and architecture unparalleled in the history of the arts. The vigor and vitality of the Renaissance flowed into him, as into Shakespeare. Why did Leonardo complete so little? My answer is that his technique and theme were at odds. Style and sexual personae sabotage each other. The smokiness of sfumato is Dionysian mistiness. The fog hanging over the Chthonian swamp. Decadent Euripides, we saw, uses Dionysian liquidity to destroy Apollonian Aeschylus. But, Leonardo is a high classicist, an archon of the mathematical mind. He wants to subdue Mother Nature, but in depicting her, he allows her to dictate his style. Sfumato is her game. The more he plays it, the less he can paint. Even the self dissolving Last Supper is infected by her. Michelangelo, on the other hand, an athlete stonecutter, began with sculpture and retained its Apollonian laws in painting, which the Pope forced on him in the Sistine Chapel. Oil painting and color, said Michelangelo, are for women and the lazy. His sharp edged Apollonian style is the only way to beat back Mother Nature. It is the hieratic signature of the Western will. This is why Leonardo's sketches and private notebooks, with their Apollonian penline, are so voluminous. But there is never a final victory in fighting nature. Michelangelo was locked into a pattern of endlessly renewed anxiety. Again and again and again. To the end of his long life, Michelangelo leapt from labor to labor, piling up the man mountain of his stunning achievement. He converted a quest for freedom into another. Enslavement, sweat stained, day blurring into night. His bequest is the most brilliant series of Apollonian images since Athens' revival of Egypt's royal glamour. Michelangelo's huge David, 1501 04, is companion to Mona Lisa in The Star Chart of Renaissance Sexual Personae. The original, removed in 1873 from the weather, is enshrined in a simple temple of pagan design. It is a true choros, Donatello's David as teenaged athlete, a sinewy boy man. We see him before action rather than after. He glares toward Goliath along a plane of the aggressive western eye. His body is half resolute, half apprehensive, the left leg shrinking away, but sending its energy into the handheld stone, about to rise to the slingshot. In its monumentality and armored hardness, David is an apotheosis of the male body as Apollonian perfection. The tension of male will has contracted the torso, so head and hand seem over large. This contraction is a sexual condensation, a homoerotic defeat of female murk and interiority. The David overwhelms the pilgrim, viewer by its blazing solar radiation, its defiant domination of space. The very air around it seems as impenetrable as the body itself. David, like Michelangelo, fends us off. The dreaminess of Donatello's charmer is gone. Michelangelo's David is awakened Western consciousness, studying the enemy in the cold, hostile light of Apollonian day. Michelangelo's obsessive theme is glorified maleness. Moses, 1513, 15, Hellenizes another biblical persona. It is an astonishing improvisation on pagan images. The rippling Belvedere torso swells. Moses's bulging biceps, the serpentine undulations of the just. Excavated Laocoon spill through the long beard, trapping Moses's index finger, his own halted motivation. Massed Greek draperies hang on the powerful leg like a shroud. The Hebraic lawgiver, letting slip the stone tablets, breaks his own code. Like David, he glares furiously. To the left, he sees the golden idol of his fickle people. But the artist raises Moses as a new idol, Zeus Jehovah, a theatrical amalgam of intellectual and physical force. Moses makes God in his own image. 
and Michelangelo creates as an entrancing father figure the one sexual persona more virile than he. The Moses's maleness is absolute. It drives femaleness out of existence. There are no mothers in this cosmos. Only monumental. Assyrian relief has such propagandistic machismo. We come to the limit of sexual representation. The female body can never attain such grandiosity of assertion. Moses is an idealization, but its exaggerations are of normal physical contours produced in men by male hormone. This definitive articulation and massiness of muscle and joint are unavailable to women except through auto medication with steroids. John Addington Simmons says that the superiority of male beauty consists in the complete organization of the body as the supreme instrument of vital energy. 14. I agree. When admiring the sleek body of a woman athlete, I see androgyny, not femaleness. I honor her. Capture of a male mode. Moses is specifically Western in its masculinity. Nothing in the art of other cultures resembles it in stature or abundant facial hair. Michelangelo's electrifying icon of the Hebrew iconoclast is a racist paradigm of Greek physical culture. The Apollonian, I said, is a Dorian and therefore Aryan aesthetic. Moses challenges modern liberal pieties on every front. It is beauty as power. Beyond ethics, Michelangelo's exaltation of maleness deforms his depiction of women. Like many Renaissance artists, he used male models for female figures, since a woman posing nude was scandalous. But from the evidence of his surviving drawings, Michelangelo never sketched any woman from life, dressed or not. Furthermore, the cross-sexual origin of his female figures has left a strong visual residue. The best examples are the sibyls of the Sistine Chapel ceiling. The early drawing for the Libyan sibyl is obviously of a male model, whose athletic physique survives in the final figure. The Delphic and Eritrean sibyls have startlingly heavy male arms. The old Cumian sibyl is one of the most fantastic sexual personae in art, fig. 24. She has grim wizened features yet bursting breasts, fat as pumpkins. Her lumbering shoulder and arm are brawny beyond human maleness. She is witch, hag, wet nurse. She is Michelangelo's Mona Lisa, mother. Nature in the flesh, old as time but teeming with coarse fertility. Cousins to the Sibyls are the reclining female nudes of the Medici. Chapel, 1520-34. Products of Michelangelo's Mannerist late phase. No one knows what these figures mean or even what they should be. Called, Anxious Dawn, lifting a listless hand, flexes her male bicep. Night bears a hammy haunch as she twists in restless half-sleep, her abdomen ridged like a washboard, fig. 25. The women's breasts are knobby protuberances stuck to male torsos. Clark calls them humiliating appendages. Fifteen nights choppy nipples are angry and puckered. Who would care to suck such sour pippins? Among Renaissance personae, Michelangelo's massive females, including Lita and the muscular Madonna of the Doni Tondo, belong to a sexual cabal. I classify them as viragos uniquely blending male and female. With Knight as my model, I define the virago as a fusion of great mother and Amazon, but without the fecundity of the former or free movement of the latter. Like Artemis, the Amazon has an adolescent body type, but the virago is large-breasted, sexually mature, her body heavy and inert. She is spiritually imprisoned and poisoned. Jean Duval Baudelaire's bisexual harlot muse, was such a sterile virago. Indolent and self-thwarting, Baudelaire in fact wrote a verse about Michelangelo's knight, the ideal. The virago is one of our darkest androgynes. The Medici chapel nudes, perched uncomfortably on their slippery, too small tombs, labor and bring forth nothing. Knight is a gorgon Mona Lisa who has devoured her own rocky landscape. The virago is self-enclosed, paralyzed, and dyspeptic. In art, monumentality or abstraction impersonalizes and therefore masculinizes women. 
This principle applies to Michelangelo, the Nefertiti bust, an Assyrian relief, with its beefy muscle bound. Goddesses. Michelangelo's women are not all androgynes. There is Winsome Eve peeking brightly from the crook of God's arm in the creation of man, and there is the pure, tranquil virgin of the Rome. Pieta. But in both cases, the female body is largely concealed. Eve in Mary's appealing femininity is made possible for Michelangelo by suppression of their bodies. Moreover, the women appear with two of his most magnificent male nudes, who absorb his imagination. Eve and Mary are handmaidens of a sublime but enervated masculinity, without which Michelangelo would never dream of bringing them into being. Adrian Stokes calls the Sistine God's flaring creature, packed cloak a uterine mantle. 16 So Eve is just a particle, subdivided from a hermaphrodite male deity, the medieval Madonna, Misericordia, tenting humanity beneath her wings, has been robbed of her garment by the aggressive Sistine God. 24 Michelangelo, Cumian Sibyl, 1508 to 12. 25 Michelangelo, Knight, 1525 to 31. Michelangelo's life work is an epic in which femininity plays little part. His lyric poetry resembles Shakespeare's sonnets in its dual inspiration. A beautiful boy, Tommaso Cavallari, and a potent woman. Vittoria Colonna, who combines the sexes. I cited, apropos of the Delphic Oracle, Michelangelo's salute to Colonna as, a man, a god. Rather, inside a woman. This makes mythologically intelligible his depiction of the Sibyls as half-male viragos. Michelangelo's late admiration for the pious Colonna, who took to a convent after her husband's death, has been misunderstood as romance by many commentators. She became one of Michelangelo's sexual personae, but she inspired no eroticism. She was a hermaphrodite muse, a voice of judgment appealing to his admiration for hierarchic force. She did not exist as a body. She was an invisible mother-father, hovering like the Sistine Sibyls midway between heaven and earth. Michelangelo, we have seen, invested his imaginative energies nearly exclusively in masculinity, but an occult rule of his art is that the masculine is in constant danger of melting into the feminine. Consider as a sexual persona the Medici Chapel's idealized portrait of Giuliano de Medici, Duke of Namur, Fig. 26. This statue repeats the pose of the awesome Moses, but it is hemmed in its narrow niche. In mannerist closure, the imprisonment of late phase art, Michelangelo packs Donatello's free male figure back into its Gothic pen. Despite its vigorous athleticism, the Giuliano has a wonderful half-female glamour. The neck supporting the Apollo Belvedere head is sinuous, swan-like, and feminine. The torso is suggestively explicit. First, the breasts are excessively developed for a male. Second, the torso is a brilliant fantasia on the queerest aesthetic, the molding of a Roman leather or bronze breastplate to the personal imprint of the chest. Vasari says of the Giuliano, the very buskins and cuirass seem not of this world. 17 The chest and abdominal muscles are fluent, tactile, sensual. Michelangelo so persuasively reproduces human skin. Folds on the cuirass's call like transparency that the metal shoulder clamps seem to be biting into living flesh. I always think of the nipple piercing pins in sadomasochistic sex shops. Surely this lurid motif has come to Michelangelo from the Capitoline bust of the Emperor Commodus draped in Hercules' lion skin, open jaws capping, his head and claws resting on his chest. But Michelangelo perversely sexualizes it. Unlike his pensive brother Lorenzo, sitting across the chapel in an ordinary cuirass, Giuliano is exquisitely autoerotic. Michelangelo likes to stress the male chest. Of examples like the mighty Christ of the Last Judgment, Clark speaks of that strange compulsion which made him thicken a torso till it is almost square. Almost a deformation. 18. Giuliano's chest has erotic delicacy and the intelligence and sensibility one normally expects of a face. 
John Pope. Hennessy says Michelangelo was deeply uninterested in portraiture. Point one nine. Michelangelo's only portrait, as Vasari exclaims, is of the beautiful Tommaso Cavallari. I propose that the luxurious chest of Giuliano de' Medici is the second of Michelangelo's homosexual portraits. It is analogous to the glossy buttocks of the Critios boy, which borrow artistic energy from the still, sober, high classic face. Giuliano's flesh piercing ornaments are subliminally sodomitic. They are an iron pen filling the blank page of the torso with flowing erotic script. The male torso is Michelangelo's landscape, the broad stage of human experience and action. Giuliano's mounded breasts are forbidden cities of the plain. 26. Michelangelo, Giuliano de' Medici, 1531-34. Giuliano de' Medici belongs to a category of Renaissance androgyne, separate from that of the beautiful boy. I call it, epicaine, or the man, of beauty, after Ben Jonson's transvestite play, epicaine, or the silent woman. The man of beauty has an active, athletic adult maleness. But, in insolent narcissism, he retains an aphebic transsexual quality, expressed in a feminine alabaster skin, here arising from the dazzling white marble. Three other examples of my epicaine category are George Villiers, First Duke of Buckingham, Lord Byron, and Elvis Presley, all dangerous men of notorious charisma. Gender in the Giuliano is barely held in balance by the male. Military regalia. The four-square male chest of resolute Western will is disordered by the serpentine disengagement of the curvy neck. A. Feminine masochism is beginning to encroach upon the statue. Through the limp flipped wrist and pierced breasts, the theme of masochistic sensuality is already present in the so-called dying slave, one of a series of captives for the uncompleted tomb of Julius II. Fig. 27. The huge statue, height 7 feet 6 and a half, is usually explained in Neoplatonic terms as a symbol of the soul's struggle against the body. But the theory leaves too much emotional overflow. Leg flexed, the languid dying slave poses like a beauty queen, voluptuously. Postorgasmic, the cross-sexual element comes partly from the statues. Greek models, both female, a wounded Niobid and the dying Amazon. With raised arm, the dying slave is a sexual reversal of Michelangelo's alertly masculine David, whose leg placement it parodies. A phantasmic band of cloth winds the eroticized chest, touched by dainty fingers of onanistic tenderness, a gesture borrowed from Donatello's early marble David, the combination of athletic male physique with female mood and body language is perverse. It turns the milder flaunting of Donatello's bronze David into decadent sexual cultism, an ecstasy of sadomasochistic bondage. The dying slave, backed by the lurking ape of bestial instinct, is a pagan crucifix. This is a gratified Saint Sebastian who has swallowed his tormentor's shafts. He drifts in his own perfect fantasy. When as a youngster I saw a picture of this statue. I was fascinated by its blatant eroticism, which scholarship, in its quick escape to allegory, studiously ignores. The Victory, 1532-34, is another of Michelangelo's provocative works of sexualized theater. A beautiful youth with cruelly blank. Donatello face crushes his knee upon a hogtied older man, whose bearded face resembles Michelangelo's is the defeated elder the old Adam of experience? Yawn. Sexual personae are the red flame of Renaissance imagination. Victory is a homage to Donatello's David, who treads the grizzled head of Goliath. In the psychic force field of the aggressive western eye, beauty dominates the observer. All dominating Michelangelo is undone and humiliated by his own homosexual eye. The beautiful boy with his beckoning feminine hand, is an angel vampire leaping up with Michelangelo's repressed energy, the burden of his jailed self. I cannot be convinced that great artists are moralists. Art is first appearances, then meaning. The dying, slave and victory, 
as well as the 20 exhibitionistically self-twining. Ignudi are nude hues of the Sistine ceiling, are complex pagan sex. Objects. These works resemble Spencer's Fairy Queen in the way that moral allegory has wandered into prurient sexual naturalism. 27. Michelangelo. Dying Slave. 1513-16. Michelangelo's primary principle is the quest for Apollonian form. His figures must exert enormous pressure to keep their shape. R. And the artist's eye must remain vigilant and aggressive. The dialectic between definitiveness and dissolution is evident as early as Bacchus, 1497, androgynous and seductive, in Robert Liebert's phrase. Michelangelo's boyish wine god careens unsteadily, offering us his lifted cup.20, but the seduction is more than sexual. Major Western sculpture, I said, is Apollonian. Therefore Bacchus staggering is Apollonian form seduced by the Chthonian, deliquescing. Mother, Earth calls. Michelangelo never has to use Bacchus overtly again, since his figures artistically assimilate the Dionysian theme. Clark, speaks of, a feeling of, thundery oppression, in Michelangelo's torsos. Stokes sees in the sculpture and painting, a state of uneasy passivity known to us in terms of an oppressive weight. 21 What is it that oppresses Michelangelo's figures? His terribilita, awesomeness, or fearfulness, is the malign gravitation of Mother Nature, who dissolves all forms in her cycle of change and remaking. The Apollonian line asserts the identity of objects. Sculptural contour is so emphatic in Michelangelo because of the danger of feminine surrender to nature. Like Greek artists indifferent to landscape, Michelangelo makes the male figure the field of combat. His resistance to nature is like William Blake's. Both men are obsessed with the dream of a world generated and sustained by masculinity alone. To materialize that world, the choleric Michelangelo drove himself with remorseless athleticism, a hyperbolic titanism. But a wholly masculine cosmos is untenable. It cannot last even when erected by a genius. Consequently, Michelangelo's male figures are exhausted with their effort and helplessly infected by femininity, which shimmies upward from a spiritually opaque gravitational center. The pornographic fluorescence of the dying slave comes from its woollessness, its sensually engorged surrender. The ruggedly masculine Michelangelo, like Ernest Hemingway, required rituals of male inflation to fight off the lure of transsexual submission. Mother Nature turns us all to eunuchs. Nearly everything in Michelangelo has some sexually disturbing undercurrent. Effeminates cavort behind the holy family of the Doni. Tondo. Pagan desire escaping Christian control. The Sistine Ignudi. Seem like castrates. Ritually tormented initiates of an unknown cult. Even the great Pietà. Surely partly inspired by Botticelli's Venus and Mars, is a tableau of female immortality and perishable manhood. In archetypal terms, has the Holy Mother not drained her son? Morbid as a the Pietà's softness or delicacy of modeling, also means effeminacy in Italian. Perhaps the Medici Chapel nudes are less masculine women than men being transformed, as in a nightmare, into women. Michelangelo's sexual ambiguities are apotropaic formulas, repeating what is feared in order to drive it off. Intransigent Michelangelo is the best example of the Western aesthetic of perceptual control. The art object, in its Apollonian unity and clarity, is a protest against the too muchness of nature. Late in Michelangelo's career, the multiplicity of objects rebounds, breaking back into the Mannerist Last Judgment, 1536-41, and filling it with a dithery mass of churning bodies. But by this point the artist is starting to flag in his Apollonian enterprise, turning, like Donatello and Botticelli, back to the church, he portrays himself as a shapeless, flayed skin in St. Bartholomew's grasp and leaves his mammoth, figures half buried in stone. Apollonian form deflates or aborts. Matter has won. Renaissance Apollonianism originated in Florence and spread to Rome. 
its emphatic sharp edge, descending through. Byzantine style from the Greek Koros, was initially a homosexual idea, a line drawn against female nature. It then passed into general artistic usage and lost its secret polemicism. Florentine intellectuality and Florentine homosexuality were linked phenomena. Beautiful boys, everywhere in Florentine art, rarely appear in Venetian painting, which is full of luscious female nudes. Mercantile Venice did not seethe with philosophers and crackpots, like Florence. In art, fleshy Venetian women, half oriental odalisques, relax in cordial landscapes, a far cry from Leonardo's abandoned rock quarries. Venetian personae and Venetian landscape are equally heterosexual. Venice's appreciation of female beauty allowed acceptance of rather than resistance toward nature. Was this not the result of the city's unique physical character? Venice, veined by water, is in placid relation to marine nature, its people and artists imaginatively internalized female fluidity, the prime Chthonian principle. The Renaissance city of art, a triumph of architectural ingenuity, was its own balance of Apollonian and Dionysian and did not need to explore these ideas in painting. That balance was eventually disrupted by the ubiquity and omnipotence of Venetian water. The city rotted, flooded, and began to sink. Man records its modern degeneration in death in Venice. Hard-bodied boy form is implicit in Florentine aesthetics. It surely influenced the Florentine female nude, like Botticelli's Venus, with her small breasts and tall, slim build. Procreativeness was neither a Florentine nor an Athenian value. The luxuriance savored by Venice in female curves was projected by Florentine artists into men's flowing hair, one of the most mesmerizing themes of Renaissance art. Like Michelangelo's muscle man Moses, this is a natively Western mode. Only Caucasians, a motley blend of ethnic types, have such a variety of hair colors and consistencies. Portrait art has made European hair a gorgeous palette of sexual personae. In the Renaissance as now, a pretty boy with a long, fine head of hair has a drop-dead androgynous allure. All those dashing Italian Renaissance angels are crowned with pagan physicality. Raphael of Urbino, youngest of the three high Renaissance geniuses, diverted Florence's homoerotic glamour back toward the procreative female. He created the Christmas card persona of the warm Madonna, a simple peasant girl of open face and arms. Raphael was heavily influenced by Leonardo and Michelangelo, who enabled him to break from his master Perugino, with his spare, bland, small, figured Northern European style. But Raphael takes the sexual ambiguity and psychological conflict out of Leonardo and Michelangelo. He does to them what Keats does to Coleridge, sweetening and purifying the demonic, making the maternal a blessing rather than a curse. Raphael subtly corrects his teachers. His matchless glow of color, a half-liquid envelope of feminine emotion, is a clarification of Leonardo's lowering atmosphere. From the surviving portraits and self-portraits of all three artists, Raphael seems the most feminine in manner and appearance. His turn toward woman prefigures the sexual shift of late Renaissance art. In mannerism and Baroque, as in Hellenistic art, the sexes repolarize. Cellini's Perseus, with whom we began, holds his scimitar at crotch level to punctuate his victory over the femme fatale, whose dripping head he brandishes aloft. Bernini's David, a self-portrait, is stoutly masculine and in mad motion. The androgyny and Apollonian, a partness of the first Renaissance Davids have been redefined in late phase terms. Bernini's Apollo pursues a nymph melting into a bristling tree. Metamorphosis is the Dionysian principle of Baroque illusionism. Bernini even stations four giant, undulating, brazen pagan serpents to hold up the canopy over the main altar of Christendom, the supreme Baroque work his Saint Teresa in Ecstasy, a sex parody of Renaissance Annunciations, makes the arm androgyne merely a titillating boudoir provocateur. The orgasmic, 
Victim is in full sail on a Dionysian cloud. Woman, with all her vibrating internality, takes center stage. 6. Spencer and Apollo. The Fairy Queen. English literature is one of the supreme constructions in the history of art. It is both music and philosophy, a sensory stream of thought feeding each generation of writers from the Middle Ages to modernism. English literary distinction begins in the Renaissance and is the creation of one man, Edmund Spencer. His epic poem, The Fairy Queen, 1590-1596, does for the English Renaissance what painting and sculpture did for the Italian. Spencer as Botticelli's heir, by his intuitive grasp of the hard-edged Apollonian line, Spencer puts English literature into the ancient dynasty of Western sexual personae. The arts, except for portraiture, were weak in the English Renaissance, partly because of Henry VIII's destruction of Catholic images. Spencer recreates English pictorialism in poetic form. His influence upon later writers, beginning with Shakespeare, was incalculable. It was through Spencer's quarrel with himself that English literature gained its amazing complexity. Romantic poetries, Chthonian demonism, for example, is a flowering of the secret. Repressions of the Fairy Queen. We will see it pass from Coleridge to Poe to Baudelaire and beyond. Spencer invented the artistic vocabulary of English poetry, which he turned into a meditation on nature and society, on sex, art, and power. At the moment, the Fairy Queen is a great beached whale, marooned on the desert shores of English departments. Spencer is a hostage of his own critics, who have thrown up a thicket of unreadable commentary around him. Renaissance studies are woefully over-specialized. A lurid era has been reduced to a jumble of multilingual footnotes. Efforts to draw different arts or nations into one frame of reference are resisted. Even Spencer and Shakespeare are rarely discussed together. The Fairy Queen has been ruined for many students by the numbingly moralistic way it is taught. Spencer spoke to other poets as a bard, not a preacher. And when bards summon the muse, they themselves may not always know what they speak. Scholars begin English literature with Chaucer and list Spencer as his disciple. But English literature would have remained merely national if it had really followed Chaucer. I would argue that Spencer made English literature world-class only by abandoning Chaucer and eradicating his influence. There is a huge shift of style between the Chaucerian Shepherd's Calendar, 1579, which made Spencer's name, and the Fairy Queen, begun the same year. Pastoral eclogue was a pagan genre, adopted by Apprentice Virgil, but the Shepherd's Calendar is medieval Christian in tone and detail. Through his friendship with Sir Philip Sidney, an advocate of Castiglione's aristocratic ideals, and through his devotion to the Queen, to whom he dedicated the Fairy Queen, Spencer rewoke the mystic hieraticism of power latent in Western sexual personae. The mass glorification of Elizabeth I revived the radiant laws of Apollonian beauty. Her portraits are Byzantine icons, stiffly ceremonial and encrusted with jewels. I spoke of the origins of Botticelli's hard edge in Byzantine art and Donatello's sculpture. We know Spencer was familiar with some Botticelli, that he modeled a major sex scene in The Fairy Queen on Botticelli's Venus and Mars, was one of the earliest observations of Spencer criticism. Copies of Italian art came to England largely in the form of engravings, a new technique that would intensify hard Apollonian contours and add them even when absent in the original. The Fairy Queen has an Apollonian brilliance found nowhere in Spencer's medieval or Renaissance sources, including Ariosto, who lacks his asperity and iconicism, his concentration and hard edge. The Fairy Queen turns to pagan style to defeat Christian Chaucer. My theory of comedy puts Oscar Wilde in the same hottie. Apollonian line as Spencer. Chaucer's comic persona resembles that of Charlie Chaplin's Little Tramp, whom I seem to be alone in loathing. Chaucer's humanism is predicated on the common man, on our 
shared foibles and frailties, our daily muddle. He absolves his admirers of guilt. There is no fear and trembling in his theology. Chaucer's conviviality is full of winks, chuckles, and nudges. The hearty warmth of it all makes my skin crawl. Chaucer as a populist, while Spencer as a hierarchist. The Fairy Queen, like Wilde's The Importance of Being Earnest, is aristocratic in form and content. Chaucer, and here is his continuing appeal, accepts the flesh. But the Apollonian resists nature by its hostile eye drawn line. For me, reading Chaucer is like fighting through cattails while being worried. By midges, there are too many words, gothic flutters and curlicues. Portraiture in the Canterbury Tales has a scratchy, rustling detail. Coming, like Northern European painting, from manuscript. Illumination. In Greco-Roman terms, it is a coy, labored style. Wise. Chaucer, putting roses in the cheeks of medieval asceticism, opposes absolutism and extremism in all things. But the idealizing Apollonian mode is absolutist and extremist from the first architectural overstatements of Old Kingdom Egypt. Western greatness is unwise, mad, inhuman. Revolutionary Spencer puts the eye into English poetry. Horace's theory that a poem should be like a picture was much discussed in the Renaissance, but Spencer goes far beyond this. Image. A.C. Hamilton rightly insists, is as crucial as allegory. Point one: the aggressive eye is the conceptualizing power of the fairy queen and the master of its largest ideas. Spencer as history's first theorist of aggression, anticipating Hobbes, Sade, Darwin, Nietzsche, and Freud. Only Leonardo and Michelangelo before him had struggled with the moral problem of the awakened eye. Spencer's pagan eye burns cozy. Chaucer right out of English poetry. Not since Homer had there been. So cinematic a poet. Spencer's long blazing sightlines prefigure the epic sweep of film and the probing light beam of the projector. The opening up of secular space in Italian painting through perspective is paralleled in the vast distances of the fairy queen. Spencer's typical moment is the glancing of light off the armor of a faraway knight. Who or what is it? We never hear a name until the scene is nearly over. Spencer, as much as Donatello, understands the meaning of medieval armor as a vehicle of Western pagan identity. Spencer as an Apollonian thingmaker in the tradition linking stony pharaoh. Chefren to modern metal cans and cars. Personality in Spencer as armored, an artifact of aggressive forging. The theme of the Fairy Queen is the same one I found in Michelangelo. A conflict between definitiveness and dissolution of self. In the Renaissance, sex has a dangerous freedom. That barbaric power consigned to the medieval hell now waits in every glade. Return to its old place in nature. The Western Eye creator of the sharp boundaries of selfhood, is sucked into woollessness by the lure of sensual beauty. To preserve its autonomy, the Spencerian eye suspends itself in voyeurism, a tactic of defense that turns into perversion. Judaism had avoided this dilemma by elevating the word and banishing the eye. But Christianity, assimilating pagan art, was divided against itself from the moment it left Palestine. Spencer's profound study of the amoral dynamics of the Western eye makes the Fairy Queen the supreme work of Renaissance literature until Hamlet, which uses Spencerian voyeurism in virtually every scene. The Apollonian line to which the Fairy Queen belongs began in Egypt and Greece and passes through Donatello, Botticelli, Michelangelo, Blake, and Shelley to the pre Raphaelite painters and Oscar Wilde. It then reappears in cinema, which was implicit in Western art and thought from the start. The Fairy Queen makes cinema out of the West's primary principle. To see is to know, to know is to control. The Spencerian eye cuts, wounds, rapes. Since Vasari, artists have been divided into draftsmen and colorists, practitioners of Wolfland's painterly style. The argument flares in the 19th century when Blake rejects chiaroscuro as mud and when rough-brushed Delacroix opposes clean-lined Angra. 
Spencer uses the incising droughtsman's pen. Direct contact with Botticelli was unnecessary, since the Apollonian style was latent in medieval armor, in which Spencer clothes so many characters. Spencerian armor as Western personality imagined as discreet and indissoluble, cohesive and luminous. The sex and glamour of the armor infatuated Fairy Queen, separate it from a more faithfully Protestant work like its descendant, Pilgrim's Progress, 1678. Upstairs, downstairs, Bunyan's Kitchen. Spencer returns allegory to its legible medieval form, as in the morality plays. Pilgrim's Progress makes a charmingly direct path between simple image and simple message, which the Bible allows us to decode. But in the tricky fairy queen, Protestant individualism has been usurped by a pagan aesthetic. In Spencer, as nowhere in Bunyan, we constantly contemplate the ritual visibility of fabricated personality, a Greco-Roman idea, armor as the Spencerian language, of moral beauty, signifying Apollonian finitude and self-containment. Spencer's questing knights, isolated against empty panoramas, replay Apollo's hostility to nature. The West has always made Apollonian art objects out of arms of war, fig. 28. The Bronze. Carapace of Homer's heroes is a male exoskeleton, the hardness of Western will, a theme to return in a discussion of American football in my next book, in Odysseus Ithaca. Weapons are kept on display in the banquet hall, in the Middle Ages, a shield hung on the wall, as a painting would be in the Renaissance, was a badge of clan identity. The heraldic crest is another Egyptian cartouche, a privileged sacred space. Western culture has always been obsessed with severe burnished surfaces. The elegant Corinthian Greek war helmet, for example, with its flat cheek guards and keyhole eyes, is an eerie super self, smooth as a staring skull, fig. 29. Eastern armor, in contrast, is squat, sinuous, and bushy. Asian art is based on the female curve, not the rigid male line. Eastern armor uses organic shapes, while Western armor insists on technological insulation from nature. The Western soldier is a steely marching machine. The Japanese samurai is bristly and rotund. His armor seems pregnant, overgrown by vegetation. He is half camouflaged, relapsing into female nature, like the fairy. Queen's leafy knight art eagle, who is in a spiritually unreconstructed condition. 28. Homogeneous tilting armor. German, 1580. Maker. Anton Pfeffenhauser, Augsburg. Compare the imperial tombs of Egypt and China. The pharaohs. Mummiform granite sarcophagi or tuts fitted gold coffins are heavy and solid, fused from head to foot. But the gleaming jade burial suits of Han princes are faceted and stitched like fish scales. Western. Apollonianism is ungiving, impermeable, adamantine. It is an aesthetic of closure. Donald Keane says Japanese sentences trail off into thin smoke, a vapor of hanging participles. Point two, in other words, Japanese sentences avoid closure. Even the sword blade in the West, a harsh phallic totem, is given an interior by Japanese connoisseurs who project poetic landscapes into its hundred folded layers. Western armor as separatist, dividing self from self and self from nature. Spencer's armor as the symbol of Apollonian externality, of strife and solar wakefulness. It ensures permanent visibility, personae hardened, against their own sexual impulses. In the Fairy Queen, nature lurks everywhere with her seductive dissolutions of surrender and repose. 29. Greek helmet, Corinthian type late 7th to early 6th centuries BC border of wave pattern. Arms and armor in the fairy queen symbolize male fortitude and self-assertion. We expect these qualities from heroes. But Spencer extends them to heroines in a way that speaks directly to our time. His armed Amazons, Belphoebe and Britomart, are among the most potent women in literature. Spencer removes the usual archetypal basis of female force, the demonic, and imagines his heroines as 
Apollonian angels. This had not been done since Greek Artemis. Spencer creates the new Renaissance cult of married love. As C.S. Lewis observes, Spencer's romance of marriage replaces the romance of adultery of medieval courtly love. Point three before the Renaissance, poets sang of their mistresses but not of their wives. Marriage was a utilitarian affair, having nothing to do with art. Elizabeth, the Virgin Queen, was urged to marry throughout her reign, to ensure a peaceful succession. The Fairy Queen moves toward marriage but never reaches it. The poem is a mere fragment of Spencer's ambitious plan. The female knight Britomart is to wed Artigle and start the dynasty leading to Elizabeth and England's greatness. Britomart's maternal destiny introduces an image foreign to the Renaissance as a whole. A benevolent great mother, whom Spencer calls Great Dame Nature. We saw how the androgynes of Italian art are usually beautiful boys and how dominatrixes, like Leonardo's Mona Lisa or Michelangelo's Knight, tend to be sinister or sterile. In Shakespeare too, with his staggering range of sexual personae, references to creative Chthonian females are rare. Spencer's attraction to the Great Mother is anomalous. He exalts her, where Cellini, decorating Perseus' pedestal with Ephesian Artemis, defeats her. Britomart reverses Artemis' evolution. She begins as the adolescent, Apollonian androgyne and ends as the primeval mother goddess. Spencer's great mother, like her ancient precursors, is always double. Sext. In Venus's temple, the idol, serpent twined like Roman statues. Evadergatus or Dia Syria, exhibits the genitalia of both sexes. She is, both male and female, sire and mother, begetting and conceiving. By herself alone, IV. By.41.4. Spencer's recasting of sexual mythology as daring, original, and perhaps unsupportable. The grandest epic quest of the fairy queen is his own. He wants to cleanse the procreative of its demonic taint. Spencer's Renaissance ideal of marriage cooperates with genre in his two famous epithalamia, but now in epic, with its more aggressive sexual personae, nature is not so easily contained. The fairy queen tries to repair splits in Spencer's own imagination. It tries to turn the foul cup of the whore of Babylon into a holy grail. Spencer's most militant instrument of Apollonian definition is chastity, a self-armoring of personality. Saint Augustine calls continence, unity of self. Five virtue in the fairy queen means holding to one's visible shape. In the human realm, formlessness or wanton. Metamorphosis is amoral. Only evil characters, Archimago, Duessa, Guile, Proteus, change shape. The heroic Prince Arthur can transform other things but never alters himself. Hybrid beings, part dog, fox, dragon, hag, are always bad. This is the reason, I think, that Spencer was troubled by the five hermaphrodite stanzas, which he mysteriously dropped from the poem after its first edition. Amoret and Sir Scudamore, embracing, melt into one another until they seem a Roman hermaphrodite statue. Spencer may have cancelled these stanzas because they violate his own Apollonian laws, trespassing the boundaries of form. In The Fairy Queen, mutilation is horrific. Words like misshapen and deformity recur. The human form is paradigmatic, as in the anatomical architecture of the House of Temperance. 2. X. Belphoebe and Britomart personified chastity, express their radical autonomy in a blaze of self-generated light, the same light that pours from the Olympian gods as patrons of aristocratic order, the body in Spencer as a social integer. Apollonian, illumination and integrity of form are art, politics, and morality all in. 1. Clarity of eye is purity of being. The Elizabeth-inspired Amazons, Belphoebe and Britomart, are the greatest sexual personae of the fairy queen. They flood the verse with a strange golden light. St. Thomas Aquinas makes brightness or clarity a prime quality of beauty. Point six Iliadi says of Vishnu, mystically 
perfect beings are radiant. Seven Burkhart remarks that blonde was the ideal hair color of the Italian Renaissance. But Spencerian blondness is a moral, not a cosmetic principle. Belphoebe and Britomart's heraldic blondness is analogous to their upper class, hermaphroditism. Dorian and authoritarian Apollo, I said, is ice. Blonde. Belphoebe's Apollonian blondness is a transparency, hard and clear. The whole fairy queen is a world of glass, a construct of visionary materialism. 3. E.19. Light seems to penetrate blonde forms, so they seem midway between matter and spirit. Saint Gregory the Great, seeing fair haired British boy slaves in Rome, exclaimed, They are not angles but angels, non angli said Angeli. In body type, Belphoebe and Britomart are the crystalline Aphrodite, like Botticelli's Venus. All angels are ectomorphic, Spencer's female angels, suppressing the maternal silhouette, approach the sexually indeterminate. The blondness of his heroines is a prism through which light is intensified and projected. The radiance of the Olympian gods as objects d'art is identical to the glamour of Hollywood publicity in which Kenneth Burke sees a hierarchic motive. Eight movie stars of the 30s and 40s, photographed in halos of shimmering light, had Spencerian glamour. They were aristocrats of a dark era of economic chaos and war. The camera's idealizing eye gave them Apollonian power and perfection. The Amazons of the Fairy Queen shed light because they, too, are produced by an instinct for hierarchy. This poem, like most English Renaissance literature, is inspired by a reverence for social order. Spencer and Shakespeare star beautiful female androgynes in their galaxy of personae. Here the English Renaissance strongly departs from the Italian. There were willful educated women like Caterina, Sforza and Isabella d'Est, but they were not the focus of Italian imagination. Perusing the stunning Italian portraits crammed into museums and palazzi, one is struck by the disparity between male and female representation. Italian men and boys are vivacious, ravishing, but the women seem placid, stolid, even stupid. The Feminine conventions of shaved eyebrows and bulbous forehead don't help. The divergence is extreme in double-facing portraits like Piero della Francesca's of the Duke and Duchess of Urbino or Raphael's of Angelo and Maddalena Doni. The men are fully developed personalities, while their wives seem static and bland. Not only could respectable women not pose at leisure, but there was the platina effect. A lady confines herself to one persona. Decorum means expressionlessness. Spencer and Shakespeare throw all this out the window. They love imperious, volatile women. England was governed by a charismatic spinster who boxed the ears of her nobles and bashed ale flagons into tabletops. Her chief minister, Lord Burghley, said the queen was more than a man and, in truth, sometimes less than a woman. Not until Mannerism do aggressive real life women finally make it into Italian art. Bronzino, for example, captures the mannish profile of poetess Laura Battiferi, whom he calls, punning on her name, all iron. Within, ice without. As for England, appreciation of fierce females did not survive the Renaissance, thanks to the upsurge of Puritanism. Early 18th century portraits of noblewomen are as frigid and formulaic as those of the Italian Renaissance. But Amazons were too. Stage a comeback in the Augustan Salon, as we know from the rape of the lock. So the liberated woman is the symbol of the English Renaissance, as the beautiful boy is the symbol of the Italian. In the Fairy Queen, we see her in free movement. I speak, of course, of artistic projection, and not of the life of real British women. But art is what transcends and survives. Of all truths, it is the finest. Belphoebe bursts into the fairy queen like a divine epiphany. Spencer gives her one of the most dazzling theatrical entrances in art. Narrative action stops dead, while ten long stanzas minutely describe her appearance. The Apollonian eye is locked in place, 
it is a privileged moment of hieratic stillness and silence, as if a frame of film were frozen before us. Belphoebe, a huntress and solitary forest dweller, recalls Venus, disguised as Diana in the Aeneid. She resembles Penthesilea, queen of Amazons. She carries a sharp boar spear and a bow and quiver, stuffed with steel headed darts. Her face is the heavenly portrait of a bright angel, rose red and lily white. She has an ivory brow. Her eyes dart, fiery beams, full of dread majesty, that quell lust. Her long, loose yellow hair, crisped like golden wire, is lifted by the wind and flecked with falling flowers, which suggests Spencer had also seen copies of Botticelli's Primavera or Birth of Venus or both. Belphoebe wears a pleated white silk tunic, sprinkled with golden ornaments like twinkling stars. Her skirt has a gold fringe. Her gilt buskins are decorated with gold, enamel, and jewels. Her legs are like marble pillars, supporting the Temple of the Gods, 2.ie.21-31. Belphoebe seems like a work of sculpture embedded in the text. Spencer's lavish description far longer than anything in Boyardo, Ariosto, or Tasso, has the stylization and high specificity of a Byzantine icon. Belphoebe is the Byzantine Elizabeth, but she also has a high classic symmetry and mass, a mathematical measure. With her white and gold Amazonian splendor, she is like the Chryselephantine, Colossus of Athena in the Parthenon. Every detail and edge is deeply incised because Spencerian personality must be forcibly carved out of obdurate nature and defended against the erosion and lassitude of fatigue or hedonism. The intricacies of Belphoebe's golden hair and costume correspond to the categories and subsets of the great chain of being, ascending Apollonian order. Belphoebe's hypervisibility is our own Apollonian consciousness, our aggressive pagan eye. She is a masterpiece of Western objectification, the sex object that leaps from the brain and repels all touch. Belphoebe appears and disappears, like a dream vision. Not till a full book later does Spencer disclose her birth and education. In book 2, she is formal and abstract, a sudden manifestation of hierarchic power. With her grace, dignity, and arete, she may be a living illustration of the golden mean the parable of Medina and her sisters. In the prior canto, Belphoebe mediates between the extremes of art and nature, masculinity and femininity. Her name means, beautiful. Diana, she carries, deadly tools, her male weapons, 2.ie.37. We, usually see her caught up in bloodlust, fast on the red trail of fleeing. Prey, a woman of, heroic mind, she intimidates by her monomania, evasion of physical contact, and want of ordinary, homely emotion. Discovering the injured Timias, she is touched for the first time by pity, soft passion and unwanted smart. 3. V.55. 30. Even binding his wounds, she remains austere and remote. She is impenetrable, like the frosty, unknowable Garbo, in whom Roland Bart sees an archetypal impersonality. Belphoebe's chastity is a form of hierarchic sequestration. Proclus says, the peculiarity of purity is to keep more excellent natures, exempt from such as are subordinate. 9. The Apollonian universe of domination and submission permits no emotional involvement. Cold and self-complete, the Apollonian androgyne is isolated behind a wall of silence or muteness. I find this narcissistic phenomenon in the Greek beautiful boy, man's enigmatic Tadzio, and Melville's stammering Billy Bud. Compare Belphoebe's odd habit of dashing off in the middle of sentences. Exaltation of the Apollonian mode in the Fairy Queen tends to make the virtuous characters somewhat slow. Witted, Belphoebe, for example, is given to rather dull speeches. Eloquence belongs to evil characters, like seductively musical despair. I X.38 to 47. Spencer invented the word, blatant, meaning talk as noisy babbling. In the first canto, 
the pictorial fairy queen vomits. Its own words. Belphoebe's later adventures with Timia show her. Naturalistically. She has a reduced power, unlike the glory of her. Presence at first entrance. Spencer no longer shows Apollonian. Radiance emanating from her because, with the advent of pity into her heart, Belphoebe has forfeited her Amazonian autonomy. She descends to the realm of human hurts from the empty zone of her Olympian mind. Self-sequestered Belphoebe stands apart from the main action of the Fairy Queen, but her Apollonian peer, Britomart, is one of the central protagonists, with a whole book and more devoted to her. She is chastity with an enchanted spear, the poem's only invincible knight. We first see her through the hostile eyes of Prince Arthur and Guyan, who think her a man. They see her as a mirror image of themselves, a warrior in full armor. During the ensuing skirmish, Spencer calls Britomart, he, deceiving us as well. Then he reveals her sex to us in an aside and switches to she for the rest of the joust, which we now watch with quickened attention. 3. I. He uses this transsexual trick of perspective twice more, when Britomart approaches Malbeco's house and when she challenges and defeats Ardigal. 3. X.12. IV. IV.43. Spencer's sleight of hand with grammatical gender, like his withholding of characters' names, seems to be part of his prescient insight into the problematic nature of perception and identity. Trouncing the poem's leading men, Britomart is a paragon of knightly prowess. Spencer summarizes her double sexual nature, for she was full of amiable grace and manly terror mixed. There with all, 3. I.46. She inspires both love and fear, appealing to the eye but subduing the spirit. This is a pagan synthesis. Like Belphoebe, Britomart throws off a dazzling angel light. We see her, only when she disarms, a sudden revelation the more overwhelming. Her golden locks, falling to her heels, are, like sunny beams. Bursting from a cloud, golden gleams, shooting, azure streams. Through the air, 3. X.20. Later, doffing her, blistering helmet, she, lets her golden hair fall, like a silken veil, about her body. It is like. The shining sky in summer's night, the day's scorching heat, now crested all with lines of fiery light, that it prodigious seemies in common people's sight. IV. I.13. Britomart as Apollonian, supernature, moon and sun, cold and hot. She is virgin and lion. Summertime constellations shot with sparkling meteor showers. People look up and marvel, but they are seeing Babylonian and not. Christian gods. This kind of glittering feminine beauty in Spencer always has a masculine component. Tasso's Amazon, the warrior Clorinda, never gives off the Apollonian light of the fairy queen, but there are precedents for the above passages in Ariosto. What Spencer adds to Ariosto is the quality of strangeness, of uncanny hierarchical excitation. Spencer senses the conceptualism and hieraticism in the aggressive western eye. He pushes vision into forbidden celestial space. Seraphic light unnerves and paralyzes the mortal viewer. Lascivious Malacasta, stealing upon sleeping Britomart, shrieks in fear. Her household finds her swooning at the feet of the wrathful knight. They saw the warlike maid, all in her snow-white smock, with locks unboned, threading the point of her avenging blade. Wherewith enraged she fiercely at them flew, and with her flaming sword about her laid. 3. I.63, 66. Britomart, affronted chastity, is a pillar of fire. She is the archangel at Eden's gate, driving off sin from her wholly sequestered self, a virgin. Circle. Belphoebe similarly recoils from the lustful advances of Braggadocchio, a Chaucerian lunk, with that she swarving back her javelin bright, against him bent, and fiercely did menace. 2.ie.42. Spencer's female androgynes of Apollonian radiance assert 
their self-preserving masculine will by explosive extrusions of phallic projectiles. These javelins, swords, and darts are contained in Western light. They are solar beams, killing glances of our omnipotent eye. Britomart is motherless, like Athena, Atalanta, and Camilla. We hear only of a royal father and an old nurse, Glaus. There is a peculiarly physical scene between Britomart and the nurse, who revives her from lovesickness caused by a glimpse of her future. Betrothed in a crystal ball, Glaus rubs her charge all over the body and kisses her eyes and alabaster breast. 3. E.3442. These intimacies are maternal and then some. Spencer habitually complicates even innocent exchanges by some eroticizing adjective, usually describing inviting white flesh. Britomart's relation with Glaus corresponds to Rosalind and Celia's childhood union in Shakespeare's As You Like It, a proto-lesbianism, the prepubescent female matrix from which the sexually ambiguous heroine emerges into heterosexuality. A lesbian suggestiveness of a different kind occurs in the prior canto in Castle Joyous, where Malacasta, thinking Britomart a man, is consumed by desire, panting soft, and trembling every joint, she prowls the corridors like Diderot's obsessed lesbian mother superior, and finally takes the masculine initiative by invading Britomart's bed. I.60. Malacasta has only seen Britomart's face through her open visor, a face we know to be quite feminine, hence her attraction to Britomart is subtly homoerotic. This is clear when one compares the episode to its source in Ariosto, where the princess Fiordispina falls in love with the female warrior Bradamante. The tone is completely different. Fiordispina's impossible plight has an affecting pathos. There is nothing decadent about it. Malacasta is a jaded sophisticate, and Chatelaine, not an ingenue. Her sexual aggressiveness turns things kinky, a word that applies to Spencer but never to Ariosto. Kinky is a mental twist, top spin on the eyeball. Malacasta's wanton eyes that roll too lightly are hostile Western perception on the loose. 41. Though Britomart, feeling an intruder under the covers, leaps up. Outraged, Spencer persists in putting her in compromising quasi lesbian situations. Later she kisses, embraces, and sleeps with Amaret, Belphoebe's feminine sister, refusing to accept the false Florimel as her paramour. Britomart treats her own Amaret as if she were actually Amaret's male champion, IV. V.20. Indeed, before Amaret knows her identity, the distracted Britomart pursues her male impersonation beyond the strictly necessary. Amaret becomes fearful of Britomart's doubtful behavior, a lovemaking and lustfulness that threaten some excess. IV. I.7. These homosexual touches are part of Spencer's grand plan for Britomart. Her character has extraordinary amplitude, covering the full range of human experience, from masculine achievement to maternal generation. Britomart is one of the sexually most complex women in literature. Like Belphoebe, she is a dazzling Apollonian androgyne, with the figure of an adolescent boy. But unlike Belphoebe, she will renounce athleticism and militancy for motherhood. Even her inspired name is one of the Cretan titles of the Great Mother, Britomartis, and not, as one first thinks, Spencer's fusion of British and Marshall. One of Britomart's missions, peculiar in a supposedly Christian poem, is her pilgrimage to the Shrine of Isis. There she has a wondrous vision, where she is robed and mitred as a male priest, then transformed into the pregnant goddess. V. V. This sex change, paralleling the finale of As You Like, it is Britomart's life pattern. She traverses the vast landscape of sexual personae, progressing from solitary nightly quester to obedient wife and mother. Britomart's encounters with her future mate are full of comic ironies. Artigle, to whom she must cede sovereignty in marriage, is repeatedly crushed by her in hand to hand combat. 
The Fairy Queen, follows Artigal's education and training. He must earn his wife. At the moment, he falls dismally short of Britomart's daydreams, where he is wise, warlike, personable, courteous, and kind. 3. IV.5. He enters the poem in an untidy state of rude strength, his armor covered with moss and weeds. His steed has oak leaves for trappings. The motto on his ragged shield is, Salvagesse sans finesse, savagery. Without refinement, IV. IV.39. Artigal must be tempered from this extreme of brutish masculinity to become more androgynous. Spencer's letter to Sir Walter Raleigh says of Prince Arthur that the poem will fashion a gentleman or noble person in virtuous and gentle discipline. Spencer praises Sir Calidore, hero of the Book of Courtesy, for his gentleness of sprite and manners mild. V. I.2. Castiglione, we recall, gives the ideal courtier a special sweetness and grace. The accomplished gentleman has a feminine sensitivity to the social moment. Good manners are tentative and accommodating. The man passing from battlefield to court must be devirilized. In journeying toward his feminine pole, however, Artigal goes too far. Falling beneath the sway of Radagund, the Amazon queen, he becomes effeminate. With Radagund, that strange glittering light returns to the poem after an absence of a book and a half. It is the radiance of the Spencerian androgynous. Under her coat of mail, Radagund wears a purple silk tunic woven with silver and quilted on milk-white satin. She has painted buskins, basted with bends of gold. Her scimitar hangs from an embroidered belt, and her jeweled shield shines like the moon. VV.2-3. The description deliberately recalls Belphoebe, but Radagund, half like a man, is a bully. In her solitary self-communing, Belphoebe does not affront the freedom of others. Radagund is a new omphale, dressing captive knights in women's clothes and making them sew and wash to earn their supper. V. IV.3631. Artigal makes two errors of judgment. First he promises, if defeated, to obey Radagund's law. Britomart later refuses to agree to such terms. Second, after he knocks Radagund cold, he is undone by her beauty, like Achilles over Penthesilea, and rashly flings away his sword. Thus he emasculates himself. So was he overcome, not overcome, but to her yielded of his own accord. VV.17. Radagund breaks Artigal's sword as a symbol of castration and hustles him into drag. So hard it is to be a woman slave, Spencer remarks, warning that all women except queens were born to obey. Men, VV.23, 25. The great chain of being governs Spencer's definition of sexual order, perfected in marriage. In the Book of Justice, Artigal offends that principle by upsetting the sexual balance of power. The Renaissance thought men's political supremacy over women was based in natural law. Britomart rides to the rescue. She must restore Artigal to manhood in order, paradoxically, to surrender to him. Chivalric sex. Roles are reversed. Britomart is the white knight and Artigal the damsel in distress, catching sight of her intended in female dress. Britomart turns her head aside in embarrassment, challenging Radagun to combat. She suffers a shock. For the first and only time in the poem, she loses. It takes one hermaphrodite to beat another. We see a contest between two womanly androgynies, as if to prove the truer or higher type. Britomart, who significantly has just come from Isis Church, where she surveyed her maternal future, recovers and kills the Amazon outright. She destroys Radagun's revolutionary kingdom, repealing the liberty of women and restoring them to men's subjection. V.V.42. As the end of As You Like It also demonstrates, the Renaissance, despite its humanistic expansion of the rights of women, could not permit Amazonism to flourish within the social world. But Spencer's 
sexual personae play mischief with his official doctrine. Britomart has more force and common sense than her husband to be. She, not Artigal, is Spencer's epic hero. Britomart carries the blood of noble Trojan refugees, which will pass from her into the royal British line too. Raise the third Troy of Elizabethan London. Thus she is the real Aeneas of the poem. I elsewhere note her other sexual ambiguities. Point one zero. Britomart's martial superiority is no modern freak. Spencer laments its present rarity. Long ago, in antique glory, women fought battles and inspired poets to verse. Let great female deeds awake again, he proclaims. 3. IV.1 2. In the Fairy Queen, helpless, retiring. Femininity is a spiritually deficient persona, fleeing, ever receding. Florimel, brainwashed by the literary conventions of the love game, is a caricature of hysterical vulnerability. Terrified by the sound of leaves, she runs even from admirers and rescuers. Spencer values courage and confrontation. Florimel's timidity and irrational fear are a defect of will. Belphoebe and Britomart's arms signify readiness to engage in spiritual combat for male and female alike in the fairy queen the psychological energy of aspiration and achievement is masculine life is rigor no rest is possible seductive phaedria tries to dissuade her suitor knights from conflict but it is only by the clashing strife of contraries that temperance or the temperate golden mean is achieved the fairy queen's androgyny theme belongs to this Classical tradition of the coincidentia oppositorum or fruitful synthesis of opposites. Female arms and armor are the panoply of sex war. One of the cardinal events of the fairy queen is rape, which occurs in dozens of forms, some real, some fabricated. The maidens Una, Belphoebe, Florimel, Amoret, Simeant, and Serena are attacked once or repeatedly by rapists. Children born of rape include the sorcerer, Merlin, the knights Satyrane and Marinel, and the chivalric triplets, Trimond, Primond, and Diamond. Males too fall victim to rape. Kidnapped by the giantess Argante, her brother Oliphant, and Jove himself, even avarice is imagined as rape, the sacrilegious wounding of Earth's quiet womb, for tinselly silver and gold. 2.v.17. The Rape cycle of the Fairy Queen is the most advanced rhetorical structure in Renaissance poetry, surpassed only by Milton's freezing of epic plot into oratory in Paradise Lost. The masculine hurls itself at the feminine in an eternal circle of pursuit and flight. The rapes of the Fairy Queen come from Ovid's Metamorphoses, the most imitated book of the Renaissance. But rape in Ovid, as in Hellenistic and Baroque art, is a bit of a jamboree, a romp of popping male muscles and bursting female globes. Spencer intellectualizes the Ovidian motif. Rape is his metaphor for biology, for the surges of aggression in nature. The sex war of the fairy queen is a Darwinian spectacle of nature red in tooth and claw, of the eaters and the Eden. Bestial lust and his agents, like the hyena monster stalking Florimel literally feed on women's flesh, devouring their bodies. Woman is meat, and the penis, symbolized in oak logs brandished by lust and orgolio, is a thing, a weapon. The theme culminates in Book 6, where Serena is stripped and appreciatively manhandled by slavering cannibals and where Pastorella, lusted after by brigands, is embraced and entangled in a heap of corpses, the gross triumph of matter. The rabid struggle for sexual dominance in the Fairy Queen is love debased to the will to power. Christian ethics are assailed on every side by pagan instinct. Spencer is the first to sense the identity of sex and power, the permeation of eroticism by aggression. Here he looks forward to Blake, Sade, Nietzsche, and Freud. Lust is the medium by which each sex tries to enslave the other. Spencer personifies it in numerous forms, as lechery riding a goat in the procession of vices, as Sansloy, the lawless knight, as enemies of 
temperance besieging the sense of touch, and as the grotesque predator lust, all fangs, nose, and pouchy ears, a walking phallic symbol. As a state into which the virtuous characters may fall, lust is allegorically projected as a series of felons, cads, and sybarites who use force, fraud, or magic to have their way. The Spenserian rapist is a savage, churl, or knight who is not courteous, or gentle, who has not, in other words, undergone the feminizing refinement of social life. Due to his failure to incorporate a feminine component, he pursues fleeing, malleable femininity with a headlong ferocity that is a hunger for self-completion. His lust is a semantic error, a self-misinterpretation, a confession of psychic inadequacy. But on the other hand, weakness inspires attack. Vulnerability generates its own entrapments, creating a maelstrom of voracity around itself. Nature abhors a vacuum into the spiritual emptiness of pure femininity in Spencer Rush a storm of masculine forces. Florimel, for example, is a professional victim. In her mad flight, she is called a hind, the deer, whom fierce Belphoebe pursues at her first entrance. Florimel's narrow escapes from disaster are sheer melodrama. They are not self. One are spiritually paid for. She remains novice and ward, living off the dole. In the Fairy Queen, the ability to fend off rape is a prerequisite of the ideal female psyche. We saw how spectacularly Belphoebe and Bridomart turned their weapons against Lecher's male and female. Amaret's inability to defend herself shows she is incomplete. Assaulted by lust, she shrieks, in a striking display of lack of animal energy. Too, feebly, to wake the sleeping Britomart, IV.V.4. And Amaret is grotesquely defenseless against the sorcerer Busyrain, who binds her to a pillar, slashes open her naked breast, and extracts from that wide orifice her trembling heart, laying it in a silver basin. 3.xc.20-21. This episode, one of the most decadent in the fairy. Queen is a formal spectacle of eroticized masochism. The genital symbolism is lurid and unconcealed. Spencer intensifies the moral ambiguity by using a poetry so deliciously beautiful that the reader is attracted to and emotionally implicated in busy rain sadism. Ivory, gold, silver, skin all snowy clean, dyed, sanguine red, fainting. Tremors, despoiling hands, amaret due to her spiritual limitations, may have invoked this morbid scene of martyrdom as an imaginative projection, but the gravest seduction is of our own sensibilities. Spencer, making exquisite aestheticism out of torture and rape, arouses us through the aggressive pagan eye. Amaret's wide wound is her passivity but our probing and delectation. Western sex as mental surgery, feminine and unarmed, Florimel and Amaret are flagrant targets. For attack, sadism and masochism engender one another in dizzy oscillation. Caught on the swing of the sexual dialectic, the rapist vainly strives to obliterate his opposite. The fairy queen's savage, circular world of rape is transcended by the higher characters, who internally subsume the chastened extremes of masculine and feminine. Florimel's unmixed femininity makes her unfit for quest. It is her impoverished lack of sexual complexity that allows a knockoff copy of her to be so easily fabricated. The witch hag makes a snowy false Florimel and animates it with an episcene, possibly homosexual. Evil spirit skilled in female impersonation. 3. V.8. Because of her psychologically embryonic state, Florimel's identity is quickly invaded and occupied by a demonic hermaphrodite. This too is the knife of busy rain, the sensual self-wounding of femininity. Spencer's naive rape victims turn up again in Coleridge's Christabel, one of the 19th century's most influential poems. And they are everywhere, in that autoerotic sadist, Emily Dickinson. Neither of these far reaching effects of Spencerian sex crime has been noted before. I have been speaking of assaults of male on female. But some of 
the fairy queen's boldest sexual aggressors are the licentious, femmes fatales, genitally deformed duessa, a version of the whore of Babylon, Acrasia, Phaedria, Malacasta, Helenor. Manipulative and exploitative, they seek humiliating sexual victory over men. Their greatest power is in womb like closed spaces, in bedchambers, groves, and caves like the leafy grotto of Homer's Calypso, where the male is captured, seduced, and infantilized. Spencer's great word for such places as bower, both garden and burrow. Embowerment is one of the fairy queen's primary processes, a psychological convolution of entrancement, turning the linearity of quest into the Euroboros of solipsism. The bower of bliss, wrathfully destroyed by Sir Guyon, is the most lavishly depicted of these female zones, which express the invitation, and yet archetypal danger of sex. At the gate, excess, a comely dame in disordered clothes, crushes scrotal grape clusters, a Dionysiac symbol, into a vaginal cup of gold, the male squeezed dry. For female pleasure, 2.xc.55-56. At the damp heart of the dusky, bower lies Acrasia, hungrily hovering over the dozing night verdant, who sprawls enervated and depleted, his weapons abandoned and defaced. Acrasia is a Circean sorceress and vampire. She, through his humid eyes, did suck his sprite. 73. This sultry postcoital scene is based on Botticelli's Venus and Mars, whose long, narrow design signifies the triumph of Mother Nature's horizontals over the verticals of spiritual ascent. Fig. 30. Spencer's femmes fatales tempt their male victims and paramours away from the pursuit of chivalric honor into lewd sloth, languid indolence and passivity. 3. V.1. The Fairy Queen represents this moral degeneration as dissolution of Apollonian contour. Sinister fogs blanket the landscape, a Dionysian miasma. Lying down to rest in pretty glades, Spencer's knights feel their strength flowing away. In The Fairy Queen, the hard Botticellian edge of heroic male will is constantly fighting off the blurring of female sfumato. Spencer is the anatomist of an economy of sex, of physiological laws of pressure and control, embodied in images of binding and loosing. The bower of bliss is the Chthonian swamp, the matrix of liquid nature. It is inert and opaque, slippery with onanistic spillage. The bower is an erotic capsulization, a pocketing of the eye. Apollo's chariot is mired in Dionysian deliquescence. Images shimmer in our self-generated heat. The Spencerian bower is our libidinous mother-born body. Matriarchal property in perpetuity. The rule of the fairy queen is keep moving and stay out of the shade. The penalty is embowerment, sterile self-thwarting, a limbo of lush pleasures but stultifying. Passivity. 30. Sandro Botticelli, Venus and Mars, 1485-86. The Fairy Queen is the most extended and extensive meditation on sex in the history of poetry. It charts the entire erotic spectrum, a great chain of being rising from matter to spirit, from the coarsest lust to chastity and romantic idealism. The poem's themes of sex and politics are parallel. The psyche, like society, must be disciplined by good government. Spencer agrees with classical and Christian philosophers on the primacy of reason over animal appetite. He looks forward to the romantic poets, however, in the way that he shows the sex impulse as innately demonic and barbaric, breeding witches and sorcerers of evil allure. Like the Odyssey, the Fairy Queen is a heroic epic in which the masculine must evade female traps or delays. But two millennia of rising and falling urban culture intervene since. Homer. Spencer ponders how love is affected by worldly manners, how it is embellished or distorted by the artificiality of courts. Hence, sex in the Fairy Queen reaches extremes of decadent sophistication, not present in literature since Roman satire and never in the genre of epic. Marriage is the social regulation and placement of sexual energies. 
which for Spencer otherwise fall back into the anarchy of nature, ruled by the will to power and survival of the fittest. Marriage is the sanctified link between nature and society. Sex in Spencer must always have a social goal. Spencer's theory of sex is a continuum from the normative to the aberrant. Chastity and fruitful marriage occupy one pole, after which the modalities of eroticism darken toward the perverse and monstrous. First in blame is what we would call recreational sex, heterosexual impulses hedonistically squandered. I elsewhere enumerate incidences of other illicit practices, which make the fairy queen an encyclopedic catalog of perversions, like Kraft Ebbing's Psychopathia Sexualis, not only rape and homosexuality but priapism, nymphomania, exhibitionism, incest, bestiality, necrophilia, fetishism, transvestism, and transsexualism. Point one one above all as a recurrent motif of sadomasochistic sexual bondage, captivity and enslavement, chains, and snares, love as a sickness or wound, Spencer diagnoses these Petrarchan stereotypes as themselves diseased. Literary convention led lovers to confuse sex with self-immolation. Love was corrupted by Freud's death instinct. Sexual bondage in the fairy queen belongs to the larger theme of politics, hierarchy and ceremony. Radiations of the great chain of being and master principles of Renaissance culture are criminalized. In the sexual realm, bondage is a demonic anti-mask, the uncontrolled sexual fantasy of morally secessionist authoritarians. Another pathological category is flight from sex, either sexual fear or frigidity, which Spencer incorporates in a theory of narcissism that is psychoanalytically pioneering. Dainty self withholding turns into autoeroticism, a stagnant psychic pool. Personality becomes a prison. On her throne in the House of Pride, Lucifera raptly gazes at herself in a hand mirror, and in her self loved semblance took delight. I. IV.10. In her rudderless boat, Phaedria eerily laughs and sings to herself making sweet solace to herself alone, e.vi.3. Narcissism is idleness, a big word in Spencer. In self-love there is no energy of duality and therefore no spiritual progression. Autoeroticism, self, abuse literally and figuratively, inhibits the enlargement and multiplication of emotion in marriage and therefore the investment of psychic energy in the public structures of history. Voyeurism or scopophilia is one of the most characteristic moods of the fairy queen. An observer is posted by chance or choice at the perimeter of a voluptuous sexual scene, to which he plays peeping. Tom. Voyeuristic elements are present in the episodes of Phaedon and Philemon, where a squire is made to watch a sexual charade, defaming his bride. 2. IV. They are rampant in the bower of bliss where Simoschals peruses a bevy of half-naked damsels, ogling them through deceptively half-closed lids, where bathing lady wrestlers expose themselves to the distinctly interested Guyan, and where flimsily clad Acrasia fastens her false eyes on drowsy verdant, a scene repeated in the tapestry of Venus and Adonis in Castle Joyous. 2. V.32-34, XE.73, 3. I.34 37. At Malbecco's banquet, Helenor and Paradell arouse each other by brazen eye contact and a lewd sexual theater of spilled wine, a voyeurism to resurface in their host's plight. As a hidden spectator at the debauchment of his wife, who is pleasurably mounted by a satyr nine times in one night. 3. X. X. Sleeping Serena is inspected by a tribe of cannibals, who seat themselves like an audience and judiciously weigh the merits of each appetizing part of her body. V. V. On Mount Acidale, Sir Calidore stumbles on the dazzling scene of a hundred naked maidens dancing in a ring, Spencer's supreme symbol for the harmony of nature and art. V. X. In the Cantos of Mutability, Faunus is punished for witnessing Diana at her bath, 
v.vi.45. Cumulatively, these episodes in Spencer surely inspired the voyeuristic spying of Milton's Satan on Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, a detail not in the Bible. PLIV, X. The voyeurism of the fairy queen, endangering the poem itself, arises from the problem of sensuous beauty, which can lead the soul toward good or evil. C.S. Lewis was the first to apply the term skeptophilia, his spelling, to Spencer's Bower of Bliss, but criticism did not follow it up. Point one two G. Wilson Knight rightly calls the poem perilously near decadence. The Fairy Queen is itself one vast bower of bliss. 13. I would go even further. The poetically strongest and most fully realized material in The Fairy Queen is pornographic. Spencer, like Blake's Milton, may be of the devil's party without knowing it. In a paradox cherished by Sade and Baudelaire, the presence of moral law or taboo intensifies the pleasure of sexual transgression and the luxury of evil. A great poet always has profound ambivalences and obscurities of motivation, which criticism has scarcely begun to study in this case. The Fairy Queen is didactic but also self-pleasuring. In the midst of dissipation and atrocity, we hear a voice saying, ain't it awful? Scholarship's major error, incredible in this century of the new critical doctrine of persona, has been to identify that voice with the poet. The Fairy Queen is contrapuntal. There is an ethical voice in a wanton voice, dissolving the other into lust by its delicacy and splendor, its hypnotic appeals to the untamed pagan eye. Voyeurism is the relation of this poet to this poem. It is the relation of every reader to every novel, of every spectator to every painting, play, and film. It is present in our study of biography and history, and even in our conversations about others. Voyeurism is the amoral aesthetic of the aggressive Western eye. It is the cloud of contemplation that enwraps us as sexual personae, transporting us unseen across space and time. Christianity, far from putting out the pagan eye, merely expanded its power. Christianity's vast tracts of the forbidden are virgin territory for the pagan eye to penetrate and defile. The Fairy Queen is a massively original analysis of these tensions in Western culture. Criticism assumes that what Spencer says is what he means. But a poet is not always master of his own poem, for imagination can overwhelm moral intention. This is what happens in Coleridge's Christabel. But I think Spencer far more cunning and conscious of his teasing ambiguities. His favorite erotic trope as half-revealed white female flesh, glimpsed through ripped or parted garments. The fairy queen often becomes what it condemns, nowhere more overtly than in its voyeurism, in which both poet and reader are deeply implicated. The fairy queen's decadent aesthetics reflect the Apollonian hierarchism of the Renaissance court world. Spencerian pornography is always sexual spectacle, a ceremonial tableau or procession. Formality creates perversity. Before Amoret slashed by busy rain, there is the suicide Amavia, whom Guyan finds still conscious with a knife in her ribbon, white alabaster breast. Purple gore stains her garments, the grassy ground, and clean waves of a bubbling fountain, and finally the cruelly playing hands of a lovely babe. Beside her is the corpse of the night mordant, bloody but smiling. And, according to the poem, still sexually irresistible. 2. I.39 41. Proud Mirabella, having tormented her admirers and laughed at their sufferings and death, is now punished by being whipped along by Scorn, who laughs in turn at her cries. V. V. Artigle finds a headless lady, murdered by her knight Sir Sanglier, who is now forced to carry her dead head as a penalty. Versus I. The Iron Man, Talus, chops off and nails up the gold hands and silver feet of beautiful Munera or self worshipping money, v. e. as in Michelangelo's Captives and Ignudi. Allegory has gone to hell. Such combinations in Spencer of Beauty, 
laughter, sex, torture, mutilation, and death are emotionally startling and ethically problematic. I find but one precedent. Boccaccia's tale of Nostagio. Degli onesti in the Decameron. A haughty woman rejects and gloats over her suffering lover, who commits suicide. For eternity, they are condemned to pursuit and flight. Whenever he catches her, he kills her. He slits her back, tears out her hard, cold heart, and feeds it and her entrails to dogs. Then she springs to life, and the chase resumes. Nostagio, courting his own proud maiden, lays a banquet in a pine grove, so that the guests and his callous beloved may witness the massacre of the cruel lady. Fourteen Bone Appetit. Botticelli's workshop painted this savage, salacious tale, presumably to his design. A black knight on a black steed waves his rapier at a nude woman, who in weirdly conflated scenes runs through the forest and lies on her face, her back being sliced open. A second panel shows the festive banqueters witnessing the bloody capture, as the lady's white buttock and thigh are seized at table height by toothy mastiffs. The Spenserian decadence in Boccaccia's tale is produced by the coolness and casualness of the detached eye, which treats sex and violence like art. Eye and object are positioned precisely as in modern cinema. Spenserian cinema is ritualized sexual perception. We feel the poet's own connoisseurship everywhere in the fairy queen. It is probably the source of the erotic overtones in Gloss's bedroom. Massage of Britomart and in Princess Clarabelle's bizarre reunion with her long-lost Pastorella, where mother jumps daughter and rips her. Bodice open. VL.XC.19. Connoisseurship, as we will see in 19th century aestheticism and decadence, is the dominance of the intellectualized eye. The fairy queen is like a stunt film, substituting a satirical soundtrack for the real one. A sermonizing voice earnestly comments on disturbing or pornographic images. But the eye in Spencer always wins. The fairy queen is pulled in two directions one Protestant, one pagan. Spencer wants good to come out of noble action. But sexual personae have a will of their own. The spectral sex signs of Western art are vaunting creatures of hostility and egotism. The fairy queen's harsh clangor of combat is our native music. Spencer's contradictions are uneasiest in his nature theory. He glorifies woman, but her body is a morass in which action is lost. Spencer is poetry's first master of demonic image, the ambivalent bower theme that he bequeathed to his successors would make English literature supreme. It makes all the difference, for example, between Rousseau and Wordsworth. Spencer asks of fertile nature, should we resist or yield to it? The fairy queen opposes the armored to the embowered woman. Spencer's myth of benevolent fertility ties him to Keats, but in his broodings upon the secrets of nature, paralleled in the Renaissance. Only by Leonardo, he is disquieted and indecisive. His gardens of Adonis, a creative womb world with female mount and odorous, dripping boughs, are another male prison. Britomart's shiny armor and Belphoebe's Byzantine glitter are attempts to polish and perfect the eye and keep it free. Spencer longs for an Apollonian woman to make everything visible. We saw that ambition in homosexual Greek classicism. The long cinematic sightlines of the fairy queen create a clear, articulate pagan space. Spencer turns medieval allegory into pagan ostentation. Scheduled moral meanings barely survive this apotheosis of the pagan eye. Spencer's pictorialism is a compulsive Apollonian thing-making. And the most glamorous of these made things is the female warrior, who combats fallen nature, where the vampire drains maleness and the rapist annihilates femaleness. Spencer's aristocratic Amazons, Belphoebe and Britomart, renouncing dominance in the boudoir and masochistic vulnerability in the field, carry the western eye to Apollonian victory.